Hello, can you hear me? Mr. Chowdhury? Mr. Chowdhury? Uh, Dr. Murthy, we can I can hear you at least. I'm sitting here in, in oh, Chicago. Okay, fine, fine. Oh, okay, fine, fine. Murthy, sir, I'm also hearing you. Okay, fine. I'm <laughs> But there is some problem, I think, in the... Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. There is a problem. Thank you. 
We have authored and co-authored about 90 research publications in high impact international journals. She has completed 12 research projects and currently working with three projects, including collaborative project with International Crystallography Diffraction Data Center USA. Her current research interests are in the field of complex functional oxygen system as energy materials, electro and electrolyte material for fuel cell, sensor, and composite multifocals. Presently, she is guiding four students for their PhD and 12 PhD have been completed in her supervision. I invite ma'am to present brief introduction of 21st NSFG 2021. Over to you ma'am. One at once present here. Sir, Vice Chancellor, ITM Nagpur University, Professor R. Ramesh, Professor Berkeley University, California, Dr. R. N. P. Choudhury, and Dr. Kamal Singh, a founder member of NSFD, Dr. O. P. Chimankar, sir, head, Department of Physics, RTMNU, Dr. Akhilesh Peshwe, sir, principal, Dharampet M. P. Dev Science College, Nagpur. On behalf of NSFD committee, I welcome you all in the 21st National Seminar on Epileptic and Dielectric 2021. NSFD was initiated by a small group of like-minded core researchers working in the field of ferroelectrics and dielectric in 1980. This biotech activity was successfully hosted at IIT Delhi, Raipur University, IIT Bangalore, IIT Kharagpur, University Tirupati, HNP University, Srinagar, Nagpur University, where uh, Nagpur University have organized two times in 1994 and now in 2021, and CSIR, NCL Delhi, IIT Chennai, University of Delhi, Kapar University, Patiala, Egypt University, Chhattisgarh, Goya University, Bhuneshwar, Manipur University, Imphal, and NIT Bhopal. So I thank the uh, ferroelectric community of India for giving us an opportunity to organize this event second time in Nagpur. Overwhelming response to NSFD 20 to go ahead uh, and organize this event in virtual mode even through the pandemic situation. This year we have received more than 150 abstracts with more than 250 participation. This uh, seminar is constituted by one keynote address, five tutorial sessions, six plenary talks, ten invited talks, seven contributory talks, twenty oral talks, and more than hundred posters. The main theme of NSFD is divided into five parts: fundamental dielectric, ferroelectric, and related material, material design and processing, characterization of polar material, application of ferroelectric and dielectric, and Practical modeling in dielectric. With aim to discuss this segment of ferroelectric research in India, impact of ferroelectric research on society, and define future strategy to provide direction of ferroelectric research to beginners. As a convener, my basic role is to coordinate the event. However, I don't have time for some advanced responsibility. But NSFD 2021 organizing committee members take tireless efforts to outline this program, especially RSP Chaudhary and I would like to appreciate my research group, that is Shraddha Shirbate, Shraddha Acharya, Arpit Mendes, and few more the hard and shape this program. This program would not have been possible without the generous support of our collaborator and sponsor. 
and most of all i am highly invited participants in the chief by their contribution lastly the nsf for high academic and scientific reputation is only a twenty version organized by maintain the standard and academic decorum first time nsfd is organized on a virtual platform due to covid pandemic situation it's our responsibility to maintain its academic dignity and also also on behalf of nsfd organizing committee i appeal all the participants to grace every session by attending sincerely and interactively thank you thank you very much thank you ma'am dr op chimanka is the head department of physics at university He received his PhD from RTM NU. He has a teaching experience of around 28 years and a research experience of 15 years. Three research scholars have completed their PhD under his supervision and have been guiding four PhD students. His research area include ultrasonic acoustic study of biomaterials, polymer blend, nanofluid drugs, and nanopolymer synthesis. He has publications in Journal of National and International Review. Participated in number of national and international conferences. Sir has completed two research projects. Sir is the life member of scientific and professional bodies like Indian Physics Association (IPA), Ultrasonic Society of India (USI). I invite you, sir, to give an introduction about Department of Physics. very good morning to present in the nsfd 2021 and the half of uh, physics department welcome to all our uh, dignitaries on and off the dais respected dr s r choudhury sir honorable vice chancellor of our rashtriya sukhruji maharaj nagpur university nagpur ex vice chancellor of sbb amravati university and ex ex head and professor of this department respected sir dr kamal singh ma'am professor r ramesh university of california he is the today's keynote speaker my friends dr ashwe principal dharampet mp dev science college nagpur convener of the nsfd sir dr smita acharya other invited dignitaries our beloved faculty members dear students and teachers participants of nsfd First of all, on behalf of Department of Physics, I would like to express my sincere thanks to founders and authority of NSFD for giving us opportunity to organize such a big event, the virtual national symposium on ferroelectric and dielectric NSFD 2021 in the department during 10 to 13 January 2021. Sir, the department came into existence in 1963. along with other science department for imparting post graduate education and uh, promoting high quality research in the form of phd here i would like to inform you that sir our department will be completing 60 years in 2023 and our university will also completing 100 years of establishment so i know that our present vc uh, is very cop and uh, has helping nature Uh, i request sir to permit us to organize joint big event for celebrating diamond jubilee celebration of the department and the centenary years of the uh, uh, university in 2022 in the initial days of department uh, professor p l khare and professor c mande nurtured the department professor c mande was a fellow of indian and national academy of sciences he proud several phd student he produced several phd students including tc deshmukh ex head department of physics iit chennai ab pimple ugc dai csr as nigvekar former chairman of ugc ex ec of pune university we continue to get an outstanding leadership of professor raj gopalan and professor patre who also served on head of the department of the bible uh, other ex head present here dr kamal singh became a shock at gb amravati university then dr bhoga dr mori mori dr gade 
where the HOD. Department has produced the several outstanding uh, students such as the Padmashri, uh, such as Padmashri Dr. A. Mali, DRDO, Dr. A. V. Kodaskar, ex VC of Pune University, Dr. S. Mande, uh, Bhatnagar Awardee in 2005, are the few names. Sir, we have sanctioned uh, the strength of 12 faculty members and now we have eight very experienced faculty, Dr. Gade, Dr. Dhoble, Dr. Kundawar, Dr. Acharya, Dr. Palikundwar, Dr. Des Deshmukh, Dr. Shermake and myself working in various research fields such as computational physics, luminescence material, polymer nanotech, nanotechnology, material sciences, then X-ray spectroscopy, energy materials and devices, solid state physics, ultrasonics and ultraacoustics, etc. The department was assisted by FIST, GST and SAP EGC in two terms and uh, our department this year our department our department is uh, also involving uh, in consultancy services from last 10 years but this year we are starting physics department consultancy services and opening the centralized instrumentation center under which we will provide the facility of instrumentation to these students and teachers of this <laughs> department university department and the uh, affiliated colleges i wish Best luck to the NSFD 2021 for successful organization. I think it's already successful and by registering 250 participants and through many plenary talks, uh, invited and oral talks and the tutorials, it would be excellent education among the renowned scientists and the uh, students and mine all. But these four days deliberations would be beneficial to the society. Thanks to organizer of NSFD 2021 for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, sir. The organizing committee take pride and privilege in sharing with this August gathering an introduction of the hosting department and the glimpses of the resources and facilities that are presently available in Convenus Research Lab, Advanced Materials Research Laboratory AMRL to a small presentation. I request Mr. Shivam Gupta to play the video clip.
Thank you, Shivam. Dr. Kamal Singh, Madam, and Dr. Arun Pichaudhary, Sir, are founders and constant supporters for 40 years successful journey of NSFD. Both these academicians are turning 75 years of their age. Their blessings on this occasion are very valuable for us. I request Dr. Kamal Singh, Madam, to share her experience of NSFD. because i'm meeting you all of you for the first time so even if it's late but very very healthy peaceful fruitful and prosperous happy new year to one and all good morning to dignitaries on the dais and off the dais on dais we have young energetic president of the function today dr sr soudhary 
Akhilesh Peshwe is very active and dynamic principal. I know in his college he is having many scientific activities and in inculcating the spirit for love and hard work for science by calling dignitaries like Vijay Bhatkar and many, many others and running very good scientific activities. So Dr. Peshwe's college is our collaborator, so I thank you very much. And our young dynamic HOD, Dr. Chimankar, and the initiator, and you know that secretary has to work a lot. And that is none other than my student, Professor Smita Achar. Today, me as a guide and the fellow of this department in the faculty. I'm indeed very happy to be amidst of all the persons here who are attending National Seminar on Dielectrics and Ferroelectrics, the series number 21. And as I'm asked to really give a glimpse on how the entire activity started in India. I'm very proud and feeling privileged to express that Professor V. G. Bray was the first person who was in Institute of Science and later became HOD, Department of Physics, Institute of Science Mumbai, now Bombay then. In 1962, he had published first paper with his student none other than my guide, Professor K.J. Deshmukh and Mr. Hegri. So in India, we were the initiator and many groups at Nagpur, VNIT, LIT were working. And in India, the group was very scattered. And I'm very happy to tell you that Professor R. N. Pichaudhary, when he returned, by working on potassium dihydrogen for fat chiding rice, based transitions in those materials with Professor Kakran in England, who is very famous for giving the basics of phase transitions in hydrogen bonded ferroelectric. So he worked with him and when he returned back, he was in Jamshedpur. And there, this young gentleman did not sit quietly. He started contacting the personalities like Professor Rishi Subbarao, who was the initiator and the building block of IIT Kanpur. Dr. K. Kar, who was director then in 1960s, invited Professor Subbarao from Washington Laboratory, and Subbarao was approached by Professor R.N.P. Choudhury, and R.N.P. Choudhury was given address of mine, I think, because I was working with Professor Subarao, and just after completing three years to stay with him as a postdoc, I joined this department in 1978 in temporary position and permanent position in 1979. And then Professor Choudhury wrote, and I was very impressed because I was also pretty young and I was enthusiastic person in research. So I wanted always that all scattered materials and people, young people working with facilities and without facilities. Why I'm saying without facilities, I bring this to the notice of the, our vice chancellor, the young vice chancellor to think of that we do not do very good research at the state level in our city. Excuse me, I'm not lowering anybody's capacity or capability, but because the lack of equipment. Just now I have seen the advanced equipment, but one equipment is missing here, and that is the sovereign tower circuit bridge for testing the ferroelectricity. But dielectric measurement is most difficult than the electrical conductor. So 
Chaudhary Sahib wrote letters to all over the people. He collected people, and that is why we have to thank him. And uh, when he collected, then first conference he contacted Professor Mathur and then uh, Professor Abhay Man Singh, P. S. Narayanan. Professor Srinivasan from IIT Bangalore and Professor Mathur was from IIT Delhi. IIT Delhi, Professor Mathur and Professor Abhay Man Singh was from Astrophysics and Physics Department, Delhi University. And these were very stalwarts, you see. Like Professor Man Singh was a really key person for youngsters. When he used to lecture, we used to get lost because. He will give each basic of the theory and the experiment, and then we three came together. Myself, Professor Arun Pichaudhary, and he contacted Professor H V Tiwari and Professor H L Bhatt, who was working with P S Narayanan, and in I I T, sorry, in the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and he collected. And then we jointly used to write because that time no computer, no email was available. It was very difficult indeed to start with, and we had the same thought that instead of working in a scattered manner, let us combine a society. And Professor Chaudhary, I am very happy to tell you, this is the only one in India. This seminar. Early 1980, it was a conference on ferroelectricity, ferroelectricity. Later, because all ferroelectric materials are very good dielectric, so dielectric was added after that. And 1982, when we had biennial this conference, we had seminar, national seminar on dielectric and ferroelectric. And then, no looking back. So I really thank profoundly my friend Professor R N P Chaudhary, who is really listening to my lecture because he has already joined, and tell you that this society is running without any precedent and setting. We have no election because we never wanted to get indulged in unnecessarily big positions in politics. In these societies, so it was a society with the friends who understand each other, who respect and love each other, and so that our students can go very freely to their labs, respective labs and work. Because I left for electricity because I was a hardcore experimenter. I had did many experiments, but I was not very happy because. Tower tower circuit was not here, and for me, this department was having X-ray spectroscopy, and I was a material science, material science teacher. It was with the help of Professor Mande we could start material science research laboratory, and Professor Chaudhary was then shifted to IIT Kharagpur. He really did. You have seen in his uh, introduction when. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the names of the girls because I don't meet them daily. So Sadha introduced him. He has very good work from dihydrogen ferroelectric materials, hydrogen bonded ferroelectric materials. So he moved to perovskite, and from perovskite to then multiferroid. So he has worked in varied. I worked in hardcore ferroelectric materials, and. Also worked on lithium niobate, which is an unusual material. So, in short, now I will end my speech and tell that youngsters should do all fundamental basics first in order to understand what is a dielectric material, and then ferroelectricity, which has an analogy with ferromagnetism. possibly in the evening i will give glimpse on that when i talk in the evening i think 4 o'clock or 4:30 i don't exactly remember so that time i will tell you 
that the hysteresis which I said sour and tower circuit, Smita should have that equipment also, or it can be built with high current transformer. It needs very high current transformer to have that and a matching capacitor. That is a tank capacitor. So, if all the students will think of rigging up some small circuit, fabricate some equipment, and also maintain a directory with the help of Professor Anand P. Chaudhary to know who is doing what and what instruments are available in other universities because we can't collect all equipment. So I think this is my message and how the society started and how RNP Chaudhary is taking interest. It is marvelous. I thank the Acharya that she has really done a marvelous job that we could collect, be collected here even though few may be, num number may be very few. But the show <coughs> must go on and she has conducted entire show very nicely. At least the inauguration functions one is it done, it is done. Up success is already achieved. Thank you very much. I look forward to all to contribute, participate actively. Ask questions, don't hesitate. Because asking questions, getting your doubts clear is the first step in research you enter in. Thank you, my dear friend, for inviting me, having a dialogue with you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. We are happy to share with you that for the effective and fruitful participation during this seminar, we have come up with the symposium material containing abstracts of all the work being presented in the seminar by all the participants. All paper presented in the conference will be published in Ferroelectric Journal after peer review. I request all dignitaries on the dais to please unveil this volume. Thank you all. Chief guest of the function, Dr. R. Ramesh. Chief guest of the function, Dr. R. Ramesh, Professor of Physics, Material Science and Engineering, Berkeley Research University of California, having expertise in processing of complex oxide heterostructure, spin charge coupling, nanoscale characterization and device structure, skin film growth, and material physics of complex oxides, material processing for device and information technology. We are very pleased and honored to have Sir with us, Sir. Due to some technical problems, Dr. R. Ramesh is not connected here, so we skip his talk. Yeah. We take the privilege to acknowledge our collaborators as their timely financial support helped us to organize this event. I request Honorable Dr. S. R. Chaudhary sir to felicitate Dr. Akhilesh Peshwar sir, Principal Dharampet MP Dev Memorial Science College, Nagpur with Gram Gita and Letter of Appreciation. Thank you, sir. We are very grateful for your positive effort to formulate this for academic activity. The designer of NSFD 2021 website, Promark, has done an excellent job of site designing. They have been very helpful since the very first day when the proposal of conference got accepted. 
their team have been supporting us throughout i request honorable dr s r choudhary sir to felicitate one of the member of promar by offering a memento and a certificate as a token of appreciation we take this opportunity to felicitate dr pranay kotkar research associate advanced material research lab department of physics rtm nagpur university for wonderfully capturing all the facilities of amrl and compiling them in form of such beautiful video clips i request head of the department dr op chimankar sir to felicitate dr pranay kotkar by presenting certificate as a token of appreciation thank you sir thank you pranay chairperson of the event and the president of the inaugural function honorable dr s r choudhary vice chancellor rashtrasanta tukroji maharaj nagpur university nagpur who has been always encouraging and supportive to conduct such academic activity his gracious presence and guidance will create enthusiasm for four day academic event i request sir to apprise us with his presidential address and announce the conference is inaugurated ha sir aap sir nahi nahi okay sir aap de dijiye chief guest of today's function and keynote speaker professor r ramesh founder of nsfd professor dr r n p choudhary professor dr kamal singh dr akhilesh peshwe coordinator ekuri faculty and participants a very good morning it's a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of rashtrakant tukuru ji maharaj nagpur university nagpur for this 21st national conference on ferroelectric and dielectric 2021 on virtual platform during january 10 to 13 2021 i am extremely happy that internal quality assurance cell and department of physics of rtm in nagpur university is hosting this 21st version of nsfd 21 i appreciate the aim of the seminar to provide a, for, a forum to discuss state of art in various fronts of ferroelectric and dielectric materials and related science and technology including fundamental physics material science issues and advanced application in multifunctional devices with tutorial sessions for the beginners as requested by hod i declare my support for diamond jubilee program of this department on this occasion i would like to introduce my university being the head of the university rashtra sant tukuru ji maharaj nagpur university is one of the premier educational institution of central india with rich heritage and culture established in 1923 the premises are spread over 373 acres the university firmly believes and follow prophecy of rashtra sant tukuru ji maharaj who <coughs> profound ya bharatat bandhu bhav nitya vasude de varchi asade which means the motherland will be blessed if we continue brother brotherhood humanity and fraternity among us 
Nagpur being located in the heart of India and has connectivity with every part of the country. Rashtra Samtatu Guruji Maharaj Nagpur University is preferred by students of other state of the country. The university is committed to fulfill its version, uh, to fulfill its vision, to be one of the foremost knowledge hub with commitment to excel, excellence, relevance, innovation, and inclusion in education, research, extension, and human development, generating global competitive youth with national character and social commitment. For former learning, the university embraces 46 PG uh, department and three constituent colleges, this, uh, dispersing UD, PG, MPhil, and PhD courses. The key strength of the university is academic resources and intellectual capital, that is, its teachers. The highly qualified teachers with a focus on overall development of students and sharp research acumen has always proven as an asset to the university. The university indulged into academic and research collaborations with prestigious institutions like IUC, CSR, DA, Raja Ram, uh, Ramanna Center for Advanced Studies, Material Science Department, DRDO, Inter University Accelerator Center, New Delhi, uh, Pennsylvania State University, USA, University of Florida, USA, University of Washington, USA, Synchrotron Light Research Institute, SLRI, uh, Nacorn, Tatha Dizma, Highland, Pitra, Desi, Germany, and few more. We welcome and promise. We welcome and prom uh, promise to provide all type of administrative support if new collaborations and consultancy proposals in academic and research arises in this platform. I congratulate the coordinator, her team, department for organizing such renowned national seminar and wish the success of this program. Uh, I declare that the uh, uh, seminar is uh, inaugurated and open for further uh, activity. Thank you very much. Best wishes for all your future programs. Thank you. Thank you. We were honored to listen to your insightful speech. I request Dr. O.P. Chimankar sir to present Momento to Honorable V.C. Dr. S.R. Chaudhary sir. Professor of Physics, Material Science and Engineering, Berkeley Research University of California, USA. We are pleased and honored to have you with us, sir. I request to kindly enlighten us on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are you guys able to hear me? Smita, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, the mess with Al can hear you. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Oh, Ram, how are you? Good. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you very much to Professor Chowdhury and everybody for for letting me be part of this, this event. First, I have to say, hey, this is fantastic that amidst all the chaos of mm -hmm. us, can you hear me? No? Yes, you can oh, hear me. Fine, fine. Okay. Um, it's all of this chaos around us that you guys are doing science. That's fantastic. Congratulations to everybody. You know, and so I had some trouble getting in. We had password issues and stuff, but all good. 
I hope everybody's safe. I see most of you are wearing masks. Um, that's great. Uh, in California, we are basically shut down. You know, our labs are working at 30% capacity. So we're still managing to do science, uh, perhaps do better science, uh, because we don't do any gossiping, no lunch breaks, no driving breaks and stuff. So science is still going on. But uh, it's been a very interesting one year. Uh, 2020 is the 100th anniversary of Ferroelectrics, for those of you who are following this. And so it's appropriate that you're holding this this, uh, this seminar, this workshop, this conference on Ferroelectrics and Dielectrics. And it's great to see Ram. Ram Kathiar is there. Professor Chowdhury is here. So all old friends. So. Um, uh, there are some fantastic things going on. I could go on for a couple of hours, but I will not bore you. There are some fantastic new discoveries going on in the field of ferroelectrics. You know, for for a lot of people, they think ferroelectrics, oh, it's ceramic, this, this, that. Actually, ferroelectrics have become perhaps the most sophisticated materials. In my, our own research, and uh, we're probably a small fraction of what happens, what's happening worldwide. Um, you now have materials like multiferroics, like bismuth iron oxide, uh, which are getting very close to practical applications. Uh, we now have data where we have shown that you can switch magnetism, not with a magnetic field, but with an electric field of uh, not uh, 5 volts, not 1 volt, but up to 200 millivolts. And that's getting down to very low energy scale manipulation of magnetism. Now, I wasn't going to talk about that in my talk today because I had to pick the other interesting topic. Electric field control of magnetism is very interesting because of some uh, other things that are happening worldwide, which, you know, as scientists and engineers, we need to be aware of. One of them is something that you know very well, which is Moore's law. Moore's law is the techno-economic uh, framework around which all of microelectronics is built. Uh, about three months ago, we had the, um, uh, the symposium that the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, had organized. A bunch of us participated in it, and I'm forgetting the name right now, it's a little bit too late. Uh, but um, there was a lot of discussion about what India could do in microelectronics. India should do in microelectronics. But one of the things that's happening with Moore's law is that we're getting to very small dimensions. And if you look at TSMC or Intel, they're now getting sub five nanometers. And therefore, lithography manufacturing has become very expensive. At the same time, CMOS is consuming a lot of energy. And so you, I'm sure you've seen news articles about Google growing, uh, doing a driverless vehicle. You can actually make that work today, but you need a humongous battery. So if you took a Tesla, for example, and converted it to a driverless vehicle, you will consume a significant portion of the battery power for just the computing. So one of the big challenges uh, for all of us is how does one reduce energy consumption in electronics? And people estimate that if we don't do anything today, uh, by 2030, you will be consuming 20 to 25% of primary energy, which is a huge amount of energy, which is a lot of solar plants, a lot of uh, coal plants and natural gas facilities. And therefore, energy efficient electronics has become a very big, big topic right now. And we think ferroelectrics and microferroelectrics, which are basically sister compounds, are going to play a very big role because you can manipulate spins with an electric field with multiferroics. And therefore, you could go in and do spin based logic uh, and start to build the devices which look like CMOS. Uh, inverters, for example, or logic elements, what would you spin? So that's one of the, the big topics that's happening within the broad field of ferroelectrics. And of course, the other uh, area, which is what I was going to speak about in about uh, an hour or so, is this business of what happens when I take ferroelectrics and put a lot of thermodynamic boundary conditions. That happens, for example, if you make uh, epitaxial structures. I won't scoop myself. I'll, I'll tell you the story later. But it turns out that you can get some very exotic structures, what we call skirmions or vortices, very similar to what happens in a ferromagnet. In a ferromagnet, that happens because of 
uh, dilution scheme Maria coupling, and which is a very uh, sophisticated uh, anti-symmetric uh, string coupling. But in a ferroelectric, you don't need that. It's the, the interplay between elastic energy and electrostatic energy. And so you can start to see these very exotic structures which nobody would have believed could exist 20 years ago. It was also enabled quite a bit by our theory colleagues, ab initio theory, second principles calculations, phase field calculations. All of these have become so powerful that you can start to predict these mesoscale structures and with pretty much, uh, you know, a laptop computer. So um, for the students in the audience, I say, hey, here is a fantastic opportunity to do some great science. For the professors in the audience, like you, like Ram, myself, Professor Chaudhary, I say the same thing. You know, I am very excited by my research. What is happening? We publish quite a bit. You know, even coronavirus, touch word, has not stopped us from publishing. Uh, of course, a lot of people are publishing papers, so the, the journals are all very crowded right now. But nevertheless, I think there is a huge opportunity for all the young people there to do great science. You know, think big science, how you can help India, how we can help your country, your state to do great things in science and technology. And uh, with that, we will, uh, we will catch you in the, in the actual technical talk and uh, happy to take questions if you have any. Now, once again, congratulations to everybody for pulling off this, this, uh, this seminar under some very trying circumstances. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us. I invite Dr. Seema Ubare, Associate Professor, Dharampet Science College, NAP, for vote of science. Thank you, Shraddha. Special Vice Chancellor of <coughs> Rashtra Santa Sukhdoji Maharaj Nagpur University, Dr. Isar Chaudhary, Chief Guest, Dr. R. Ramesh, Professor of Physics. Berkeley Research University of California, where joined us from the United States of America. Respected Dr. Kamal Singh, Madam, retired professor of physics, Rashtra Santa Sukhdoji Maharaj Nagpur University, and former vice chancellor of Dr. Kadege Baba Amravati University, Amravati, and also founder of NSFD. Honorable Dr. R.M.C. Chaudhary, sir. Retired Professor of Physics from IIT Kharagpur and presently Professor Emeritus, SOS University, Bhubaneswar, Odisha, and one of the founder member of NSFD who has joined us from Bhubaneswar, Odisha. Dr. O.P. Chimankar, sir, Professor and Head of Physics Department, Rashtra Santa Tukhroji Maharaj, Nagpur University, Nagpur. Dr. Akhilesh Peshwe, sir. Principal Dharampet Manohar Pandurangadev Memorial Science College, Nagpur, and all the dignitaries, friends, and delegates. Pranam and Namaste. Myself, Dr. Seema Ubare, on behalf of organizers, I greet you with these indigenous words. Since these are the apt words to greet and welcome everyone because Many of our keynote speakers and delegates are attending this function through virtual medium from different time zones. NSFD, as it is told, is an biennial event organized from last 40 years. All those working in the field of material science and particularly ferroelectric and dielectric gather here for exchange of ideas. It is very good platform for new researchers. It educates them through technical sessions and tutorials on various aspects of their research work. To organize such a program that too on global level is a Herculean task. It is possible only due to sustained efforts of the teammates. We take this opportunity to express the gratitude towards their hard work. Our Honorable Vice Chancellor took keen interest and guided time to time. We are very much thankful to you, sir, 
for your constant encouragement support and taking time taking out time from your busy schedule and gracing the occasion thank you very much sir i am so thankful to pro vice chancellor and officiating registrar our founder members they are the real driving force behind this program i take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to dr samal singh madam and dr rnp choudhary sir my special thanks are due to dr r ramesh sir who instantly agreed and accepted the invitation as chief guest guest speaker thank you very much sir i'll be failing in my duty if i do not mention a wholesome support from our industrial partners they are Metro Home, TIA Chemicals, Sam Instruments, Alka Scientific. I thank you all for your generous help. My heartfelt thanks are due to our academic partners and collaborators, Taylor and Francis Group of Journals, United States of America, Materials Research Society of India, Nagpur Chapter, Physics Promotion and Charitable Trust. nagpur and my institution that is dharampet manohar panduranga dev memorial science college nagpur thank you very much one and all for your kind help convener of nsfd 2021 dr smita acharya and her team has put tremendous efforts into this endeavor special thanks are due to research team of dr smita acharya namely डॉक्टर श्रद्धा शिरभाते डॉक्टर श्रद्धा आचार्य डॉक्टर अर्पित मेंढे डॉक्टर तनवीर काजी डॉक्टर कल्पना अढाऊ डॉक्टर शिवम गुप्ता थैंक्स आर ड्यू टू प्रणय कौटकर हु हैज ऑर्गेनाइज ब्यूटीफुल वर्चुअल विजिट ऑफ द फिजिक्स डिपार्टमेंट थ्रू दी व्हिडिओ प्रेझेंटेशन टेक्निकल सपोर्ट अँड वेबसाईट मेंटेनन्स जॉब वॉज wonderfully handled by pro mark thanks for your cooperation local organizing committee members are working very hard to make this event a grand success thank you one and all our special thanks are due to universities teaching non teaching technical staff and also iqsc staff who are constantly putting their efforts for the success of RSFD 2021 we express our sincere gratitude to all our invited speakers for their prompt response and readiness for the event lastly i want to put on record a very big thank you to all our delegates who are attending the program through virtual mode and i am sure they are going to make it make NSFD 2021 a grand success thank you once again thank you very much chair i now declare that the inaugural program is over and all of you are requested to join for a cup of tea over there in the porch thank you very much and the keynote address by dr r ramesh will start at 11 am sharp so please be in time thank you very much once again
Hello, Professor Amir. Yes, how are you, Professor? I, uh, how, how are you, Professor? How are you? I'm fine. We're still alive. <laughs> ah, now we have, our situation is the same. Yeah. Your situation is the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as you can see, I'm much older than you, so I have a staying mostly at home. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. I, sometimes I go to the library. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. We've been trying to be very Mehta, how do I share my screen? Oh, no, I think so. Uh, let me log in again. It's a little bit noisy. I'll be back one second. No problem. Hello, uh, hello, sir. Am I audible to you? Yeah, I can hear. Hello, Doctor Aran P. Chaudhary. Uh, am I yes. audible to you? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, I welcome you, sir, on the first session of NSFD 2021. The chairperson for first session of NSFD 2021 is Professor R.N.P. Chaudhary. I just introduced the R.N.P. Chaudhary, sir. Professor R.N.P. Chaudhary uh, is Emirate Professor of Shiksha O. Anusandan, has been placed at 3,148 in subject-wide world ranking of top 2% scientists in applied physics by the independent study done by Stanford University scientists. Professor Chaudhary was awarded BSc honor, MSc and PhD from TM Bhagarpur, Bihar and Edinburgh University in 1967, 1969 and 1979 respectively. He has worked as a faculty of different level and active researchers at highly reputed institutions including Regional Institutes of Technology, Jamsetpur, Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, Puerto Rico University and Shikshao Anusandan University for last five decades. Professor Saudari is a pioneer and outstanding researcher of applied physics and material science, ferroelectric, multifunctional, and related topics. So I welcome you, sir, as a chairperson of the session. <coughs> so just I introduced uh, Dr. R. Ramesh. The Madam, go slowly. Don't worry. Yeah, we have a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I honored Dr. R. Ramesh, sir, for the keynote address. Dr. R. Ramesh, Professor, Department of Material and Engineering, Department of Physics, Berkeley Research University of California. Sir has completed his PhD from UC Berkeley in 1987. His research interests include thin film growth and material physics of complex oxide, nanoscale characterization, material processing for devices and information technologies. Sir has many achievements and award to his credit. He was awarded with American Physical Society David Adler Lectureship in 2000. Sir had been appointed as Distinguished University Professor the highest academic honor at the University of Maryland, College Park in 2003, fellow of American Physical Society in 2001. Sir is the recipient of A. James Clark School of Engineering Faculty Outstanding Research Award and Alexander Von Humboldt Senior Scientific, <coughs> Science, sorry, Scientist Prize in 2001. Awardee for Outstanding Achievement in Integrated Ferroelectric in 2000. He had been a distinguished research at University, University of Maryland. Sir is the recipient of Bellicore Corporate Award, Earl Arthur Fellowship, American Society and Graduate Student Award, Rossum Tucker, Tucker Award. Professor Ramesh joined the UC Berkeley Physics Department in January 2004. Professor Ramesh is not about his contributions to the science and technology of complex functional oxide material. 
He ranks among the highly cited physicists around the world in the Physics Citation Index and has around 26 patents, published 250 research papers, reviews and monographs. It is our privilege and that the R. Ramesh sir has accepted our invitation to deliver a keynote address as well as the guest of the function. So now I request R. Ramesh sir to please start their, his keynote address. Dr. R. Ramesh. Thank you, Smita. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, be yeah. Before <clears throat> before lecture, I can say a few words. Please. Mr. Ramesh, yeah. uh, Professor Ramesh, whatever you have, you have uh, Smita has said, I find it's a very small thing for you. Because I find you people are, you are the role model for all of us. I have met, Thank hello. You. Uh, Thank you. I have met, Professor, I have met many people in the world on the field, paralytics, and including my teachers and others. I find you are among all the top on the call. So uh, we are really proud, we are very happy that you have uh, given the blessings to my participants and our participants in India. Yeah. I request you to kindly uh, give us more blessing on the topics you have decided. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Chowdhury and Smitha. Yeah, so um, I have to say, uh, I'm more than 50 years old now, uh, but science is still a lot of fun. I feel like a graduate student, you know. Uh, we, we literally just submitted another paper to Nature today. It seems like we don't have much else to do except sit and do science. Uh, so what I thought I would do today is to tell you a little bit. By the way, Smitha, you can hear me, no? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can hear you. All right, good. Yeah. All right. So uh, you can see my screen as well, correct? Yes. Yes, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We, we, I can see your screen also. So, no. Mute color. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, for some reason, it got muted. Okay, all right. So, what I thought I'll tell you is a little bit of if you remember half an hour ago, we were talking about strange, exotic things happening in ferroelectrics. And for people like Professor Katia and Professor Chowdhury, who were formally trained in ferroelectrics at Edinburgh. You know, these guys actually did hardcore ferroelectric physics. Uh, in those days, I don't think people would have imagined that you could see these kinds of the structures. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about <clears throat> how to create new phenomena using epitaxy as a pathway. So before I go there, acknowledge all the people that we work with. Uh, that's the most fun part in, in, in research, the fact that you can work with some amazingly smart people. Let me point out, these are my colleagues. Saif Salahuddin is an amazingly smart uh, electrical engineering guy, but really is a physicist. He comes from Bangladesh, but he's a very smart fellow, and so is this guy. He was my first graduate student at Berkeley, but this guy is you know, he's a department chair right now, amazingly smart fellow. People in Europe, uh, Nicola Spaldin, we collaborate a lot with her. And of course, folks in Luxembourg and Spain. These two guys are fantastic theorists, I've been issued theorists. Uh, the Cornell group, Donald Schlom does a lot of MBE. This guy, David Miller, bar none, the best electron microscopist in the world. You know? And we co collaborate quite a bit with the photo emission people or X-ray people, synchrotron people, uh, Long Chen at Penn State, Venkat Gopalan and his student, his postdoc, very, very close collaborator. So, a whole bunch of people. So, thank you very much to all those people. Okay, what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about super lattices. I'm sure you guys have seen this, but some of the phenomena that we have observed are breathtaking. Let's tighten it, and a little bit about bismuth ferrite, maybe not much because I don't think I'll have time, but this is a very hot topic as well. We're gonna talk about some phenomena uh, one of them is chirality. Chirality is handedness, uh, right hand, left hand. And these things, ferroelectrics are not supposed to be chiral. They break inversion symmetry, yes, but they're not chiral, but you can have emergent chirality. And we will talk about negative permittivity as well in these kinds of topological structures. And then we'll finish up with some topological phase transitions 
which is a very hot topic in all of condensed matter physics, but particularly in these kinds of systems. So let's begin with topology. Uh, topology generally has two connotations. If you talk to the mathematicians, there are two ways to think about it. Uh, it's actually a pretty deep subject, and uh, somebody like me, uh, I, I, I deal with a very small portion of that. So in, in condensed matter, topology can happen either in reciprocal space, in K space, which is all of the stuff about topological insulators, for example, which have direct points in their band structure, where the electron behaves very differently compared to electron in a piece of aluminum. <coughs> That's K-space topology. But you could also have real space topology. And here's an example of what you would call spin textures, where the spins in a ferromagnet, for example, either look like a hedgehog, you know, they, they'll go out and come like this, or they look like a vortex, they're spinning around this way. Okay. Uh, these kinds of textures in a ferromagnet emerge because of a very sophisticated interaction called Dalajinsky-Maria interaction. Uh, in, in spin physics, that would be called an S1 cross S2 interaction. That kind of interaction typically will not happen in every ferromagnet. It happens when you have either broken inversion symmetry or typically when the symmetry of the system is low. You know, bismuth ferrite is a good example where the rhombohedral symmetry will allow dalajinsky moria interaction. And so you see uh, uh, spin canting, for example. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, can you do similar things in ferroelectrics? Can you create these kinds of spin textures but replace spins with dipole moments? So can you create dipolar textures or ferroelectric uh, uh, skirmion-like structures? So these two papers are really valuable papers, especially the first one. Uh, this one actually gave the original description. There was a lot of early stage confusion in the field. It's a lot more clearer now. <coughs> uh, you need this dilajinsky moria interaction or some broken inversion symmetry. The DM coupling automatically gives you broken inversion symmetry. Like, you need something like that. So the question is, can you do something like this in ferroelectrics? What I'm going to show you in the next half an hour, 40 minutes, is that, yes, you can indeed do that. You can do pretty much everything that the ferromagnetics people do, but you have to pay attention to what kind of boundary conditions you impose on it. For example, in a ferroelectric super lattice, this is a, a simple example of a strontium titanate. Uh, I believe this is 10 unit cells of strontium titanate. These are atomic resolution images, so each one of these is the strontium atom where you see my cursor, that's a strontium. This is a titanium atom. Okay. Similarly, this is a 10 units, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 unit cells of lead titanate. Uh, so you can create these by MBE. Perhaps that's one of the biggest things. If there are two things that happened in the last 10, 10 years, one is the ability of oxide people to grow their materials pretty much like what gallium arsenide people have been doing for the last 30, 40 years. You know, it's led to several Nobel Prizes, fraction form effect, all of those things happen because you can make people like Art Gossard, uh, Al Cho, uh, all of these guys can make these kinds of super lattices with atomic scale perfection. Now the oxide people are getting there and our range of tunability is much higher. I can put polarization gradients, I could put gradients in the elastic properties. These are the compliance uh, tensor elements. I could put gradients in the dielectric properties. You know, take two different dielectric uh, constants. I can, of course, put gradients in the Landau potential, which automatically leads to these polar gradients. That's not the end. I can go in and include spin and orbital degrees of freedom. Uh, if you have, for example, a business. Right. I don't know if I'll have time to get into the bismuth ferrite part, but rest assured that there is a huge game to be played there. And then I can start to play with octahedral rotations, tilts, phonons in, in these systems, and other excitations. So you can see that there is a whole range of tunability that you have once you start to create these kinds of model systems. So the work that we started way back in about five, six years ago, <coughs> we were looking for something very different. What we were looking for is a pathway for phonon localization, which means uh, there was a 30, 40 year old problem which nobody still solved is, can I actually localize a phonon very much like a quantum confined an electron? 
And it turns out that it's not that easy. A phonon is a boson, while a, a, a electron is a fermion. So the difference in the physics of those particles, quasi-particles, means that you cannot do the same things. In, in any case, we started by saying, hmm, can I create these kinds of superlattices? There are no electrons, so the only degree of freedom for thermal transport is phonons. Uh, this is when Arun Majumdar was still at Berkeley back in 2008. Now he's, he's back to Stanford. Instead, what we found was some very exotic structure. We said, wow, this is amazing. If you look at the lead titanate layer, this is a 10 by 10 unit cell of uh, lead titanate and strontium titanate. The lead titanate seemed to have these patterns, which was piling. And if you look at phase field calculations, these are mesoscopic, uh, macroscopic calculations in some sense. These dipoles were actually rotating. One of them was rotating to the left, so I call them a left rotating uh, vortex. This is a right rotating vortex. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about the handedness of this. This does not automatically give it handedness, okay? For a simple reason, I can put a mirror plane here, and this will reflect on it. So these are not handed by themselves. In a, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about handedness. This is calculating the curl of the polarization. So the first thing that you take away is that in a system like lead titanate, with which uh, if you talk to Professor Chowdhury or Professor Ram Tatyar, they will tell you, hey, look, ferroelectrics are very robust, very large anisotropy systems. They should not behave this way. But when you impose the right kind of boundary conditions, they indeed can behave very differently. And so if you look at the question, what are those boundary conditions? It's basically you have the Landau free energy, you have the gradient energy, which is basically the domain wall energy in very simple terms. This is the elastic energy. Now, uh, on a film like this, on a super lattice like this, if you have a discontinuity in the polarization at the strontium titanate, the titanate interface, you have a very large electrostatic energy. That will automatically tell you, look, put the polarization in plane, I'll be happy. But in ferroelectrics, unlike in ferromagnets, in ferroelectrics, the spontaneous dipole couples very strongly to the lattice. And therefore, you know, lead titanate has a huge spontaneous distortion. It is a very strongly tetragonal material. Now, if I start to stretch it in plane by putting the polarization in the plate of the sample, then I have to worry about the epitaxial constraint, which means I have to worry about the elastic energy. So the system says, look, you put me under a lot of trouble. I'm going to do something which nobody likes or everybody likes. In this case, it starts to form these vortex lead structures. Okay. Now the question is, what are the physics of these things? So in the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to show you something, some data, some beautiful data of the physics of these vortices. And this is phase field calculation, just capturing everything. That's a lead titanate layer, strontium titanate. You can see these vortices. They're all rotating uh, clockwise in one case and uh, anti-clockwise in the other case. If you look at them from the top, you can actually see a vortex lattice. Okay. And this is actually captured in electron microscopy images. And this is just a beautiful picture of the vortex lattice. You can see these vortices going from the top left to the bottom right. And you can also see defects in them. These defects, turns out, are very important because uh, we think there are some topological phase transitions that happen. Now, if I just quickly highlight to you, if you see these images, you can already see that there are other defects. Just to make it easier, I'm going to just point to them. Uh, let's look at this ring, for example. You can see that there is an extra half plane of the vortex here. Okay. So you can think of this as a dislocation, not in the fundamental lattice, but in the vortex lattice. Okay. And you can see that these dislocations occur everywhere. Not only that, they always come in pairs. Now, for those of you who have done superconductivity, if there are people who have done superconductivity, you know that, I mean, a couple of years ago, Kostelis, Paulus won the Nobel Prize for this, for looking at unconventional phase transitions. These are the so-called KT transitions. <coughs> what is a KT transition? I mean, a lot of people have worked on it. Professor Merman at Cornell has worked quite a bit. There's just a beautiful paper from him on looking at melting in a 2D system. And if you look at the physicists, they will tell you that a 2D system will not sustain a, a spontaneous order parameter. That, that you can have fluctuations which have very long uh, length scales, and therefore there is no robust order parameter. Conversely, people for a long time, all the way from Navarro and Fidel, looking at how ma materials melt. 
for about 40, 50, 60 years, people have been arguing. If you talk to Professor Ranganathan, who was my advisor back in Bangalore, Professor Ranganathan has done some spectacular work on this. And what you see, uh, what you would hear from that is that that um, you could think about melting of a solid, a piece of copper, for example. You can think of melting as some kind of a phase transition where dislocations mediate the process. And so you can ask the question, what does that mean? It means that if you have an array of dislocations and the shear modulus for the dislocation goes to zero, you could say, okay, that's the point at which melting is beginning. So Kostelis and Taulis took that same set of ideas from the 30s and 40s, and they started to look at these unconventional phase transition. In their case, they were looking at uh, superconducting vortices. Now, melting of the abrikasa lattice that looks like that feels like very much like a 2D lattice. How does the phase transition happen? And so, if you're interested, you should go read up. And we are uh, deep into this process. Uh, uh, basically, what it says is that this melting process can be mediated by the formation of topological defects. Now, of course, a dislocation is a topological defect. And so, uh, uh, you could think of these as defects which are mediating either the melting of the vortex lattice, which is which is shown here. Okay. All right, so now let's look at some very interesting properties of the vortex lattice. A lot of credit in this to Saif Salahuddin. Saif has, uh, is a distinguished professor at, at Berkeley in electrical engineering, but he joined us in 2008, and uh, we have been collaborating since then for the last 12 years. It's been fantastic. Now, this fellow wrote a paper for his PhD thesis talking about the phenomenon of negative capacitance. So let me quickly give you a summary of what negative capacitance is. You know, if you talk to Ram Kathiar or Professor Chowdhury, they will tell you that you can describe the ferroelectric or a ferromagnet for that matter in terms of this double well structure, right? It's a very classical picture. Yeah. Uh, just Landau physics is good enough. You don't need anything fancy. Okay, now if you look at this, uh, there are regions in this energy landscape. This is the uh, free energy as a function of the polarization, which is the order parameter. There are regions where the curvature of the free energy is negative. And if you go back to just classical Landau physics, you know that the curvature is really uh, the permittivity of the material. Okay. So in this box where you see this red color, it means that the curvature, which is d squared g by dp squared, Okay. That's the second derivative of the free energy with respect to the order parameter is negative. Now, in our thermodynamics classes, they will tell you that if I have a, a system sitting here at the high point in the free energy, that is not stable. And therefore, it will spontaneously roll down to these points, and it will be stable here. So you will have either plus P or minus P. Okay. <clears throat> if you look at the electric field, which is just uh, uh, from this free energy landscape, you can see that this is the, the profile for the uh, electric field. And so for this regime, the capacitance is going to be zero, uh, less than zero. Okay, so uh, Saif was speculating, hey, maybe in time domain, when I switch a ferroelectric, I could, for some short time, I could go through this day this uh, negative capacity state. And we actually published a paper back in 2012 where we said, yeah, when you switch a ferroelectric for a very short time, you do indeed tap, uh, tap into uh, that region of uh, negative capacitance. But it turns out that in these vortex and skirmion structures, you could actually trap in negative permittivity in the ground state. The entire material does not have negative permittivity. That would not be allowed by thermodynamics. But portions of the material, as you will see in a second, can have negative permittivity. Okay, so <clears throat> then I take you to work that we are collaborating with David Miller. Like I said, he's a fantastic microscopist. He can look at each one of these vortices, uh, left rotating, right rotating, and you can shoot an angstrom electron beam at that and ask the question, how does the angular momentum of the electron change? And that's mapped out in the torque. And if you go back to the simple physics of this, the torque is basically related to the time derivative of the angular momentum from our classical physics. So this is basically saying that the angular momentum is changing this way or this way. And if you look at this plot, that is changing by plus h bar by two or minus h bar by two approximately. 
This work is just finished literally a couple of months ago. It took a long time, maybe two, three years to finish this, but it's just fascinating that you can do this. But the work that followed this was even more interesting. And this was a, a paper that Ajay Yadav, who actually came from IIT Kanpur, now he's working at a, a, a Applied Materials, uh, he published a couple of really fantastic papers. The first one was the Vortex paper. And this paper, using electron microscopy, we could map out the torque, which is what I showed you in the previous picture. We could map out the potential using holographic kind of imaging, and therefore, you can convolute the two of them to recreate the potential energy landscape. And what it tells you is that right at the center of these vortices, you could see that the potential energy is indeed a maximum. So in some sense, we were recreating this maximum in the free energy, in this case, the potential energy. Okay. So you could in, indeed measure these for a single vortex. So what it was telling you is that in these arrays of vortices, you have the potential energy going up and down, up and down, where right at the core of the vortex, you have very low, the, the maximum in the potential energy. So you already know that somewhere in between, you can have regions of negative permittivity. Indeed, I'll show you a little bit in about five minutes or so, I'll show you data on that. And so uh, this, this work, uh, this basically captures everything I told you. You can map out the polarization as a function of spatial location and the normalized free energy and also the region where the curvature d squared g by dd squared is less than zero. Okay. And this basically corresponds to the center of the, of the vortices. Okay. Now let's look, and this is basically phase field calculation, and it says that indeed at the center of these vortices, your dielectric permittivity is also going to be negative. And in just a few minutes, maybe about 10 minutes, I'll show you data for uh, the, the corresponding analog of this uh, in, in, an, in a different uh, frame where you can actually quantitatively measure it. Okay. Now let's look at another very interesting phenomenon, which has to do with handedness. Okay. And if you remember, I told you that one of them is rotating to the right, the other one is rotating to the left. Okay. That by itself does not give you handedness. So now let's see, ask the question, how do I describe uh, the handedness? So I can describe something called the helicity parameter or the gamma parameter, which is given by this integral. This P is a vector that's going into the plane of the board. Okay. And this is del cross P, and you integrate it over the whole surface. So the del cross P is the rotation of this vortex. So let's look at that in a little bit more of an abstract way. If I have a vortex like the green vortex, which is rotating clockwise, and if it has an axial component, which is shown by this arrow going into the plate, that is a right-handed vortex because it's doing this. Now if I had a vortex next to it, which is counterclockwise rotating, shown by the pink uh, vortex, but which has an axial component coming out of the board, this also has the same handedness. So these two guys together will have a right-handed behavior defined by this. Similarly, by, by inference, you could flip everything and you can get left-handed vortices. Okay. And so this, the sign of the helicity will tell you whether it's right-handed or left-handed. And the question is, how does one probe this? And it turns out that's where optical techniques are fantastically valuable. So I'm gonna take you through this Really beautiful piece of work. It took us a long time, maybe two and a half years, to write this paper. Now, the technique is called resonant soft X-ray uh, 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 diffraction. What it is is, if you have a lattice like these vortices, yeah, I showed you these TEM pictures. The, uh, let me perhaps go back very quickly and show you what the lattice looks like. Uh, that's the lattice of the vortex. And the spacing is a few nanometers, five to six nanometers. The vortex to vortex spacing is about 11 nanometers. Vortex to counterclockwise vortex is about five and a half nanometers. Okay. So if you had X-rays which have the same wavelength, i.e. soft X-rays, you can start to diffract off these vortices. And indeed, this is uh, soft X-ray diffraction. Okay. <clears throat> so you come in with the, with the X-rays, uh, which are a few na nanometers in wavelength, and you can get diffraction from them. This is a specular reflection. These are the diffraction patterns. Okay. But now, because you have a synchrotron, you could have a, a circularly polarized light, a linearly polarized light. Now, if you have positive and negative, or right and left circularly polarized light, in a normal ferroelectric, Ram Katyar will tell you, Professor Chowdhury will tell you, that nothing should happen. 
if you put a ferro magnet, you will have differential uh, absorption. Uh, this would be different, and that would be called circular dichroism. But here you can see that this is the vortices indeed show differential uh, absorption, i.e., uh, a circular dichroism. And you can see that circular dichroism is a <coughs> small value. It's of the order of 15%, which is a very robust circular dichroism. The other thing that you can see is if I change my Q from positive to negative, the sign of the circular dichroism changes. Okay. And there's some beautiful work that's been done at Oxford University, the Diamond Labs. Uh, uh, Stephen Lovesey is the, is the, the father of this whole field. And you can go back, there are only a few things that will lead to circular dichroism in resonance soft X-ray diffraction. One of them is, of course, ferromagnetic order. The other one is if the material is chiral. Okay. So this data first time said, hey, you can indeed have handed behavior. Now, if you spatially map this out, this is a macroscopic sample, a few millimeter size sample. You can indeed see regions of positive handedness, what I would call right handed, and regions of negative handedness, what I would call left handed regions. Okay. And so this is the first evidence where he said, oh, I could take a material like lead titanate and strontium titanate, neither one of them is chiral. I put them together in a certain way, create these vortices, the material becomes chiral. That's pretty interesting. Now, I could kind of push this uh, really hard and say, okay, uh, can I do something which would be fantastic? And imagine for a moment that you took these glucose, you know, the glucose that we take, if you're diabetic, it's not something that you want to have. Imagine I applied an electric field, I converted D glucose to L glucose. L glucose, the human system cannot uh, assimilate, you just throw it out. So the question is, is there a way for us to electrically manipulate the chirality of the system? That's the next set of data I'm going to show you. <clears throat> That's where my, my colleague, Marcus Raska at Colorado comes in. They use uh, confocal optical microscopy, nothing very fancy like synchrotrons, no resonant behavior, just doing optical uh, imaging. But now you do the imaging, second harmonic-based optical imaging with uh, right and left uh, circularly polarized light. These are the images of the samples, and you can see that there is clear difference in, in, in dichroism. And so there is dichroism in second harmonic. And again, uh, going back to work that Steve Lovesy did at Oxford, they showed that if you have a chiral material, you could see circular dichroism in the second harmonic generation. Keep in mind, all ferroelectrics will show second harmonic generation because they make inversion symmetry, but they will not show it in circularly polarized light. That's a key difference. So we now know that we can go in and we can manipulate this. We can apply electric fields with metal electrodes, apply in-plane electric fields. You can manipulate it with positive and negative voltage. And you can see that the circular dichroism at any given position is going from a positive to a negative value. And by the way, these are very, very strong values of circular dichroism. It's not an error bar in the measurements. We repeat it in multiple labs in, in many different samples. So you can indeed manipulate the circular dichroism, which is arising from the handed behavior, with an electric field. This is literally the first set of data. This has not been published yet. That paper is just being worked through because it took us, again, a long time to repeat everything, make sure we understand it. And I don't think we fully understand it. We understand most of it, uh, but enough to say, hmm, yeah, this is really fascinating. Okay. So what have I said in the last half an hour? That indeed you can take the super lattices, create these kinds of vortices. Uh, they have come with pairs of dislocations with the defects in the in that lattice, and that goes back to the Friedel theorem's models of dislocation-driven melting in crystal lattices. We think it's also related to the castellus taulus uh, topological phase transition in a 2D lattice. Uh, what happens to the chirality across these antiphase boundaries? We don't know yet. We're still learning about it. Okay. We, I showed you some data on microscopic imaging of the chirality, uh, as well as manipulating with an electric field. Now, as we were doing this, we were saying, hey, how come all these vortices are lying down this way? How come they don't do this? And it turns out that, like in, in, the, in the previous problem, if we pay attention to the elastic state of the system, for example, by picking a substrate, which is a compressive stress compared to lead titanate, uh, somewhere around 3.9 strontium titanate, uh, then you start to see scurvions. 
And this is shown by a face field theory from Long Chen student. And this fellow did a fantastic bunch of work for us. He showed that if you go from tensile stress, which leads to these vortices, if you compress it, you start to see bubble-like structures. And indeed, with the uh, with, uh, with the growth, we could show that with the super lattice, we see these nice bubble-like structures. And as you can see, this has local order. You can see some diffraction in this optical diffraction, but it doesn't have long-range order. How to get long-range order is something we will talk about in just a second. Uh, you could also see for a trilayer structure, it doesn't condense fully, and we call these the Cheetos. These are these American snacks that uh, small kids eat. Uh, they look very much like snakes. They look like serpentine patterns. Now, David Miller has been, and his postdoc have been working a lot on this. These are some beautiful uh, images of the serpentine patterns. It turns out you can come with an electron beam. You could do surgery, local surgery with electrostatics. Uh, and manipulating these kinds of vortices. Uh, but what you can see clearly is that uh, these are the vortices, uh, the skirmions. You can see a local six-fold symmetry. It doesn't have long-range six-fold symmetry. Perhaps for the same reason uh, that the Castellus-Paulus uh, argument that you don't condense into a long-range order system. Um, you can define a skirmion number like the helicity for the vortices. This is essentially the same formalism that our magnetism colleagues use. It's a surface integral of n, which is the normalized local dipole moment. And this is basically telling you something about the curling. Instead of curling this way, it curls this way, dn by dx cross dn by dy. The integrand, this whole thing is called the Pontryagin density. And so I'll show you some results of that in a second. And this is ab initio calculations from Jorge Iniguez and Javier Junquera that you can look at these skirmion-like structures. Oh, actually, let's look at this. This is a nice picture. These are... Uh, 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 so by, so by, hello? 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 All right. Can you guys hear me? Professor Murthy, please mute yourself. Professor Murthy, please mute yourself. Okay, fine, fine. fine. Uh, James, can you still hear me? Oh, no, no. The core. The MSC will get. Professor VRK Murthy, please mute yourself. Oh, no. Oh, oh. Professor VRK oh, Murthy, okay. please mute yourself. Okay. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, no. James, you can mute him. <laughs> Professor Sumita, please mute Murthy because I think he is not listening to you. Uh, Professor Ramesh, now it should be fine. Okay, good. Thanks, James. All right, so we were talking about these skirmions. Uh, these are from ab initio calculations. These are visualizations of ab initio calculations of the dipoles. And you can see this one is called the Hopfion. It's a very important mathematical concept. Uh, these things have a nail component which goes up, that goes underneath the, the skirmion, which are these dipoles going up. But on top of that, you also have an implant component, those are these red dipoles going left to right. It looks very much like a belt. Now, that is an important component because the directionality of that belt, you know, if you're left-handed like I am, uh, then you, your, your belt goes from left to right. If you're right-handed, it goes the other way. So all of these skirmions uh, are called skirmions because they have handed behavior. And they have, they're exactly the analogs of the magnetic skirmions. Yeah. So we established that you can now start to create skirmions like this. And so the question is, what can you do with them? Again, this is the, um, for these stem images from David Miller, where you can map out that in-plane component, this component that I showed you, using for these stem images. This is 
This is the so-called block component. You can see the, that's the actual image. That's a vector mapping of the image. And these are the kinds of structures that you see. These are calculations from ab initio uh, uh, atomic positions. You can calculate the image. This is what the vector pattern looks like. And this was, you know, this fellow is a fantastically smart guy. It's amazing that he has not gotten a job in India. He's published maybe, you know, 15 fantastic papers, several nature papers. So Jeet wants to go back to India, but he has not gotten a job. Very interesting. Okay, the other thing that David uh, Mueller and his postdoc showed was that all of these kermions have the same handedness, in this case, going this way, uh, going from right to left. Okay. And he imaged you know, hundreds of them. This is just five of them that we show here. All of them have the same handedness. You could go in to do some very sophisticated electron uh, uh, diffraction work. These are called the higher order Lowry zones. Uh, if you look at uh, the electron diffraction, you have, of course, a zero order Lowry zone, but you can also sample higher order zones. And those are shown by this yellow box here. And if you look at uh, uh, that intensity trace, uh, it, for a skirmion, you will see that it breaks inversion, it breaks symmetry. They will not be the same intensity. This is again coming from broken Friedel's law. Uh, if you average it over all skirmions, of course, you don't see any asymmetry. But for skirmion one, skirmion two, you can see that they are they're asymmetric. So it's telling you that you can probe the handedness in many different ways in direct space by doing imaging for the stem imaging or in reciprocal space as well. And then the, the other thing that we just literally submitted this paper is you can look at phase transitions. So the question was, uh, these arrays of skirmions, do they ever condense into a ground state or do they always remain in some kind of an amorphous state? It turns out if you go to very low temperatures, they start to form these long stripy structures. At room temperature, they form a disordered array of skirmions. And if you go to slightly higher temperature and we think some amount of strain is involved, it will start to order. And you can actually see that ordering in the, the skirmions. And this work has just been uh, submitted to PNAS. In local regions, still it doesn't have long range order, but in local regions, you can actually see that this skirmion lattice is now ordered. It looks very much like a VCC lattice in some sort, or a 2D section of that. So for example, you can see that this vortex is rotating this way, this guy is rotating this way, this guy is rotating this way. So somewhere here, you can actually see the formation of what you would call an anti-vortex. And this is really what is the basis for much of the superconductivity work. You'll see vortices uh, going this way. These are anti-vortices. And it happens only when this go it goes into this kind of an order structure. So there's a lot of fascinating topological physics that comes out of these. Okay. Uh, like I showed you for the vortices, these kermions also show very large circular dichroism, that's shown here. This is the titanium edge spectra, uh, again in the resonant mode, resonant soft X-ray circular dichroism. And you can see that at that edge, there is very large difference between right circular and left circular light. And that circular dichroism is about five to six times larger than for the vertices. We don't understand why that is so, but we know that's very repeatable, multiple samples, and also it changes sign. And therefore, it's telling you that indeed you have a chiral system. And we have already shown you from the uh, near, very, very close atomic scale imaging, as well as from theory, that indeed that these skirmions are chiral objects. So, the summary of the uh, skirmions and vertices so these are, this is how the skirmions look like, this is how the vertices look like. This is for a, a tri layer structure, this is for a super lattice, and you can see there's very, very big difference between them. Now, for the last piece of this, I want to show, go back to what I started with about negative permittivity. Then it turns out that if I have a super lattice structure, if I have a bunch of skirmions in them, like we showed you, and if you did a macroscopic calculation of the net permittivity, although you have negative permittivity at the periphery of these skirmions, the entire material will have an enhanced permittivity. And one can go through some very simple calculations, which I'll show you in the next slide. But it turns out that when you do dielectric measurements, this is macroscopic dielectric measurements, you can see that the dielectric constant is about 800 for the super lattice. For pure lead titanate, it's about, about uh, 70, 80, 100. And for strontium titanate, it's about 120 to 150. 
So the enhancement of the dielectric constant is about an order of magnitude. It's particularly interesting because you have a multi-layer dielectric and you have capacitors in series. So if you ask the question, hey, how does this work in a macroscopic format, the net dielectric permittivity should have been smaller than the smallest of them. So dielectric permittivity should have been somewhere near the dotted line. Instead, it's here. So the way to explain it, I'll show it to you in the next slide, is to ask the question, are there regions of negative permittivity which are within the lead titanate layer? If you look at the, uh, the uh, dielectric data, which is shown here, uh, you could also uh, superimpose from second principles and phase fields, they all agree quite well. And then we also did quite a bit of X-ray based measurements where you can apply an electric field and do diffraction, and you can look for uh, the side lobes, which is an indication of, of the uh, skirmions, that will progressively change with electric field. And so here's a, a, a phase field calculation of the skirmions with electric field applied to it. As you keep on applying field, this is constant field as a function of uh, time, you go to the uniform ferroelectric phase. So we just talked about this, that, that the skirmions have a topology to them, they have a skirmion number. That was the, the theory discussion I showed you about five minutes ago. Now, by applying an electric field, I can go to a uniform ferroelectric phase where there is no topology. The topology is completely built in with the, the periphery of the skirmion. And therefore, you can make a topological phase transition going from a known topological number of one or minus one to zero. And so uh, I mentioned to you X-ray based measurements. This is the, the side lobe for the, from the skirmions at zero field and about a megavolt per centimeter. Those lobes will go away. This is the corresponding phase field calculations going from uh, something which has a topological number, a skirmion number, to something which has no topological number. And again, say, showing the same thing from ab initio perspective, we can go from something which has a topological number to something which is uniform uh, polarization with no topological, topological number that's trivial. Okay. Uh, I mentioned to you that the calculations, uh, we had an undergraduate fellow uh, who did this, all of this calculation, just a series capacitor model. But if you look at this, that's one of the skirmions. And the periphery of the skirmion shown here in purple, or this region in blue in this picture, that's where you have regions of negative capacitance or negative permittivity. That negative permittivity could be pretty large of the order of 800 to 1,000. So what it's telling you is the physics of that is when you have this negative permittivity, the material has, is very susceptible to external perturbations. And here you see, this is theoretical calculations, that the chi is the, per, the susceptibility of the system. This is the uh, permit inverse of the permittivity, uh, uh, but chi is very large right around the periphery of the skirmion. So you can now create these, these essentially cylindrical objects where the periphery is very highly deformable by an electric field or a mechanical field, which has also very large negative permittivity on a local basis. The entire material has a very large uh, positive permittivity, but there are local regions which have negative permittivity. So this paper just came out in October in Nature Materials. Sujit was the lead author on this paper. He did a fantastic piece of work on this. And we measured the dielectric response not only at, uh, uh, at the low frequencies, all the way up to maybe about 100 gigahertz. And we still see the enhancement of the dielectric permittivity up to maybe about 80 to 90 gigahertz telling you that indeed this can be very, very strong even at microwave frequencies. Okay, I'm getting to the, to the end of my presentation. I think it's worthwhile to point out the differences between magnetic and polar skirmions. <clears throat> For a magnetic skirmion, that's what the free energy function would look like. You have an exchange term, you have the Landau term, which is the bulk free energy, but then you would ha also have a component that comes from the Dalton-Chilsky Maria interaction. It could be from a surface, which typically breaks in version symmetry, or it could be from internal to the material, like bismuth ferrite. In a magnet, exchange interaction is very strong. And isotropy typically is weak. Spins cannot vanish to accommodate competing interactions, so something else needs to happen. 
in the case of a magnetic square muon, the, the, the trade-off or the competition is between the classical exchange, which is, you would think of it as a S1 dot S2, compared to Dalejinsky Maria, which is S1 cross S2. Now, those two things give you competing interactions, and the relative magnitude sets the, the size of the skirmion in some sense. <clears throat> so the stabilization of the twisted or the, 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 the skirmionic states occurs by Dalejinsky Maria interactions uh, expressed in the form of the gradient energy, which is this term. If you look at the polar skirmions, the free energy density, I showed you this in the introduction, that's what it looks like. Dipolar interactions are very strong here in a ferroelectric. And isotropy is also strong. Um, electric dipoles are the result of local polar lattice distortions whose amplitude can vary continuously. That's the key difference. They can also vanish to accommodate competing interactions. There is nothing like a Dalejinsky Maria interaction here. The, the origins of the formation of these skirmions is very different, but the end uh, products are very similar. Okay. With that, uh, basically, I think I talked about this just to close the picture. You can make it go from a system which has a finite, well-defined topological number, that's what we'll call it one, with electric field, it'll go to zero because it becomes a uniform ferroelectric. Similarly, as a function of temperature, you can go from a state which has a, a, a well-defined skirmion number and it'll go to uh, zero at a high temperature where it becomes a uniform ferroelectric phase. So you can indeed make it undergo topological phase transitions uh, in the uh, skirmion structure, either with an electric field or with a, with a temperature. And so the electric field part is interesting because you can actually use this to do something. For example, microwave devices. If you can tune your dielectric constant by 75%, that's very interesting, especially at 100 gigahertz, that's very valuable. Okay, I've told you a lot today. I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, what I've, I hope you will take away, especially the students, is that if you step away, ask questions about stuff. Do not agree with everything that your professor tells you. Half the time you have to be saying, oh, no, I mean, if he's wrong, I will prove that my professor is wrong. But you have to then go do the experiment or the theory to actually prove that. So we showed you <coughs> data on the vortex lattice, you know, that you can form these vortex-like structures, they're chiral, they show negative permittivity, and you can electrically control the chirality. I also showed you the analog universe, of, analogous universe of polar skirmions, which consists of this hedgehog and block components called the hopfions, and we showed you some data on the skirmion lattice, negative capacitance, and topological phase transitions. Now, it turns out that these are not frameworks uh, we can do a lot of things. We can put bismuth ferrite into them. That's a separate story. That will be another hour story. I don't want to bore you with those details. We can do a lot of fun things with the magnetism in these systems. It turns out that the magnetic properties of the bismuth ferrite layer is significantly different. Uh, so one of my former postdocs, who is now a professor at Harvard, so Julia has written a paper looking at what happens to uh, the bismuth ferrite. It's under review in science, and we'll see how it goes. So with that, thank you very much, Professor Chaudhary and Smitha, for the opportunity to speak. I know I've taken a lot of your time. Very happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor Amir. And uh, we are really, really very grateful to you yeah. for giving us a lot of guidance and uh, blessings to our community in India. And uh, we are always with you, and you are always with us, we hope. And uh, once again, for our, our, thank you very much for our sir, uh, sir, sir, there are some questions. Yeah, no. please do. Now the question sir, will be there yeah. after that question. Yeah. So yeah. now we can have some okay. query, not a question, some query and uh, some blessings from Professor Ramin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, uh, uh, what is the application of uh, having negative permittivity in the material? Uh, so that's a really good question. Uh, the, the original application that Saif was talking about was in CMOS transistors. If you think about it it's like in simple ways, I mean, I'm trying to make it very uh, simplified. It's like putting a battery uh, in, a, in a transistor device. So if you can put a, a negative capacitance element in series with your CMOS transistor, you can actually reduce uh, the voltage required to get a, a certain current swing. If you look at uh, how transistors work, uh, you know, the, if you plot the current versus voltage, IDBG curves, 
that will have a slope in the in theoretical sense uh, of uh, 60 millivolts per decade. And that comes from Boltzmann statistics. If you look at uh, the properties of the electron in a semiconductor channel, that looks that is Boltzmann statistics. And once you go in and solve that, you'll get a 60 millivolt per decade. By using a negative capacitance element, you can reduce it from 60 millivolts to say 50 millivolts or 40 millivolts. That means your on-off ratio is going to be much larger for a certain voltage. And because voltage is so important, you can reduce power consumption in CMOS devices. Of course, the second one is what James was talking about is in microwave applications. Any other queries? Uh, yeah, yeah, sir. Another another is spin waves and magnetic scramions are closely related. Is there any analogy when it comes to polar scramions? Absolutely, there is an analog. Uh, so uh, I did show you one calculation, which uh, there's too many things to do. Uh, you're most welcome, Kushbu. Uh, um, it turns out that you have exactly the same. You can have, uh, charge waves in ferroelectric, like you do in, in, in spin waves in ferromagnets. Yeah, there, there are parallel universes for ferroelectrics and ferromagnets. Any, any more questions or any queries? Yeah, sir, uh, sir, yeah. Uh, James Raju has asked, what is yeah. the technique used for making these super lattices? Uh, great question. We use pulse laser deposition. If you guys go to Satish Ogle's lab in Pune, uh, he has a lot of those capabilities. We use pulse laser deposition. Uh, Daryl Shlom, I told you, uh, my collaborator at Cornell, he uses MBE, regular MBE with nodes and cells and stuff. So you can do it by any technique in some sense. You can use sputtering as well, but uh, typically we use pulse laser deposition. Anything more? Pulse PLD. Another last one, sir. Yep. Uh, Kushbu Agrawal has asked, the microwave tunable SRTiO3 film are single phase or a multi-layer? And what is the thickness of the SRTiO3 layer? Right. First of all, it's not sodium titanate, Kushbu. It's a super lattice of sodium titanate with titanate. Each of the layers are 16 unit cells thick. That's about 6.4 nanometers. And these are very precisely controlled um, uh, super lattices of strontium titanate that titanate, some titanate that titanate typically would have eight repeats or ten repeats of the of the super lattice. Does that make more? Sense okay. To you? No, no, sir. I think. Okay. Yeah, I think we are satisfied. Good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much, R. Ramesh, sir, more, for accepting welcome. our invitation and such a wonderful talk. Yeah. You're most welcome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm okay. going to sign off now. It's a little bit too late for me. Here. Oh, okay. You can sleep now. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Bye. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. Uh, Chaudhary, sir, yes. can, I, uh, ah. can I start I can... the next one? Ah, please. It's please. a VRK Murky Self lecture. Can I start? No, no, please. No, please. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, VRK Murti, sir, yes. can you uh, yes. unmute? VRK. Uh, yeah. For you. Yeah, okay. you are unmute. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, VRK Murti, sir, uh, yes, you sir. are presenter now. You can share your. Yeah. Yes, I am doing so, that. So, uh, I just introduced this brief introduction of VRK Murti, sir. Professor VRK yes. Murti served as a faculty member of Department of Physics, IIT Madras, and also the materials, ferroelectric, dielectric, resonator, graphite, intercalation compound, polymers, and polar liquid. Microwave characterization and microwave devices are the topic of his research. He published more than 50 papers in various efforts, national and international journals. Presented more than 100 papers in national and international conferences. He was awarded with four patents. He is the author in three books, two published by Ginger Verlag, Germany, and his associates in India. He guided 22 PhD and several MTech projects. He was also awarded with highest technology achievement award by Linton Industry USA, a major company for defense contracts in USA. 
He was also awarded with best research, research paper both in Japan and India. He also served IIT Madras as a head of department of physics. Currently, he serves Velour Institute of Technology, Amrauti AP, as an image professor and advisor to VC after his superannuation. So, thank you, thank you very much. And I just uh, uh, invited now the VRK Murthy sir to start his presentation. VRK Murthy sir. Oh, okay. Can you can you see my presentation? No problem. Yes, Hello? yes sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I can good. see your presentation and your voice okay. is also audible. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Now, uh, when the organizers have asked me to give a lecture in this uh, NSF day, I contacted some of the research scholars in uh, various institutions and also some of the faculty. They have given me an advice to uh, rebrush some of the basics with a short span of time and then go to research activities that we have done at IIT Madras. And uh, incidentally, our colleagues like Dr. James Raju and uh, some of the people at RRL TV are working on similar materials. And so they have gone a little bit advanced with this uh, technology. So let me try to give you some ideas on the what are called dielectric material. I have stick now to dielectric materials only with the micro frequency point of view. Now, the title of my lecture is Role of Dielectric Materials and their applications in the micro frequency point of view. Now, first of all, we should get an idea of what is the importance, what is this dielectric material and everything. I'll give a small example to you, a simple example to you. So today, the weather is normal in the place where I'm living. So obviously, the temperature is also a night normal, okay? Now, suppose the pressure goes down, what will happen? All the ions in the atmosphere are now bounded together in the form of a cloud, that one, and therefore the coulomb force is going to be substantially larger because distance is smaller. They are corresponding, the electric field is going to be substantially larger. So we, the excess electric field is now converted into the form of lightning or sound, etc., like that. That's what we come across when it's in the winter season. Now, we will not worry about this, what is happening to the excess electric field, but what we have to understand is the medium right now is now composed of some of the bound ions which act as a material or a specific characteristic property, and such materials in which the ions are bound together is usually called a dielectric metal based on the resistivity of the medium. Now, this material can be classified into ferroelectric materials, sometimes based upon the conductivity, semiconductor, semi-metal, such a graphene is a, a semi-metal, like that we can try to analyze. So, so many examples do exist as far as the direct materials are concerned. Now, in the first few slides, I'm speeding up because it's sort of refreshing or recapitulating what we have already studied, but just to let me to let me reflect on what the conceptual concept which I'm going to use for the research activity. I'm going to use these slides to proceed further. Now, given the I am about together, obviously, we now choose a word called dipole movement. And I'm not going to read the transparencies directly, I'm going to give you the essence of each transparency. Now, when you go for what you call dipole dipole moment, and there are so many dipole moments that do exist between, depending upon the uh, potential energy and the application of the electric field. A permanent dipole moment, water is a permanent dipole moment, which will exist even in the absence of the electric field. Induced dipole moment, when you apply electric field, there is a potential energy that gets a, a change right now, correspondingly there will be induced dipole moment. Now, if there's a temporary deployment, for example, if you take mercury ion and mercury vapor lamp, you know, it is a temporary deployment. Once you switch off the uh, electric field, automatically the ions come to the ground state. So, these type of dipole movements do exist in this particular material. And correspondingly, if you take the volume of the medium, of the medium, therefore, the, there's a word called polarization, which is now related to what you call the, the characteristic property of material that's called dielectric constant. 
Now, why I have given these two, three slides is to let you know that every medium, just like any human being, has a characteristic property that called the director character, which plays an important role in the application point of view. Now, if you take, for example, an air medium, the electric field will have the uh, respective wavelength. If you go to another medium, let's say, non polar, where dipole moment is almost equal, there, they, they, depending upon the dielectric constant material, the wavelength changes. If you go to a polar material like water, the dipoles are now subjected to local field. Correspondingly, the saturation phenomena do exist. And will you get such a, hello, can you see that? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can see you. Yes, sir. Yes, we can. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Now, can I, let us come to the what you call a dielectric constant. A dielectric constant is generally defined with respect to the characteristic of the medium. Now, if you apply an electric field to a dielectric material, which is a, let us say, with a permanent dipole moment, then obviously the dipoles get oriented, as I said. And then when they come back to the normal state with respect to the frequency of the electric field, the energy can be dissipated in the form of heat. Therefore, the dielectric constant is regarded as a complex quantity in this material. Negative sign represents the dissipation. This is helpful used in the microwave oven development and by the what called and the materials that we are now using in microwave frequency region. So there are three types of polarization, like the orientation of polarization, atomic and electronic pole, which you have studied in the graduate level. And if we have, now I'm restricting to what well, restricting to what you call micro frequency region only. Okay. Now if we go to micro frequency region, wait a minute. Okay, if you go to micro frequency region, what is happening right now? We keep water generally or an organic liquid or a polar liquid. What happens right now, the respect to dipole are getting activated by means of the what is electric field. Therefore, what we, are, what we are going to get some heat dissipation from this orientation of the dipole, and that what we are using in microwave. So this, in turn, gives an idea that the dielectric constant is a completely dependent property in the, in the class of these materials. Now, therefore, when you see that the delta constant is a temperature phenomena, that what we see, the refractive index keeps changing with respect to temperature. And sometimes we see this what we call us when you have a rainy, rainy season, we see the, the signals do not, we cannot get the, the, the signals in the house, mainly because of the temperature change in the what you call water molecules or water that is spreading on the, the dish antenna. Therefore, it's a temperature dependent phenomena. So this is one characteristic. Two another characteristic is frequency dependent, but at the temperature dependent. These two now we are going to make use of the property of the material for further applications of the, in the micro frequency region of the dielectric material. Now let's go to okay. Now are you able to see? Okay. Now you see this picture. For the solid state physics material of our physics, physics textbook, that the low frequency region space charge polarization plays an important role. In the micro frequency region, for the orientational or dipolar polarization plays an important role. In the infrared region, what we see ionic polarization take place, and the optical region, electronic the polarization takes the predominance in that term. Now, you already know that this particular Hello, can you see it? Hello? Hello? Can you see that picture? Okay, no problem? Okay. No problem. Okay. Okay, Now, this electromagnetic spectrum, I am restricting to what you call uh, particularly micro frequency region. Therefore, what I am trying to say is the micro frequency region is about 1 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. They are almost from centimeter to very, very millimeter region. Now, here only, I'm coming to the uh, 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 part of the end of this particular topic there. Now, this particular frequency I have chosen. Why should I choose the particular frequency region when it uh, comes to the dielectric materials? Now, today, there are so many applications of uh, the so-called 
the micro frequency um, uh, dielectric material micro frequency. For example, your cell phone has a dielectric material inside that called dielectric resonator. And your dish antenna is a micro frequency region. And TV is also micro frequency region. So what we have to say for communication point of view, the dielectric materials are extensively used in the micro frequency region. So what are the uh, what is the importance of micro frequency? For example, better communication, rotational polarizability, imaging purpose, non-destructive technique, and then warhead weapons and so on. Say so, all these things are done in IIT Madras, part of the imaging process. My colleagues are doing the imaging of micro imaging proper now, prop, uh, processing. Now let us come to the what you call microwave materials. What are these microwave materials? For example, whatever you see right now, liquids, alcohols, all the amines, all these things, even amino acids, they are all uh, 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 micro materials which you can see because they are polar materials. Let us come to the solids right now. Nanomaterials are extensively used in microwave frequency region in the present system. I'm going to come to that part a little bit later. Now, for right, Ferroelectric, paraelectric, garnet, ceramics, etc., very tightened, feathered, ferroelectric material, strong and titanate, which are used as the dielectric resonator. Then, in the low frequency region, what we are using is the what is called printed circuit board. When it comes to micro frequency region, it is generally termed as copper clamp PT. It is a, a, a really a serious job right now that is being done in CMET Kilshaw. It's a, a big project right now. IPC superconductors, you can analyze. The transition temperature in the ITC superconductors by using microwave techniques. And in semiconductors, you can study the what is called carrier concentration, that's the time semiconductor materials in microwave frequency and microwave techniques. So, what are the parameters that we use in microwave frequency region? Are we studying the microwave frequency? Dielectric constant, dielectric loss, dipole moment, conductivity, reflection coefficient, relaxation time, injection loss, etc., all these parameters. Now, why I'm giving this idea is these are the parameters that are now extensively used in our computational analysis also, which I'm going to talk to you very shortly. Now, we'll come to what we call liquids. The liquids that we are using are amino acids, are total amines, aldehydes, and so on. And then there are various techniques that are used in microwave frequency that is called a transmission line technique, cavity perturbation technique, etc. Hydrogen bonding is very important right now in the present day system, but we have a chemist to analyze this conformation, that is structure of the material. FTIR studies are used right now to correlate with what you call micro frequency region. The transmission technique right now, what we use it to measure the dielectric constant, dielectric loss material, it is used for a, a longer, at least up to 36 gigahertz. We have used up to 70 gigahertz in IIT Madras. So this is one promising technique that is used right now. It, is, it requires a large amount of sample right now. The procedure involves the movement of flat, reflecting transit through the medium to very thickness of the sample. Now, this particular technique was, the, uh, I don't know how to move this one. If you are able to see this particular figure, figure right you now. Hello? Yes. yes. The figure is uh, okay. I don't know why this figure is uh, okay. Good. Okay, this is the plunger technique. Now we extensively used in all the MSC laboratories in the country. You know, where you can measure the dielectric properties of the liquids. Now this particular one is now used to measure the dielectric properties of both. The liquids as well as the so-called uh, uh, liquid crystals also being used right now in this particular one. And then, okay. Now, I'm giving you just briefly the idea of the technique. You can try to measure the so-called the what intensity of the power to uh, obtain uh, the attenuation in the medium to obtain the parameters like dielectric constant and the dielectric loss. And then, and the advantages are that the power handling capacity is maximum for desired applications such as weight and size, and then variation of temperature is also possible. Disadvantages are there, it takes a large amount of double time taking process and so on. Now, in order to overcome this particular problem, 
We have now developed the cavity perturbation technique where the small sample can be used both for solids and liquid. This is one of the very important techniques in the microfrequency region where you can try to make measurements on both semiconductor nanomaterials and then what you call single crystals and so on and so forth. What we require in this case is a continuous frequency range called the network analyzer. Now, once you know this network, uh, the so-called shift in the frequency, once you enter how potential should be sample and the volume of the sample, you can try to measure the delta constant and delta loss of the material and temperature variation can also be measured in this particular one. There are certain advantages of this method to be used for continuous range of frequencies. There are also some advantages to this method. The water power handling capacity should be very, very cautious because the network can be very sensitive for the what you call the new, uh, power handling capacity. If you try to bend the what you call the cable, the losses are too many in that particular one. So therefore, one should be very more cautious. Now let me come to the result. This is the actual research from here afterwards. I am talking to you a little bit slowly. Now, when you try to make use of these techniques and then materials in micro frequency region. There are certain important issues right, which are used in even medical treatment also. For example, we have collaborated with the Cancer Institute next to the IIT Madras. Now, we have measured the so-called sugar levels in the blood which by micro technique, and at the same time, if you expose the tissues to micro uh, frequency radiation, what we observe right now is the tissues are getting sort of changing in their the configuration resulting to an improvement in the what you call the particular certain physical properties of them. So, for example, if you have taken the glucose in vacuous humidity water with respect to frequency, we, have, we can be able to see how the, the so called dielectric constant is varying with respect to frequency. This calibration will give a, an immediate idea on what you call glucose levels in the human body. Now, this is as far as measurement are concerned. So how do we try to obtain the conformational analysis? Here we see what you call Marco dynamics models as well as Abenicio calculation and calculate what you call the structure at the minimum energy configuration and then obtain what you call parameters from this computational approach, the dipole moment. And this dipole moment is compared with micro frequency calculation measurements that one. So that way we can obtain the conform conformational analysis of the particular molecular structure in this. So what I'm telling you right now is earlier we use NMR and everything for the molecular structure. So no microwave measurements are not being helpful right to really correlate with the computational work also for the structural parameters. And this computational analysis we try to take the bond frequencies and do the IR frequencies. So this correlation between micro experiment, computational, as well as IR frequencies will give the conformational analysis of the uh, molecule conformatively, that is very accurately. And this has been experimentally and very well we have established in, in all the laboratories in the country. Now let me come to what you call solid materials. What are the solid materials? Ferrites. You know? I'm giving a simple example right now, ferrites. Ferrites now, practically speaking, have a lot of applications in both nano as well as micro stage, the micro size of materials. What is the ferrite right now? Ferrite is nothing but an idea for modification of iron oxide, that is M2Fe2O4, that is for spinal structure and everything. There are octahedral sites and tetrahedral sites. Usually, when we start making the ferrites, you know, right now we go with the ionic bonding, that means the valence states of the ions remains almost the same as it was started with you. But what happens right now is, in all the ceramic materials, there's one drawback, that is the ionicity, if it exists as it is, then we get inherent property. But generally, that doesn't exist because of the temperature we use for synthesizing. So we have no more yeah. the synthesis by various other techniques using microwave techniques. That's another story. Now, these ferrites have what is called classified as normal ferrite and then zinc inverse ferrites and then mixture ferrites and we can make lots of ferrites. This was the ferrite work I started almost a year back. Now, what we are doing is nanomaterial. When you come to nano ferrites right now, it is used as anti-reflection paint for water system. That's extensively used right now. Therefore, what happens right now is there's one the physical property that is getting changed in the tub, which we have also observed in the tub. For example, if you take normal ferrite, 
Zinc occupies tetra of site mainly because of the larger ionic radius. Iron equally occupies both oxide and tetra of site, whereas inverse ferrite, nickel occupies the so called the octahedral side because of the ionic side and coordination number. Now, if you take the combination of these two, they're called mixed ferrite, you can get so many ferrites right now, millions and millions of ferrites, which can be used for various applications, both for low frequency as well as high frequency applications. Uh, since I am now restricting to microwave frequency only, I am trying to tell you how we have developed what we call microwave isolator. Now, the, the important thing right now is the ferrites right now can be used both for miniaturized components as well as the macroscopic components, that is wavegate phenomena. I am just giving you about wavegate phenomena. So when we use the ferrite material, which is an electromagnetic material, both electric as well as magnetic properties can be studied. That's why it has become very uh, sort of useful material for the research point of view. So we can use the ferromagnetic resonance right now to uh, use the ferrites Use the ferrite and isolator. And this is what is called field displacement isolator, where we apply magnetic field so that the importance of the isolator right now is the wave can be propagated in any direction, one direction. When it comes back, it automatically gets attenuated. That depends upon what you call the place of the um, uh, ferrite that we keep inside waveguide and the magnetic field that we apply as, uh, the, the, across the waveguide. And then the nature of the uh, magnetic losses and dielectric losses. Then the advantage of this ferrite in, um, in micro frequency region that is in micro frequency we can study both electric properties as well as magnetic properties independently by using cavity perturbation technique. That's one advantage. Whereas you cannot do that in the low frequency region because we have to see and separate both electric and magnetic field. So let me come to the other aspect of the what you call a dielectric material called a dielectric material. But, uh, James Roger was the first person to start this in our laboratory, and now he's a professor at the University of Hyderabad. He's going to deliver a lecture, I think, tomorrow, I think. So what are the dielectric resonators, which are now extensively used in the uh, smartphones as well as uh, ordinary phones and so on? So this dielectric resonator, practically speaking, is a nothing but a high dielectric constant material. What is the importance of this high dielectric constant material? For example, you take diamond. Diamond, if you take it, the refractive index is substantially larger. Therefore, total internal reflection takes place. Energy can be stored into the sun. That's why it glitters, you know. So in the same manner, if you take high delta constant in the microwave frequency region, so you can store the energy in the microwave frequency region. So what are the audio signals that we are propagating from one place, let us say Delhi to, let us say Chennai or uh, some other place? We are now trying to use, make use of the what you call micro frequency as a carrier. So with this audio signal is modulated over the micro frequency region. And then this particular material can store this micro frequency region because of side electric constant. And then we can demodulate that term to get audio signal. So this is the advantage of that. The simple fact for this is, Right, micro frequency can be used right now to propagate similar to sunlight radiation, which is high frequency radiation. So micro frequency can be now propagated to larger distances and over which we can try to modulate the audio frequency that is what is being done in this particular cell phone. Therefore, the important property of dielectric matter is high quality matter, high dielectric constant. Now let us come to the what is called ferroelectric region. So these dielectric materials, practically speaking, are nothing but a product of the ferroelectric material and vice versa. For example, if you take barium titanate, its Curie temperature is about 120 degrees. Now, suppose you bring the Curie temperature to lower temperature, let us say less than room temperature. What is going to happen? Above the room temperature, the dielectric constant is going to be temperature independent phenomena, which is an also frequency independent phenomena. That is the electric generator having a high dielectric constant. Therefore, the energy can be stored as per the electromagnetic energy. Therefore, the advantage of the is that it is a temperature independent property that exists to the extent possible, what I am telling you. So still active research is going on to make very various type of materials which can be temperature independent having high dielectric constant and low loss material. Low loss means low dielectric loss material in this particular case, you know. So we can see this picture which is available with Google. 
this is the particular um, what you call the filter micro filter which is have uh, designed upon the dielectric resonator now therefore the dielectric resonators are extensively used to the various compositions are now developed dielectric resonator throughout the world and then there is a specific dimension for this what is the reason for you so choosing the one question asked a student asked me one seminar why do why should we use the diametrical dimensions in case of low frequency dielectric constant practical measurements particular lcrb the practical reason here is what is called boundary conditions of the electric field and magnetic field therefore we try to choose the specific dimension so these type of what is called dielectric filter have specific dimensions for the different them have done extensive work on this particular we have collaborated with them also and various classes of materials are done in india on the dielectric meters and various class of materials are there for high dielectric constant but what we require is an accurate measurement of the dielectric constant so you should understand the micro frequency region can yeah, measurement is very difficult i don't say it is very extremely difficult but one has to be little more cautious and then knowledgeable automatic theory to really get calculate the physical chemical properties of the particular region now the recent development with the new technology ltcc low temperature coffee ceramic material we have interact with in rl rl right now it is nothing but you can make thousand layers of this dielectric resonator separated by what we call the electrodes the silver electrodes or gold electrodes is very expensive processing that now cement uh, pune has an extract uh, very uh, excellent facilities on this particular ltcc we have interacted with uh, rrl to synthesize the layers right now and then it has gone to cement pune for fabrication using dark blade technique and the total what you require right now is very accurate careful measurement of dielectric constant and their dielectric properties with respect to temperature and the um, frequency in the micro frequency region now this is as far as a basic research that has been done at iit madras now let me come to the and uh, real part of what you call the important applications of microwave micro sensing right now in india i am talking with respect to india micro filters are there micro resonators are there microwave uh, what you call supply and resonators are all developed in various laboratories but what we have done in micro iit madras which are going to industrial collaboration is the micro sensing now what we use right now in the microwave oven right now it can go to a temperature of about 200 degrees or 300 centigrade which are used extensively for cooking purpose it's a fast uh, cooking process but can we now and have this procedure using our knowledge of microwaves in can direct material for high temperature which you can go now 1800 degrees centigrade people are going in the micro sensing and the extensive applications were seen Are uh, felt right now in the kind of our country itself. For example, JK Tech is uh, using right now for vulcanization in Kerala. Coconut oil is now being probably dried up in particular winter season. That heavy rains are there. They are using microwave heating, particularly for the drying up. And so I'm saying many industries right now are using this microwave as what we call the centering phenomena or heating phenomena. uh we using to a temperature of about 18 degrees centigrade right now and then development took place in uh, chennai the industrial organization as well as the belgaum also that they have now developed a microwave furnace where conventional furnace with microwave both club together so that one can uh, synthesize the material both by conventional heating as well as micro heating and see the change in property means that there is a change in the physical chemical property if you go for micro sintering also now what is the advantage of this micro sintering there is one point we have to see because it cost about 6 to 7 lakhs right now conventional heating is by what is the flow velocity to the material what what we are doing right now is silicon carbide cross we are using it heat energy is applied to surface material by conduction and radiation temperature given surface to the core heats up the material this is what we, it depends upon the thermal conductivity of material but conventionally what we are doing the microwave heating but the micro heating volumetric heating that more important right now generation of heat throughout the volume now the power here is not through what is called silicon carbide rods or uh, molybdenum dioxide 
what we are trying to heat the through the material composition itself. That is where the more important character stay, which depends upon the what you call dielectric loss and magnetic loss of the material. But there are certain important uh, what you call precautions that have to be taken in this microheating that I come to the point later. But the depth of penetration relatively decreases as a function of distance and surface to material because of the fact that the reason is these are all uh, polar materials, and I have shown that in case of liquid, if you go further, the internal field saturates the dipole. Therefore, this phenomena is to be cautiously observed, cautiously observed in case of this microheating. So, polar material can be very well synthesized in our what you call uh, in the microheating, but when it comes to dielectric material only, one has to be a little more cautious. It's not that simple process, but what you have to know a little bit carefully is to uh, really. Now, this is called the what microwave furnace that what we are seeing, which are fabricated in there. Now it has become more sophisticated because are available in India. So we are able to develop for 60 lakhs, not my, myself, the companies are able to develop for 60 lakhs and so on. Like, because at one time when we started this microwave heating almost 20 years back, it is about 48 lakhs from IR Technologies Germany. Now it is available for six, uh, six to seven lakhs, and uh, extensively many people in the country are using. For example, James Ross is also using, and uh, um, IIT Kanpur, IIT Bombay, etc. Many institutes have uh, made use of this for microwave furnace right now. But we ought to understand one fact: what is the precaution that you have to take? Say, I told you why. Right, that's the reason I gave you in the beginning some fundamentals of polarization. Polarization, which is proportional to the electric field, is related by a constant, dielectric constant, or dielectric susceptibility, whatever you say. And that is a temperature dependent phenomenon. Therefore, what we can make use of that temperature dependence of the dielectric constant in the case of micro furnace is we take a silicon carbide piece, because silicon carbide has one advantage. That's why we use silicon carbide rods in the conventional furnace. If you try to is the material, the conductivity increases. Conductivity increases, again, the temperature rises. So that phenomena is a characteristic property of carbide materials, carbon. Okay, so what happens right now is, you have to make use of this polarization temperature dependence as well as frequency dependence in the multi-mode or the micro frequency. So what happens right now is, if you try to heat that initially the material by means of the so-called Silicon carbide, because silicon carbide, when you block the microwave radiation, is being a conducting material, it raises its temperature. So that temperature again increases the conductivity and proportionally temperature increases like that goes. So you can go up to a temperature of about 800, 900. And this temperature is not heat, what I would say, activates or thermally activates the ions. For example, I want to prepare barium in a simple compound, barium carbonate. Titanium oxide, I take it and then mix these two in water or whatever way you like it, you know, ball mill, whatever you say. So, what we do right now is the compound is not at form. So, when you apply the temperature, thermal activation uh, from vibrations of the uh, thermal energy uh, activates the thermal vibrations of the ions there, that will become the polar material. So, what happens the Coulomb contraction takes place automatically, depending upon the coordination number of the oxygen ions. The compound is at least initially formed with this. It forms a, a, at least a single phase, not completely, but a phase which is formed in that sense. Then you are propagated with microwaves. When you propagate with microwaves, the dipoles are now getting activated. Again, for potential the changes, automatically you will see that the compound is now stabilized in the form of a variant titanate within 10 minutes. Whereas if you go for the conventional furnace, it takes about hours together, two, uh, two hours, three hours. Again, you have to cool the furnace, and then, then it repeats the time consuming process. Next day, again, if the compound is not formed by externally, you will have to re synthesize all these materials. But whereas micro furnace, because the chemically heated material, the advantage of this is you can make the compound within a short span of time, at least single phase can be obtained. So that's the advantage. This is called what you call the applicators or where we use silicon carbide for them. Well, this is as far as micro uh, what you call development is concerned. We have developed what you call some device 
it's, it's a different uh, fiber reinforced plastics also we have developed here for microwave application. That's a different story. Let me restrict that note to be depending on the time for the microwave the furnace only. Now we have developed the micro, we meet the country, what I'm telling you, not we are chemistry. Country has developed the micro furnace that now it is uh, available in the market as a reasonable price. But what is the advantage as for research is concerned? We we'll say when you come to what you call physical properties of the material, there are two things. One is intrinsic property and then extrinsic property. Both are important. For example, if you take grain size, if you take grain size, grain size plays an important role. Even when you make poppers, grain size plays an important role. That's why our mothers used to make the floors as um, as so, so soft as possible to make the popper in a properly uniform shape. So defects. Density. These are the extensive, pro extensive properties where you can try to analyze it, secondary phase by acceleration. Everything. But there are some intrinsic properties which you have to really understand in order to really get the reproducible property, polarizability, ionic radius, after the tilting, etc. These are all various parameters one has to study. There are so many measurements one has to study in order to analyze, co correlate between these two. Now let me come to a dielectric material that is calcium uh, cadmium olibrate material. It's called dielectric resonating material. Now, when I'm giving a specific example here, this particular material is done by you know, what is called conventional centering. The fact when you try to do the conventional centering, what happens right now? Well, for first point is ionicity should play a major role. Otherwise, the, the properties will keep on changing. Chemists never agree that. The ceramic oxide can never be existing in a full 100% ionic state. Can be there? there will be some covalency, but that means the balance state doesn't exist in the same stage as you are. For example, if you take 2 plus, it may not be 2 plus, it may be 1.8. So you have to learn what all the calculations in order to obtain the what you call and infrared effectivity studies are used right now to obtain what you call covalence. So, covalency of the particular uh, elements in that one. So, this plays a major role in the properties for the producibility. That is the main problem with this ceramic oxide when you go for the, what you call development or the device point of view. So, you must be able to see the properties to be reproducible over temperature, over frequency, and of course, the um, duration of time also. All these things play an important role. If your primary temperature goes from beyond the limit, and then the direct breakdown takes place, and it loses all the properties, sometimes it causes major damages, even space shuttle also. So what I'm telling you right now is, in the micro frequency region, using this particular, we have done conventional centering, Backward centering, and both we observed that in case of this one, the covalency plays an important role. And then when you come to microwave centering, you can see right now how uniformity of the grain size within the molecule, which plays an important role, because uniformity a grain size takes place with to minimize what you call the porosity in the material, which will give an atrophy. So that's also very play, particularly in what you call LTCC tapes and everything, thick, uh, thin film material. You must be very cautious with the uh, grain size. Otherwise, uh, uh, it results to what you call for the uh, in the uh, homogeneity in the properties of the film. Now, same calcium all if that we are taking one composition there. And then when you are seeing that term here, delta content is slightly increased with the term, and grain size is better. Covalency has also improved in this particular world. So, micro centering has certain advantages, there is no doubt, but the only thing is you must be a little more cautious while synthesizing the micro centering. That's the problem in our country right now. Many of the research students, they have to get trained up with the micro heating, and otherwise, you know, what will be the tube, micro magnet, are being damaged very frequently, although it is not that expensive, but it has to be replaced and uh, very few manufacturers are there who have ventured into microwave heating, so you must be very cautious while doing it. A good knowledge of electromagnetic theory is important. The same thing we have seen in case of LTCC tapes also, properties got improved in case of microwave uh, centering phenomenon. But when you come to the barium titanate, one advantage we have seen here is the conventional centering what we have seen number of times, many people have seen this one, the T Curie temperature has gone to 130 degrees and so on. But actually, according to Anderson model, 
the Q temperature is about uh, 120 degrees based on the elastic relation. That is what we call soft phone of frequencies. So when we got to microwave frequency region, for microwave heating, we are seeing that the temperature has come down to 120 degrees, mainly because the less covalency, more ionicity in this particular source. So this particular very tight net, when you have gone to AFM studies, we are saying that the good in the grain state, this only metallurgical engineering can analyze it very carefully, not complete pieces. Because we have seen the grain stage in the earlier picture, calcium molecule very uniformity. Here we can try to see very carefully the uniformity of the grain stage is more predominant in case of microwave heating. And apart from that, there is also one more thing in microwave frequency, that is, the uh, microwave heating, the density has gone up substantially. This almost 99% the improvement was there in density, which is almost is close to that of single crystals. Therefore, by this application of microwave of a direct material has been extensively uh, seen in case of uh, the so-called micro heating, and which is now available in the country to many people who uh, are able to a lot of grants are coming right now in the microwave heating. So this is the overall view of dielectric resonate uh, materials uh, application to microwave frequencies. And I have restricted my lecture to dielectric resonators only. And you get an opportunity, I'll give the uh, lecture in the ferroelectrics also. Of course, these two are nothing but right hand, left hands of the same human body. So well, we have to know how we can convert a ferroelectric material into dielectric material and a dielectric material into ferroelectric material. And we can also now see whether dielectric material, when it goes to a particular temperature and heating, dielectric breakdown takes place and probably it will convert into a conductor also. Therefore, you can now try to play all sorts of games for research point of view using a dielectric material to convert into ferroelectric material which is for the temperature, which is for frequency, and then study various properties of these materials. And most important thing right now is in the present day system, the ferrites are now single ferrites like barium uh, ferrite is now, extra bismuth ferrite is extensively used as multi ferrite material. So ferrite work is extensively going on and ferrite mixed with ferroelectric material like barium titanate and it is now used in multi ferrite materials and the dielectric materials are now being used very extensively for commercial applications. For example, if you take cycle paints. What we are seeing right now is a dielectric material, liquid, that is used right now for paints and to what you call to resist what you call breakdown of the dielectric properties and so on. So there are so many properties that people can do in the microwave frequency, and particular materials also. So a lot of work is going on. Thank you very much for the patience. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Hello, Murthy sir. Ah, yeah, yeah, please. Right, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Please carry uh, on. Okay. I am telling you for our basic understanding and for our researcher, very excellent talk. And, oh, thank uh, you. Th th thanks a lot for, for giving us opportunity to hear you. Yes, yes. Thanks for it. Thanks. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, now, now, any query or any, any, anything from a participant? Any question, query, or participant? Hello? Hello? Yeah, please carry uh, on. Now I'm asking the participants to... Yes, yes, I understand. Uh, I understand. Uh, yes. to, to ask you some questions, not a question, query, and understanding. Smita? Hello? Possibly they are mute. Yeah, yeah, they, they are mute. Ah, uh, they are in the mute mode. Hello, Smita. Hello. Hello, please. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Please yes. ask the question. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. You can hear me? Can you Hello. hear me? Hello? 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 Hello, sir? 
हेलो टेक्निक Can can you repeat? Is the pre-sintering? What is that you are talking? Is the is is the sintering is a pressureless sintering, or do we need to make the uh, powders into tablet form? Then we have to put no, it no, inside not, microphone. Not, 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 no, no, you no. can you can you can take polycrystalline material. Okay, you can it's take very powder tiny, form also. It's a powder form. Mix it together. And then put it in the micro. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. No, no. That's enough. No, no. He asks you the powder or pellet. Powder, 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 powder. Okay, you can go for powder. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. You, you, you can make a powder shape also. We have done that on powder shape also. Okay. You can do calcination. You can do. But we can do pellet also. There's no problem because after a single phase is formed, then make a pellet and then do that one. Then densification will be better. Okay. Right. Right. For dielectric and electrical measurement, we have to do it like. This. Right, correct. But for 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 this, do we have a calcination mask? Right, we cannot yeah, do. No, no. Yeah, you you can do calcination. It's called the pre-centering. You can do calcination micro frequency also. There are many times we have uh, observed that there is no need for calcination. There is no need for calcination. Hello. So so how how if we do not have calcination means how does it couple with micro? Because it has no, to have a dipole weight, right? Right, right. Because barium, barium, barium carbonate and uh, titanium oxide are all dipoles only. Polar materials. So it is. Uh, it has to be dipole ready state. Then only it will be. Right, 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 right. Right. Better, better, better. That's what I'm saying. Take care. Uh, That's what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, sure. sure. Uh, another small yeah, question. Yeah. This six yeah. lakh is does it include magnetron also? Thank you, Padam. Thank you, Padam. The microwave unit you mentioned just comes with the six lakhs. So does it include the magnetron also? Yes, 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 yes. yes, 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 yes. That's pretty cheap. That's very good. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh. Uh, hello, Arun P. Choudhary, sir. Yes, yes, hello. madam. Uh, sir, uh, uh, sir, the session is over. Sir. Tutorial session, uh, yeah, uh, one is over. Okay. Uh, so uh, we, uh, now we are uh, completing this session, and uh, on behalf of NSFD organizing committee, I thanks V R K Murthy sir as well as R N P Chandri sir because oh, without your you. support and without your blessing, it is impossible for me to arrange this conference. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. You are very active. You are very active, so you can do anything. I can see. <laughs> no, sir. So, but but there is a technical difficulty always. <laughs> yeah, it's always there. Yeah. Yeah. Virtual mode yeah. is always there, so you have to worry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and, sir, uh, next session we are going to start with. Now there is a lunch break, yes. and uh, uh, within, within a half hours we are going to start the next session, sir. So no, no, please no, join no, the no, next no, session. No, no. Are what what time you are starting? Two o'clock, na? No? uh yeah uh, sir one minute yeah uh yeah it start at 2 o'clock 2 o'clock not a half an hour more than what more than more than one hour sir around one hour 2 okay. 2 o'clock we are meeting again okay yeah yeah the the next tutorial session contributed by dr ashok kumar and dr dilip pradhan yes so the two yeah. two so, tutorial lectures right yeah there are two tutorials okay. uh, so please to four uh ha huh, 2 to 3 and 3 to 4 and oh, then yes. the, there is one 15 Ma minutes break and uh, sir after Ma that uh, yeah uh, uh, there is a next session of uh, conducted by kamal singh man but, but sir you join also rnp sardari sir you also no, no, join i am i am always with you i am always with you <laughs> okay sir okay so thank you thank you very much sir thank you for sir muti thank you sir again huh? Okay, thank, thank you, sir. God bless you. We'll, we'll meet again. We'll meet again on the. Okay, sure, 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 definitely. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay. Okay. Now we can close. And uh, 
yeah for all participants there is one announcement uh, the abstract yes. book is uh, published <coughs> on uh, our nsfd website it is available on nsfd website you can directly yes. download that abstract book from nsfd website they, uh, just i am uh, on home page i have keep, uh, keep it you just have to click on download then it will be automatically get downloaded okay and uh, and okay. there is one small clips for you dear attenders please focus on this because uh, that is keep from the morning program my students have taken lot of hard work to create that uh, clip so please first see the clip and then leave the session okay yes one will be there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Hello. Ha ha, sir. One minute. He is he is working on that. Sir, two minutes. Okay, you can calm down. Ah, next session is started. So, thank you, Mr. Dee. Of course, like that. Ah, yeah. Sir, one minute. There is one small clip. Ah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, he is good. Hello. Hello. yeah it's taking time so is it is it possible to open or not sorry it's unable to in morning also we are unable to run it so, and we are trying now but again it tomorrow yeah yeah sir tomorrow morning we will try it again okay sir so all the participants thank you thank you all very much and join again at 2 of uh, 2 pm for next tutorial okay okay अच्छा कुछ नहीं जब भी नहीं
अभी बिहार के मुर्गी सर का हुआ अभी लंच ब्रेक है हाँ सर हम रेडी हैं खाना खाना खा खा लिया लिया जी सर खाना खा लिया लंच कर लिए सर ये आजकल वो मैं क्या कहना खुद से कुछ आप अपना वर्चुअल बैकग्राउंड कर लीजिए उसी तरीके से ये वर्चुअल ये वर्चुअल है वर्चुअल मतलब वो एक्चुअली में वो ऐप करते रहते हैं ना जिससे कि वो अच्छा करते हैं लेक्चर है वर्चुअल सेमिनार है वर्चुअल सीन है खाली रियल रियल आप है आप ही बंद कर नहीं 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 हम तो रियल ही तो हेलो सर कैन यू हेयर मी सर जय हो मैडम जी हाँ जय हो सर जी सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर ओके मैडम नमस्कार हाँ नमस्कार सर वी आर नाउ गोविंग टू स्टार्ट सेशन टू ट्यूटोरियल so i welcome all the participants dignitaries on session 2 of nsfd 2021 actually the chairperson of this seminar was op chimankar uh, but uh, he is out of station due to that uh, i am conducting the session ah okay. uh, go ahead please yeah so dr uh, ashok kumar he is going to present the tutorial uh, he is conducting the tutorial session the topic of this uh, session is past present and future of magnetoelectric multiferroid material and devices his research in, his research interest includes fabrication and characterization of nanostructure and single phase uh, magnetoelectric uh, multiferroid thin film for non volatile memory spintronics impedance and dielectric spectroscopy he is a uh, uh, visiting scientist he was visiting scientist in department of material engineering university of cambridge uk in 2010 2008 2011 his research faculty university of puerto rico usa during the period 2008 2011 post doctoral research fellow university of puerto rico usa from 2006 to 2008 research associate indian institute of technology kharagpur india from 2005 to 2006 he has around 100 publication in journal of international repute sir has several honors and achievements to his credit he has delivered invited lecture in number of international scientific seminar workshop he has collaboration with many international and national university completed several projects funded by national and international agencies such as united state department of energy defense national science foundation so welcome you sir and we are honored to have here with us so i request uh, dr ashok kumar to please start his session uh, thank you so thank I'm you sharing. very much uh, dr ashmita actually uh, actually i could not uh, able to share my slide no, 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 can you yes, can, yes, you, yes, can yes. you allow me because it's not active right now yes yeah yeah fine thank you Uh, so so are you able to see the uh, slide yeah yes sir yes sir i can see your slide fine so uh, i would like to thank uh, you know uh, mentor uh, supervisor and all in all Uh, then I would like to thank the organizer who has given the opportunity to. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the past and future of multiply. As you know. Hello, sir. There is some problem. Hello. Um, 
हॅलो सर हॅलो सर सर यू आर म्यूट सर हा ही इज म्यूट मॅडम प्लीज कॉल हिम हा हा यस 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 आय एम ट्राईंग टू कॉल हिम शी हॅज नोटेड ना now can ah, you yes, hear sir, me yes sir uh, clear you uh, your uh, status is mute now you are now it's okay okay okay. Okay. Yeah. okay okay let me share my ppt okay it was uh, thought just a moment can you can you see my yes sir can sir you yeah, yeah yeah your uh, yeah we can see your ppt no problem okay so uh, now i am no voice cut kya raha hai I am audible. Ah oh, yes sir, yes sir. Okay. So, uh, I am the author of multiferroic. As you know, this multiferroic having means a material having several parameters. Uh, it's a ferroic parameter. So, how it is coupled, how it is useful, and why we are talking about nowadays only about the multiferroic. so this is a amalgam of you know various ferroic parameters so related to earlier we have the uh, ferrolactic ferromagnetic ferroelastic morning we have talked we we have here professor ramamurthy ramesh actually he he is the person who has pioneered or coined or given the rebirth of this multiferroic so i'll be talking later on on the those aspect of the cell uh, but oh, sorry so uh, i am audible no problem yeah 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 yeah, sir, yeah, yeah. okay <clears throat> so uh, this one of the pioneer lab in india yes yes please Uh, sorry okay okay your noise somewhere cut okay so continue okay okay now i am audible no problem uh, yes sir yes sir you can okay so this is uh, related to my institution uh, csi or national physical laboratory this is one of the you know five national labs which was conceptualized by our first prime minister pandit jawaharlal nehru and you know this is uh, the foundation is started like before even independence sai art national lab uh, honorable prime minister uh, narendra damodar das modi he he has inaugurated this uh, several you know uh, our 75th uh, anniversary of our lab and it was a grand event and we all uh, and uh, uh, our prime minister uh, delivered a talk related to achievement of our labs apart from the present the past is also you know the, the our first uh, director of national physical laboratory was dr k s krishnan uh, uh, he was uh, you know fellow of royal society um, and everybody knows about him ki he has a significant role in discovery of the raman effect not only the raman effect as well as the magnetic anisotropy and he was our first director so uh, related to the npl right now we are working on not only the you know uh, mm -hmm. this basic fundamental physics working on the theoretical experimental part of the basic fundamental physics as well as instrumentation apartment from that apart from that uh, we are also uh you know custodian of national and international standards so we are taking care of 
the all the realization of all seven SI units. Uh, right now, this is not the correct platform to talk about the seven SI unit system, but uh, this is all background about my our institution, CSIR National Physical Laboratory. And about me, uh, those who uh, about me, what? From any experimental or, you know, uh, so today about the history of, you know, how this ferroelectric and multi multiferroic uh, um, arises and all over the world accepted all those things. Apart from the history of the development of multiferroic, I'll be talking about the physics of multiferroic. Then also also talking about the physics of nanoferroelectronics because this era is you know uh, we are the discovery of ferroelectric is long back and uh, we as a, in India due to a lot of experimental limitations uh, we are um, uh, bound to expect ourselves uh, to work on the you know bulk ferroelectric material but the world has changed now and then somehow. We have to work on the nano scale ferroelectrics. Uh, if you heard the morning talk of Dr. Uh, or Professor Ramamurthy Ramesh, the most of the exotic, you know, exotic uh, properties of this ferroelectric came once you look at the nano scale, means all the escarmions, fermions, vortex, uh, many other, you know, negative capacitance. Most of the things you can only see if you work on the nanoscale ferroelectrics. So I'll be talking about some aspect of the nanoferroelectrics, and probably in India this is the you know high time we have to work on nanoferroelectrics because this this way even uh, NSF the community also has to work on this uh, way because then only you can cope with the international development. Otherwise we will lack where we are. So uh, then I'll be talking about the domains and the domain wall because uh, there are many, many, uh, you know, applications as well as as a uh, novel uh, nanoferroelectric NVRAM or ferroelectric random access memory, non-volatile memory. If you want to have the new generation of the memory based on the ferroelectric and multiferroic, then you have to understand the domains, nanoscale domains especially, and the domains wall from where you can write and read the, you know, uh, logic states. Then I will give you one of PhD students who has submitted something the main writing. I will be talking about we have developed some, a high quality uh, ferroelectric and superconductor heterostructure where we can see many exotic properties. So within my capacity, we have done a good job on that. And then ferroelectric tunnel junction, whether we will have some time or then we'll be. So the objective of this talk is like, you know, we follow the things, but then we have to follow somehow unconventional way in order to make your presence in the world. Otherwise, if you follow the things, you will do something, then it will be hard to make and uh, to uh, uh, to make your presence in the world. So then, apart from that, we I am also thinking somehow to have the high applied physics, and then train some or develop some human resources. You know, without human resources, it will be very hard to have the things uh, which you want to cope with international progress. Uh, then some of the work of single phase multiferroic because once you talk about uh, you know non volatile memory then then you have to have some single phase multiferroics then uh, i'll be talking about some inhomogeneity or a strain or the you know ferroelastic uh, 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 or you can say the effect of the strain on the domains and domain boundaries apart from the domain dynamics and then the tunneling throughout the ferroelectrics so all those things are the new a new field 
Um, in India, I think we have to have somehow make some collaborative research work in this direction so we can cope with the international development uh, apart from some basic physics, which our forefather and you know, all the um, uh, uh, high, you know, uh, research has been already done on the bulk tactic as well as, you know, uh, the basic ferrolactics. Uh, today morning we heard Professor uh, VRK Murthy. Uh, he has given some basic so about the bulk and the microwave. So, but apart from that, uh, these are the area where all over world people many. I'm talking about the groups, uh, leading groups in the world. They are working on these area where you have the many many uh, exotic property in ferrolactic and. Uh, multiferroic field. So uh, we start from the history. History is very robust in case of ferrolactic multiferroic ferromagnetism. Uh, it starts from the Maxwell theory of electrodynamics. As you know, there there is a relation between the magnetism and electricity. So uh, from there, people started conceptualizing. This is very easy. Somehow you can manipulate magnetism, or the electricity, and the vice versa, or co correlated phenomena. But the main main discovery start with the 1894 by the Perry Curie, uh, who discovered the polarizability in materials. Means you have the material where if you apply some pressure, you can get the uh, output in terms of the voltage, or you can say in terms of the piezoelectric property, or converse piezoelectric property, ferroelectric property, as well as ferromagnetic property. So, polarity of the material was discovered means you have some, you apply some uh, external um, electric field, magnetic field, or you know, you will have some a different kind of uh, ordered parameter. So, once this was discovered, then the Landau and who was the person who discovered the magnetoelectric property in the individual crystal based on, you know, the uh, you know group uh, based on the crystal uh, groups. So I think that to electric property. Sir, uh, but uh, you in this uh, twentieth uh, you can twentieth century. Yeah, you have Asmita. Your slide is not changing, problem? sir. Yeah, slide slide is fixed. It is not changing. You will have to insert in uh, slide um, mode, presentation mode. Your slide is fixed. It is not changing. It should be full page also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be. Uh, you sh you just switch on slide show mo mode, sir. Slide show mode. Tell me. Slide show slide mode. Changing or not? No, it's not changing. It's fixed. You just switch on slide show mode and then click. Then it will be get changed. Slide show mode. You have to select the slide show mode. Okay, let me let me go. Right, so, because it is not changing. There is slideshow mode, sir, in uh, screen. You will have to click on that. Stop. Ah. <sighs> Uh, can slide show mode? Uh, slide show mode. Yeah, uh, no, no, it's not in slide show mode. Where it is? Can you tell me on the screen where I can? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You you, you just uh, go and then there is a slide show on your screen. In PPT mode, there is a slide show. Uh, slide show. Now it is. You go to your PT, in my PT life, there is a slide show mode. Because here I can see your slide show mode, your computer. Slide show mode, it is. In the, after home, in the home icon, home, then design, then animation, then yeah. slide show. And other, otherwise, uh, please uh, click F5. Ah, F5. 
हाँ या या प्रिसिन या एफ फाइव आल्सो यू कैन गो डायरेक्टली टू स्लाइड शो ओके ओके लेट मी लेट मी शेयर द स्लाइड्स नाउ या इट इज नाउ इट इज चेंजिंग एफ फाइव नो 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 यस इट इज चेंजिंग ना now it is changing or not can you help me it changing na this is a program yes. no okay it's not changing it's like changing or not yeah so it's please it's... tell no 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 the slide okay. is not changing okay let me let me uh, now it's yes. okay now okay okay, okay. okay. now it we... now it is okay लेट मी शेयर द थिंग्स लेट मी शेयर so are you able to see the slide or not right now no 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 no, 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 no. we can't see the slide let me just wait a moment they go give me a 1 minute more one more minute i don't know now you can see so no sir no uh, one minute yeah we uh, no not able to no no sir no Ha uh, yes yes sir i think it's okay ha uh, uh, yes no, sir no, it's no. okay yeah yeah now it's, it's okay sir okay how we can go ahead but you should move sir but your audio down mute slide is changing or not uh, yeah yeah yes yes sir yes sir and keep your audio uh, on sir actually okay. it was much too clear i yeah it's okay okay now you you start you start you can start now sir okay okay ha yeah so it is changing na now no problem oh, yes sir yes sir no problem no problem it's changing now okay so uh, uh, where i was uh, sorry for uh, you know interruption uh, it is okay no no problem i can uh, no, no. you can see the yeah. change yeah 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 everything is okay oh, sir yeah. you start okay okay fine so uh, where i was
so i was about to talk uh, about the you know the discovery of you know uh, polarizability in material about you know discovered about if you have some magnetic ion substitution in ferroelectric material then it can illustrate magnetic property so you have the simultaneously you know parallel and the next in our year experiment so who has you know measured the electrically measured magnetic effects in the chromium oxide the uh, the ordered parameter like uh, 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 polarization as well as the magnetization are linear coupled to each so magnetic and electric ordered parameter was linearly coupled so all those things phenomena has discovered during in the 1960 and the, this was a single phase material chromium oxide but still uh, it was then dormant state uh, because there was no uh, such excitement related to the new discovery and things like that then hans speech in 1994 he has coined the single phase multiferroic material which exhibit two or more primary ferroic order parameters and then in the real you can say this last two decade uh, in 2000 uh nicola aspaldin uh, who has revisited the coexistence of the ferroelectricity and magnetism in the same phase of multiferroic material but the real rebirth of multiferroic takes place once this professor ramamurthy group would revolutionize the magnetoelectric property in the multiferroic single phase bismuth ferrite in 2003 his science paper almost revolutionized this world most of the ferroelectric community as well as, uh, as well as you can say magnetic communities uh, they come together and they try to explore many more parameters about this single phase multiferroic world has you like jump like anything else and they started working on bismuth ferrite uh, including our group when we were in the puerto rico in 2006 to 2012 we were working on new areas aspect on the multiferroic single phase bismuth ferrite during that time we also discovered some single phase material uh, uh, and then the japanese takura group uh, they were working on various 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 aspect of the multiferroic material one of them is your single phase terbium magnetic and as you know professor jim scott uh, cambridge university he was also known as the father of modern alloy with that and he is now no more in this world uh, our tribute to him and we have published many many paper related to the ferroelectric multiferroic and various aspect of the multi on several on those uh, uh, discovered things so uh, now slide it has no problem i have just changed the slide could you please anyone confirm me yes yes sir. yeah yeah yes sir yes no okay. problem you proceed okay okay so this is okay so this is the new you know uh, uh, this is the about it is a diagram where you have many ferroelectric material means the material which has ferroelectric parameters uh, like barium titanate lead titanate uh, it these are the some of the material which is ferroelectric known ferroelectric from the long, long time and a many material which is also ferrite cobalt uranium oxide and then there are many material so this is the big family of dielectric among them some of the you know ferromagnetic or magnetic order parameters some has ferroelectric or, or uh, electric parameters 
and if you see at the center the uh, intersection of all these having some of the multiferroic but it is not necessary all the multiferroic is magnetoelectric in nature uh, all magnetoelectric will be multiferroic but not all multiferroic will be magnetoelectric means if their material there are some material which has both the ferric parameter or like the ferroelectric ferromagnetic or ferroelastic but if they are not coupled to each other you cannot say it is magnetoelectric so somehow you have to show ki one of the order parameter is depend on other other order parameter so if you have look means somehow if you switch the magnetization of a material under the application of electrical external electric field or if you switch the polarization under the influence of external magnetic field then you can say ki both are coupled to each other so there are various example here and you can if you want to go the deep study because this is tutorial so the, i i believe this will give an idea to all the newcomer new researchers who want to do the materials aspect of the you know uh, research of multiferroic material or magnetoelectric multiferroic material then first they have to choose to which one will be suitable whether they work on the low temperature whether they work on the room temperature whether they work on the high temperature accordingly you have to select the material and you can then investigate various properties of those so uh, uh, this is one of the famous uh, you know uh, triangle which was coined by nikola spalding uh, in 2005 uh, where it has been shown ki how these parameters are coupled to each other and how you can explore one of the order parameter applying from external magnetic field or a strain or you can say electric field so it will have see this particular equation where this magnetization the first part is the you know normal mm, ferroelectric part where the magnetization is switched under application of external uh, magnetic field but somehow if you switch this magnetization the second uh, you know coefficient of this particular um, equation that will give you the magnetoelectric coefficient means if you are able to switch the magnetization or a spin under uh, application of external electric field similar is for the polarization if you have the dipole and if you switch the dipole and the external or if uh, uh, external magnetic field uh, you have some uh, more order parameter and that is people look okay, i'll go in the next slides where the application parts come into the picture why we need these many parameters which are coupled to each other because world is changing because uh, it has a you know exotic physics but apart from the application point of view you need the coupled parameter in to many logic state we need uh, so will have look this uh, uh, how can you design so uh, design a new multiferroic uh, maybe that multiferroic might not magnetoelectric but first you have to design multiferroic and then you can check whether it is coupled or not so it will have this mixed perovskite with the ferroelectricity like we know d0 is uh, required for ferroelectricity and dn is required for the ferromagnetism so in on the octahedra if the both cations are there then you can have uh, a kind of new multiferroic in your uh, system apart from like uh, some of the material which has the bismuth like lone pair and the lead also having the lone pair so if you have in your perovskite structure if these two type of you know then that might give you a kind of multi uh, multiferricity based on the lone pair then another kind of another family of multiferroic where the charge ordering and disordering will give you a kind of existence of both polarizability as well as you know mag uh, magnetization 
and uh, one known one you know some some of the proboscite which have been distorted octahedra like one of the classic example is y and uh, which having a distorted uh, uh, octahedra and this octahedra this due to distortion in octahedra uh, provides a kind of uh, uh, dm effect and that dm effect give you uh, the existence of both ferroelectricity and the ferromagnetism it has very high temperature ferroelectric curie temperature and a low temperature or you can say below room temperature uh, ferromagnetism so you can play you can double up you can design and fabricate uh, novel particles based on these contacts so uh, here i would like to the newcomer or those who are uh, trying to work or they, those who are working on multiferroic and ferroelectric they can design a new material based on these concept you whether you are working to develop some this kind of material which octahedra is distorted or having the lone pair or having the charge ordering and disordering or having you can say both d0 and dn uh, in the one unit cell so th these are the uh, vital parameter that should be in your mind before you start designing and development of the new uh, multiferric uh, nowadays uh, one of the magnetoelectric material is hexafarite um, i'll cover most of the things which is uh, where you can start your research but i'll not go in depth analysis of all those things in this having this you know hexafarite having also a kind of uh, material but this having net polarization some uh, zero uh, but under the application of external magnetic field it creates polarization so uh, and then also it all depends upon uh, the application of magnetic field whether it is uh, in the plane of magnetization or it is uh, out of plane where it will create uh, in the in, 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 you can say in, along the direction of the polarization or uh, in the plane of polarization uh, so it all depends upon the configuration there are various type of hexafarite i can i can show you uh, y type you know uh, <clears throat> where you have the the magnetization is due to the proper screw or transverse co uh, conical shape how how it generates the polarization you know the these are the magnetic material but due to the structural uh, uh, structural uh, confinement of this spin uh, it creates polarization so this is one of the field although these materials having uh, polarization uh, the magnitude of polarization is less but very rich in physics so one can start working on this particular there are a series of compound where you have you know chromium uh, beryllium oxide these are the main compound which is listed you can see many of the area of the review art kits and things where you can find as a function of polarization if you uh, differentiate it and double differentiate it uh, these you know the this is p e and p which is very simple uh, that is you know uh, under external electric field you have the polarization and this another second term is related to the normal uh, uh, magnetism where magnetization can develop under external uh, magnetic field and then the third term you know this is related to the um, uh, strain uh, so strain will give you kind of um, development of uh, dielectric uh, and other properties uh, apart from that uh, 
uh, you have the cross coupling PM epsilon. So these are the three coupled parameters. So inverse of the susceptibility will give you uh, the various parameter uh, where you can inverse of the you know DP that will directly proportional to DM by DH. So this, if somewhere you are getting a kind of a P square M type of linear quadratic coupling or P square M square type of bi quadratic coupling. Uh, once you explore these parameters, this is related to, you know, where there is PM coupling should not be zero. So all those things can be uh, derived based on the develop based on the uh, property, whether that is uh, in your system or not. Uh, apart from the space, uh, there is a really rich physics of the magnetoelectric in the composite phase in terms of the nano scale <coughs> sorry <coughs> in terms of the nano scale or in terms of the bulk i'll come to the bulk also but here i again the same ramesh group who has developed uh, some beautiful structure of uh, you know uh, barium titanate and uh, cobalt ferrite having a multi layer structure as well as the 3d 30 structure where you have the matrix of the barium titanate and the pillar kind of things in your CFO. And you can see the magnetization and then the magnetoelectric property, you know, the function of temperature and then as a function of, you know, electric field also they have observed. So this this is this is also known as the product product property relation. So at the nano scale, the interface play uh, vital role in order to in order to have the magnetoelectric property. So this kind can be developed using you know uh, a kind of um, high quality epitaxial thin field as well as a high quality of uh, a high quality of you know. Uh, um, uh, um, three zero nano structure, so that can be done with the help of laser deposition system. Uh, so I was talking about the nano scale uh, composite structure, but this is related to the bulk composite structure, and this kind of the structure has shown a tremendous, you know, property of magnetoelectric like. 100 times, 1000 times better than the thin field. But then again, uh, this kind of a structure has limited application in terms of the uh, magnetic magnetic uh, field sensor. I'm talking about this was very good as already the Ballon group in uh, Penn State and many other group, Rio in Chris Korea, they are working on these kind of the laminated structure where they laminate the ferroelectric material with the ferrimagnet, terphenol D, and then uh, this is various structure, TTS structure, TR structure, RR structure, where uh, the many electroceramic can be classified in the many other property, like some property or product of the property, combination of the property. And you can have, this is the one of the, basic research paper by the Rayo. He is also one of our collaborator in uh, now he's in Korea, Chris Korea teams. And he was the person who has discovered first time in kind of laminated structure can show many, many fold magnetoelectric coefficient compared to the existing uh, nano scale. Material. You can see here magnetoelectric coefficient is in terms of the d by dh having 100 or 150. But once how it is, uh, in, I can see in IIT Madras uh, recently I have written one paper. So many other group also have developed of uh, uh, which can measure the laminated structure. We can measure the magnetoelectric coefficient. And this is very simple, you know, you have the only two big magnets, having the thermos coil and the lock-in amplifier, function generator, DC power sub, and that's it. And uh, you have to generate, a, you have to 
encapsulate the your laminated structure inside the system where you can have you can uh, take out the you, you apply a very small field ac field of one or state or two or state and then scan the property as a function of field magnetic coefficient as a function of field you can get it and now recently a uh, scientist has claimed a uh, device which can detect the nano tesla uh, magnetic field and that is very good for you know a squid a squid also which required uh, you know many superconducting coils and other things so this is one of the big achievements in this have this property is you can see here this d is enormous around 40% which is quite amazing for any kind of detection for the very low low magnetic field so this having the property composite structure uh, bulk or micro scale composite structure can be utilized uh, in in terms of magnetic uh, field sensor but if you want to have a kind of uh, for non volatile memory and uh, memory application the nano scale composite structure uh, or single phase structure which i have discussed and i'll talk many more uh, Uh, things on, on this property. This is the same. Uh, either you can have laminated structure, like you know, some property of structure. Because this is based on once you apply magnetic field, what happens? It happens. It changes the dimension of the magnetic material, which transfer to the due to the change in uh, dimension. It changes the dimension of you know piezoelectric material. which finally in turns provide you with the magnetic coefficient so the it all depends upon how it is uh, combined with um, uh, both ferroelectric and ferromagnetic material in terms of whether you want to exploit the sum property whether you want to exploit the product properties or combination of both you know sum and product property so all depending upon your configuration whether you want to have the high output uh, high output magnetic coefficient so this is what as you know uh, we have discussed about many more things we will have or working on nano scale ferroelectric ferromagnetic and multiferroic materials because as you know the moore's law is as per the moore's law each or every up to 2 year the number of transistor on the chip or from the cmos technology will doubled so already saturated you can say and it is based on the minimum ic feature size if you have if you can see here if it is 0.1 it will give enormous heat like you can see your uh, laptop or desktop generated uh, uh, heat which is in terms of the huge amount like after if you redux further reduce the size it will generate the heat uh, in terms of you know nuclear reactor uh, or rocket nozzle or surface of the sun if you further reduce the size so somehow you have to change the thing so in order to change you have to work on the like and not and not say where you can have a kind of these property so all things are, if you see the my process of the moore's law like uh, i i could say when it's 2010 and now this is 2020 and uh, already number of transistor integrated chips like billion billion number of uh, transistor in the chips so um, one of the group in uh, germany uh, i think we all aware of them uh, they are working on hafnium oxide Uh, hafnium oxide is a high k material and if you put zirconia on hafnium oxide it is multi it is ferroelectric uh, so ferroelectric hafnium zirconium oxide and this is one of the promising candidate which will work as a ferroelectric material as well as a high k dielectric in order to compete with the change the and it is very easy to integrate on the on the silicon also so once you integrate on the silicon that can re <clears throat> easily it can uh, transfer to the uh, or you can say it can 
uh, it, it can change the CMOS technology using the high K dialectics. So that is the high K dialectics, and that high K dialectics is not only high K dialectics, but also you so uh, you can uh, you can say uh, it is ferrolactic. <coughs> so uh, one of the material which I like, I think I, I I'll be maybe new new people in this ferrolactic community. They can they can work on the hafnium zirconium oxide, which is really promising ferrolactic material. But then you have to work on the keeping. Bulk will not work in order to have a, a kind of getting the proper ferrolactic property and very high K dialectic. So these are the glimpses where you can and find out how it is uh, useful for you like on seven nanode ten nanometer and it is also billion dollar market. Uh, or you have to apply the thing. Side where I would like to emphasize why we need multiferroic material. If you see the slide, MRAM and FRAM having some limitation, and this limitation can be overcome if you have some multiferroic random access memory, where you can you can write write in the nanosecond, but then the read with the, you can say, ferroelectric uh, spin. So you can write with the uh, F, um, uh, polarization, you can write polarization, and read the same data or logic using the mag uh, magne magnetic uh, with the spin of that particular system. So now you have the free hand, so that can, it can the high capacity as well as write read process. In order to improve the write read process, we have, uh, we, you can have multiferroic uh, random access memory, uh, which is very, very, uh, you can write in very fast writing in the nanosecond, and also you can read very fast in the nano or microsecond. So, if you really want to work on memory domain and domain walls, then you should know about the physics of the domain of the How it, it, it will, it is not working like, you know, the bulk. It is working like uh, a different way. If you see the, it's it's like swimming. If you, if you have the nano scale domain, and if you apply some external electric field, it will move. It will move from one position to another position. And that is one of the things that scientists and the researchers want to understand how to control the movement of the uh, this domain. And if you want to say memory, if you want to make it memory, then certainly you should have control of the domain. So all those physics and the various group is working on this to understand the high quality, you know, uh, fabrication uh, facility using the EBIM lithography, uh, they have cut the various aspect of the various domain of the uh, medium tight net, 180 degree domain, 90 degree domain, and then they can apply electric field and see how it is switching under external electric field, how it is behaving. So what it means with the external fabrication process, you can have the different design of the domains of the same material, which can be used indifferently or differently. It all depends upon how much thickness you are keeping your either in the X direction or in the Y direction or in the direction. The dimensions of the domain play a vital role in order to fabrication of the new nanoferrotic world. So uh, all those things uh, you have to understand. Really, one when people are kind of working on this. So again, uh, come into the picture like depolarization effect. We, are, we uh, that is there. So then you have to how to eliminate all the depolarization effect if you are working on the nano scale. It's not easy. Uh, in the in the bulk you can have you you can have with the some little depolarization or you can say a screening effect and other things. 
then also you can get the property, but he accepts not. And which also this no screening on the surface field, which creates what we have heard Professor Ramamurti Ramesh about the vortex, about you know escarmion, and this is the uh, this is the thing where uh, comes into the picture and that generate or creates a kind of polarization vault. Because you have to have the somehow control on the meaning of the law and other things will go and valid uh, if you are really uh, uh, many kind of you know uh, domain. On a TDP domain, a type domain. So um, uh, this is all. I am just giving you the glimpses where you can understand uh, how you can be So if you are really want to understand the ferroelectric or multiferric material, you have to understand the domains and domain walls at the nano scale, and then all other equipment that is important for uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, Gustav Catalan and Jim Scott, they have developed some new theory be, uh, apart from the Kittel law, how the thickness of the film, uh, film thickness, uh, gives the, a kind of relation with the domains and domain wall. So they, they, they developed some a new uh, Gustav or Catalan constant uh, which which uh, which uh, satisfy the scaling law of if you reduce the thickness of the thin film uh, that will have some sort of the uh, um, different kind of omega square by delta where earlier like Kettle, uh, Kettle has not uh, considered the domain wall thickness so um, as one of the parameter so all those things that you have to understand uh, will have to uh, be uh, based on the new things, uh, new era of the domain wall and the you know domain uh, nano scale, and this is another good example from uh, Ramamurthy uh, professor group where they found the open circuit voltage above the band gap. What does it mean? Uh, you it means. Uh, it is the basic of uh, you know uh, semiconductor. In no system can give output voltage or uh, um, uh, sorry output voltage. I am talking about that. Uh, it is related to the uh, open circuit voltage uh, above than the band gap. But this material can give you like uh, 10 volt, 20 volt, 30 volt. Recently, I can see 45 volt. People has measured the output voltage very high in this ferroelectric material, where they have put the electrode in plane electrode uh, parallel to the um, uh, parallel to the domain and domain wall. And then what happened? This domain and domain wall, domain wall is conducting in nature, and domain is insulating. So, so they are making a natural um, you know, capacitor connected in series, and that give a kind of output volt, uh, open circuit voltage above the band gap. 3.9 electron volt is the band gap of bismuth ferrite, but this is giving around 20, 30, or it all depends upon the uh, electrode distance, uh, how you are keeping electrode on the top of the surface. So this is one of the, uh, one of my PhD student, uh, it is Borkar, now he's faculty at NIT Warangal. Uh, he work on the uh, various, uh, various aspects of the photoferroelectric material or optoferroelectric uh, material. That is exotic. If somebody is work on that, uh, another kite, ferroelectric proviscite, which is really uh, one of the uh, hardest area right now, and it can compete any time. Only the drawback right now is the low short circuit current. The day some scientist will achieve uh, the high short circuit current, because our open circuit voltage is very high. If somehow one can manage the short circuit current uh, high, that will be even the replace all these silicon-based you know, solar uh, devices.
So that much potential in the ferroelectric and multiferroic material have, which can even the coming 10, 20 years that can replace silicon or uh, silicon based ferroelectric, uh, silicon, uh, silicon based solar cells. So this is one of the area which is also uh, expanding and that can be done. I will not talk many things because many things are here that can be not covered. So uh, since I have given you the background of, uh, you know, uh, about the collectic and multiferroic uh, material, but th this is uh, some of the work that we have done in the last five, 10 years, which is also promising. And uh, we have discovered some new single multiferroic uh, uh, the uh, they have uh, they have cut by FIB the single crystal of the lead zirconate titanate and iron tantalate oxide and what we found we found that the hypothyroid and that have the main electric phase transition uh, apart from this and the having the magnet not only in the bulk but in the thin film of also, what we have found in this, it is single phase in nature. It has the ferral, ferromagnetic property at the room temperature. Apart from magnetism, it is single phase in nature. You can say a single case Apart from that, so what we do once we prove him, that this is single phase in nature. It has ferromagnetic property. It has ferromagnetic property, and then whether at nano scale can it is magnetoelectric in nature or not. Whether we can switch the domain under external magnetic field or not. So this is one of the classical example where you can see the application of this is without application of external magnetic field. And this is after application of 18 kilo or state film. And you can see the domain, most of the domain switches. It is now, it has been, it, the, the, it was a scheme on the same frame, same position, same place. And what we found, we found there is, you know, a significant change in the uh, ferroelectric domain under external magnetic field. What it indicates, it indicates it has a strong magnetoelectric coupling at nano scale. So what we did, we, we, we found how it can be switched. So under application of my external plus three kilo or state magnetic field, you can see there is two type of domain. One is the, uh, this blue, uh, what color is red and another is, you know, violet color. And then once you have, a, once we apply minus three kilo or state, uh, some of the domains switch from this state to this state. Um, and then again, we applied plus three kilo or state. What we found, it has again switched from this state to the another state. So what we found, no. around 40 to 50% domains switch from uh, one state to another state, again, an external electric field, it again their original position. So this is also one uh, Achievement from group, you know, Professor Katya and all involved and material, which soon and uh, now new hello. To uh, measure the magnetoelectric coefficient of this sir, lamina, uh, what we found. Hello, sir. Is... Uh, sir, last five minutes. Yeah, because it's yes. time is already over. Okay. How much time I have now? Just five minutes, sir. Actually, we are over time, but five minutes, sir. Hi, ah, yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Sir, last okay. five minutes. You just conclude okay, okay, within okay, okay, five, okay. five minutes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this domain reversal of, uh, you know, under external electric and magnetic field. It has minus 15 volt, and then you can apply the external magnetic field, some of the domain switches. This is another, you can see here. And then 
so this is one of the classical examples where we can switch the prolactic domain and application of external magnetic field. I am not going to talk on this because as I have been one of my PhD student, Mr. Ravi Kant, now he is Dr. Ravi Kant, he is also now assistant professor in Gopal. So, um, uh, he has uh, fabricated some new uh, heterostructure uh, of, of the superconducting and ferroelectric PGT. And it is not only the 100 nanometer, we have went down to 2 or 3 nanometer uh, PGT having the superconducting layer constant 100 nanometers what we found we have this we have this is one of the great achievement uh, other work has been carried out you know in the collaboration with uh, many groups but this is all done in india so that can you see rsm picture of this particular heterostructure it is so epithelial in nature and what we found it has to be has to affect having you know, super connectivity in terms of the magnetization development and other things a very good property uh, even the 100 nanometer having 60 uh, or more uh, micro column Polarized to found we are able to have the this paper is under writing. And what we found, we found the resistive switching property in superconducting ferroelectric heterostructure, where we can switch the polarization or we can switch the superconducting state to a normal state, a normal to superconducting state. And the, these property, the, this switching takes place only due to the switching position. All this, this is the in-plane property of this uh, uh, behavior. And apart from that, what you have, uh, this, this paper is also published in the switch, but also the mechanical under the pressure, by mechanical we have civilization from one state to another state. So if you'll have see this, this this having the erase by a certain three volt, and then you can again further you can create in phase and out phase. So uh, what what happened? Uh, we can mechanically write, electrically erase as well as electrically write and mechanically we can erase the thing. So all those we. Apart from that, oh, we are mechanically write various, you know, uh, 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 logic states having the zero degree, forty-five degree, ninety degree domains. And with the help of that, if you'll have looked this, this paper is already published, where we can switch the ferroelectric domain, not only application of external electric field, but with the help of uh, external mechanical pressure. The pressure goes down from several uh, gigapascal to, you know, many. That is equivalent to certain gigapascal. So, uh, like we applied the uh, 1700 nanonewton deep pressure on that, and then we are able to switch the ferroelectric polarization. Uh, this is one of the great example where we can mechanically write, electrically switch, uh, or electrically you can switch the uh, domains and mechanically you can write various uh, ways you can say or uh, but uh, again there is limitation you can you cannot have the mechanically you know mechanically you can only write but you cannot read the things because once you remove the press uh, it, it 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 is not able to, because it is not in the like electrical things so 
so these are the things uh, which is, uh, has been done over here. And I think I have, now I have given you a glimpses about the uh, present situation of multiferroic worldwide. And in India, also various group are working on the, you know, Asis Garg from IIT Kanpur, uh, Professor uh, Rajiv Ranjan, uh, ISC Bangalore, and many other groups, they are working on uh, various aspects of the ferrolactic and multiferroic and uh, at the nano scale, because you have to compete. Uh, basic physics is fine with the bulk ferrolactic material and multiferroic material, but uh, nowadays, as you heard morning uh, talk from Professor Ruti, uh, the only thing uh, now the focus is below the 10 nanometer exotic property of multiferroic, because uh, any device, memory device will made, that will be, the dimension will be less than 10 nanometers. So you have to explore the property of ferrolactic and multiferroic material uh, having dimension less than the 10 nanometers. So all these properties which have shown is less than 10 nanometer, where we observe the tunneling behavior also in this multiferroic and ferrolactic material. And uh, finally, I would like all my collaborators and my PhD student, who are now they are most of them faculty, and um, all from uh, the group where we have mm, done the collaborative, because without collaboration, very hard to do uh, high-end physics and high-end, um, uh, you know, uh, high-end device publication things and all property. Um, if you want to have uh, discuss, if you want to have the, explore the property, you have to do collaboration with the expert in that area. And thank you for <clears throat> attention. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. That's informative information. There is uh, one query. Uh, one query, can I ask? Yes, sir. Uh, th this is from the atten attendance list. So, you, Abbas, he want to ask that study of hysteresis loop give us clue about the application of memory elements through some light on it. How in multiferroid it is influenced? Yes, so what uh, any multiferroic material, uh, in that particular material, if the element, which is, it, uh, you can say it is made of certain element, like uh, bismuth or uh, lead or some, you know, <clears throat> optoactive material in the system, if you shine the light, and then the meantime, if you capture the change in the polarization uh, using, uh, you know, uh, ferrolactic hysteresis or any other property, uh, or in the multiferroic, if you, uh, now there are several groups, they have discussed, they have explored the property, they find the light, and they measure the change in the magnetoelectric coefficient. So, this is also possible. You light the, without light you measure the magnetoelectric coefficient, and with light you can measure the magnetoelectric coefficient. Without light you have the polarization, and with light you have the polarization. But the only thing, your materials should have active in optical domain also. It means they should have active not only the, you know, visible light, apart from the visible light you can do you you can use the uh, uv light also uv is well known particular people are working on optoferroelectric materials <clears throat> you can uh, read the book of uh, professor you know uh, japanese professor uh, optoferroelectric book uh, you can there are many books which is based on the uh, from very beginning so you can use ir you can use the uh, visible light, you can use the near light, near light, in order to modulate the, you know, ferroelectric uh, property or magnetoelectric property. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. So, I think so, so if Abbas get uh, satisfied. Okay. So, thank you, thank you very much, sir, Ashok Kumar, just uh, accepting our invitation and giving such a nice and informative talk. I think uh, the tutorial, this tutorial session, we can get new knowledge as well as basic understanding. So, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Now, um, our uh, next speaker is Dr. Dilip Pradhan. He is from Department of Physics and Astronomy, NIT, Raul Kela. Uh,
टॉपिक इज स्ट्रक्चरल फेस ट्रांजिशन इन फेरोइलेक्ट्रिक मटेरियल डॉक्टर दिलीप प्रधान कंप्लीटेड हिज पोस्ट डॉक्टरेट ऑन मल्टीफेरोइक पॉलिमर इलेक्ट्रोलाइट एट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ प्योर्टो रिको प्रियो पियोर्डस कैंपस सैन जुआन पियोर्टो रिको यूएसए फ्रॉम टू थाउजेंड सेवन टू टू थाउजेंड एट His area of interest includes ferroelectric, magnetoelectric, multiferroic, structural phase transition, ionically conducting polymer, electrolytes, lithium-ion rechargeable battery materials developments. Sir has completed few projects sponsored by UGC, DAE, SERB, uh, IUAC, New Delhi. He has 74 publication in Journal of International Repute. He has guided eight PhD students. he has been the coordinator of international school on fundamental crystallography and on and workshop on structural phase transition in 2017 and characterization techniques for multifunctional materials in 2013 sir is a life member of orissa physical society he is the recipient of orissa physical society he has got young scientist award from the uh, for the year 2012 consultant commission of mathematical and theoretical crystallography international union of crystallography iu uh, in 2017 so i welcome you sir and ha yeah, uh, yeah. i request you to start i just change you as a yes i am not able to yeah yeah, yeah one minute sir Sir, can you uh, see share yes, screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, sir. You can start. My my slides are visible, madam. Ha, uh, yes, sir. Oh. Yes, sir. You first change slide show mode. Yes. Then now it is fine. Possible to change. Ha, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. You can start. Hey, Sita ji. Uh, Hi, many yes, people sir. are not. Uh, many people are not today mute. You can mute them. Otherwise, uh, lot of disturbances. Lot of disturbances are coming during the show. Uh, okay, sir. I will try. But the most of the uh, participants why are. Are, uh, why yeah, are the, are coming? Uh, here I am not observing any disturbances. In my place, there is a clear sound. Maybe internet issue is there, sir, because in my side there is no disturbances, and I am not hear any disturbances also. And here the panel, all panelists are mute, and compulsorily attendants are mute there because we have booked in Webex event, so the attendants have no accessibility of uh, sound as well as video. And most of the panelists, all the panelists are mute. so there is no noise issue maybe internet problem is there sir oh, okay dr dilip pradhan you can okay start. thank you okay very good afternoon to all of you myself uh, dr dilip kumar pradhan today i am going to present the utis metal uh, the tutorial talk in this talk uh, the title of this presentation is structural phase transition in ferroelectric materials uh, in this talk uh, this talk was uh, mainly prepared for the mainly students uh, i i am not going to show any of my research result in this uh, in this talk i will only try to explain you uh, what exactly the structural phase transition means and most of the cases i will take the classical example of barium titanate and the, uh, still uh, there are lots of opportunities there to understand the crystal structure of this barium titanate and at last uh, i will show you one of my master students uh, work how we did the, how the a more analysis of the barium titanate phase transition is related to this i should acknowledge all of my supervisors professor arvind choudhury and the professor bk samagra they taught me related to this uh, ferroelectric material and structure i am so thankful to my postdoc supervisor professor katia and uh, professor sn behra he also taught me some time the phase transition and finally uh, professor moi sariyo from university of west bengal ki bilbao stan he taught me the group theory how this group theory can be applied to structural phase transition 
Okay, this uh, this slide tells that the nature slope symmetry. Most of the cases uh, in crystallographic symmetry, the number C I am taking. Actually, this slide uh, is I am taking from my supervisor, Professor Chowdhury. Actually, this lecture is dedicated to him uh, because tomorrow is his 76th uh, birthday. On his uh, 76th birthday, this uh, lecture is dedicated to him. Uh, this is uh, this. Uh, Uh, this is a slide. Yes. This 75 knots, 76. 75. Then, uh, sorry, sorry, this is for I put probably 75. Right. In, in okay. my calculation, it is 76. Okay, anyway. Okay. okay, this is the, this, uh, I am showing here the number 3. In crystallography, there are 3 point symmetry operations. One point symmetry operation which is clearly observable in nature is the rotation. If, if I rotate it along this center by 180 degree, I will get the symmetrical equivalent position. This is this rotation of the one of this point symmetry operation. And this is the butterfly. If I draw a line here, this is the mirror reflection to each other. This is another point symmetry operation. And this is one of this picture what I take. If I take a center of inversion from one point to another point, I will get the symmetrical equivalent position. These three are the point symmetry operation. If I combine this point symmetry operations, we'll put the restriction on this lattice parameter to get the seven crystal system, 14 Bravis lattices, 32 point groups. And if I apply the translational symmetry, this is the translational invariant. By applying the translational invariant on the crystals, we get the space group, there will be 230 space group. Out of 230 space group, only few of them showing this paralytic properties. These paralytic properties are related to at least along one direction means the polar paralytic, that's why some dot symbol is given. If I combine these three, this gives the, in Hindu culture, this is the own symbol. So, own symbol is closely related to our symmetry. So, my plan, my plan of presentation, I will start with this. Uh, there will be different people who represent the seven crystal system in different ways, but I will try to represent the seven crystal system according to the hierarchy of symmetry, hierarchy of point group symmetry. I will give a general introduction. After that, uh, we'll discuss about the phase transition, that is the first order and second order phase transition. There are classification of phase transition. One way is to describe the whether it is a first order or a second order phase transition. Second type phase transition is the, whether it is reconstructive phase transition, displacive phase transition, or a digital. Later, people are now, instead of telling you this as a order digital phase transition, this, this, this is order disorder phase transition. After that, uh, the fundamental Landau theory of second order phase transition for the student, I'll derive all these steps. How the Landau theory of phase transition is able to explain the, all these stereoelectric uh, behavior of the material. We'll derive, derive that one. And finally, by taking the barium tightness as an example, I'll try to show you how there is a group subgroup, means how the symmetry is changing whenever the phase transition from a uh, paraelectric phase to paraelectric phase is taking place. And at last, uh, I'll, as I told, I'll show you one of my master students' work, how the symmetry mode analysis, symmetry mode analysis thinks now whenever there is a phase transition in case of displacement phase transition due to the, due to the displacement of these cations from its equilibrium positions, how instead of changing of this atomic position, the change of this uh, atoms during this phase transition, that can be represented as a mode, how this mode is being responsible for this phase transition, we will try to describe that. So, these are the classification of ferroelectrics. Ferroelectrics are the subgroup of uh, dielectrics, piezoelectrics, pyroelectrics. I am not going to tell more much about this one because uh, all of you know this one. But the main term of ferroic means we refer to a material which is capable of switching behavior, which is which for the switching behavior between two or more stable states. And the material, these are some of these outstanding properties. This ferroelectric is material for permanent dipole moment. They have the uh, lack of uh, center of symmetry, which they are non center symmetric. And the ferroelectric materials are piezoelectric, although converse is not true. The ferroelectric materials have one or more phase transitions. Whenever there is a phase transition taking place, the symmetry dating is taking place in the modern language. I will try to show you what is the exact uh, meaning of the lemon example, how, how the symmetry, what does the symmetry. And breaking image. Finally, above this phase transition temperature, this over the Curie wave law. 
and the characteristic property of the ferroelectric material is known in, in the ferroelectric history assessment. So, within one minute, I will try to tell you what is the history of ferroelectricity. This is the Rochelle of 1920. We are celebrating the 100 years of uh, discovery of this Rochelle salt this year, last year. This is the first ferroelectric material. This is the potassium tartarate tetrahydrate. The ferroelectric phase transition is observed, from, observed only from minus 18 degree centigrade to 24 degree centigrade. But the only problem with the material is if there is a small change in the chemical composition, she will not get the ferroelectric materials. And after 1935, the potassium dihydrogen family came into picture. During that time, it has been well established that hydrogen bonded as the necessary condition to get a ferroelectric material. And in 1940, this is the first oxide which the ferroelectricity was discovered. This is in three first. First first is without hydrogen bonded system. The second first is more than one number, more than one phase transition. The third first is a phase a material which has a paraelectric phase. Some of these important uh, events in the ferroelectricity are, are for the Ellicrofts group, Ellicrofts group from the Penn State. They, uh, they define that 1920 to 30, this is the Rochelle uh, salty year, 30 to 40, potassium dihydrogen phosphate era, 40 to 50, this is the Vidam Titanate era, mainly high, high dielectric capacitor was developed during that time, 50 to 60, period of proliferation, during this time so many oxide ferroelectrics were discovered. 60 to 70, the high science, the soft mode order, order parameter of the science was just described. And 70 to 80, age of diversification means ferroelectric electro optic and thermistor behavior was there. 18 to 90, age of, age of integration, and 90 to 20, the age of miniaturization. And after that, the multi period taking over this ferroelectric era. So these are some of these applications. Depending on the, on this application, you have to choose that one. At least for the student, I will suggest you read this article, the physics of ferroelectric memory. How this ferroelectric memory is related to the displacement of this cations from this equilibrium position in the ferroelectric state, give two states plus, plus P and minus P that, that corresponds to the uh, basis of this memory device application for ferroelectric materials. Okay, let us start with the first part. The first part of my presentation is I will try to give you some idea what is the point group means. The point group means the point group means it, it is the collection of the symmetry operations. In case of the symmetry operation, whenever the symmetry operation operates on a crystal, most of the cases symmetry operation it can be represented by means of a matrix. So if we operate this operation by means of this matrix, there will be interchange of the, of the position will take place, but the crystal will appear as same before this operation. Whenever we are getting these conditions, after the operation, whatever the object gives rise to various symmetry related positions. There are mainly four symmetry operations. By some angle, if you are able to get the symmetrically equivalent positions, whether rotation, rotation can be represented by phi, how much angle you are rotating, phi is equal to 2 pi by n. All of you know n can be the only possible value 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. Then after that, the inversion, whenever this rotation, rotation can be represented by means of this matrix. And there will be inversion. Inversion, if I have a coordinate x, y, z, if I do the inversion, I will get minus x, minus y, minus z. If any point group, the inversion minor one bar is there, that group which corresponds to the central symmetry point group. In, in, the, in this case of this uh, rotation, sorry, the inversion, the inversion is occurring through a point, but the rotation is occurring through an axis. The, the inversion is dependent by means of a matrix, which is whenever the diagonal element is minus one, minus one, minus one. If the, if the determinant of this matrix is plus one, that is, that is the symmetry operation, it never changes the chirality. If the determinant is minus one, it never the chirality, or it, 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 it changes the handedness. Then after this operation, the third point symmetry operation is the mirror reflection. Let us take I have a point x, y, z. If I, if I do the reflection along the x, y plane, only what will happen, x, y, z will be converted into minus x, minus x plus x plus x plus y minus z. If I represent that one in terms of a matrix, the matrix will be 1, 1, 1, minus 1. The determinant will be minus 1. Whenever the operation, the determinant will be minus 1, that corresponds to a operation, that operation changes the handedness. Let us take, if I am taking 2 bar, 2 bar is equivalent to mirror. I am giving a simple example. Let us take, I am writing a number d. If I do a rotation coming out from this screen, it will be rotating by 180 degree by 2 fold rotation. d will become b. And if I do an inversion, B will become Q. If I, if I take a mirror plane from Q to D, then it will become D. 
So two fold rotation, two rotation of two fold, then inverse one that will be equivalent, equivalent to mirror picture form. So let me summarize. Summarize what are the symmetry of rotations. Okay, and again, again the, the combination of this rotation and inversion is known as the roto inversion, the roto inversion for n bar. So if I'm if we are discussing about the seven, if you are discussing about the point symmetry operation, we have one, two, three, four, six. In this case, the determinant will be equal to if you do the one fold, two fold, three fold, four fold, and six fold rotation, the determinant will be plus. In this case, the chirality figure here. Means that if I do a left hand, left hand become left hand, right hand become right hand. But if I do an improper rotation, the improper rotation means rotor number one bar, two bar, three bar, four bar, six bar. In this case, the chirality will be changed. And in this case, the determinant will be minus one. So why I'm telling this one? If I do a, if I, if these are the point symmetry operations, if these point symmetry operations on a, on a unit cell, a unit cell of a crystal structure, of a unit cell, that will give me the seven crystal systems. Usually people are thinking that. The restriction between the lattice parameter, A, B, C, for the seven crystal system, that gives the symmetry of other things. But that is not to, for to, to, to describe the crystal system, what we have to de de do, we have to define the, if what is the effect or, or what is the characteristic of symmetry of other things there for a particular crystal system. If we operate that symmetry of other things on this crystal system, we get the restriction on this lattice parameter A, B, C, and the alpha, beta, gamma. So based upon this one, let me define the seven crystal system. Only I'll take the only operations one, two, three, four, six. Based upon this symmetry characteristic symmetry operation, we can describe the seven crystal systems. If I'm if I am doing an operation of one, if I do the operation one one on on a unit cell a unit cell of a crystal, and if I correlate between the position coordinate before the operation and after the operation, I will get the restriction from this one. A is not equal to B not equal to C, alpha, beta, gamma is equal to 90 degree. So in triclinic crystal system, the characteristic symmetry operation is 1, 4. For monoclinic characteristic symmetry operation is 2 or 2 bar is equal to mirror reflection. If I put a, if I do a operation of monoclinic of, of two-fold rotation or a mirror reflection on the unit cell crystal of a monoclinic crystal structure, I will get this restriction. Finally, for orthorhombic crystal structure, three mutually perpendicular two fold axis will be there. That will give the restriction of A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma is equal to 90 degree. Similarly, for four fold rotation, the crystal system is four or four bar. So for tetragonal crystal system, for this case, the lattice parameter restriction will be this one. For, but for QB crystal system, although along the C phases or any of these phases, if you do a rotation of four fold, although you are getting the symmetrical equivalent positions, but the characteristic symmetry operation for the QB crystal system will be bad. If you rotate along this body diagonal, a three-fold rotation by 120 degree, you will get the symmetrical equivalent of position. For the cubic crystal system, the characteristic symmetry of operation is a three-fold rotation. Similarly, for trigonal, trigonal has two rhombohedral and hexagonal. For trigonal, three-fold operation is a characteristic symmetry of operation. For hexagonal, the characteristic symmetry of operation is six. So what I want to tell you, the symmetry of operation is describing the Restriction between the lattice parameter and the angle between them, or that describing the crystal structure. So in this in this cases, always most of the cases we think that this is not equal to. But if but in actual case, it should it should be read as this is not necessarily equal to the. If it is equal, then that is also not fine because the crystal systems are describing based on the presence of this characteristic symmetry of other things. So based on this one, uh, if I combine all these point symmetry operations, there will be 32 point group. These are the 32 point group. So how you judge or how you know which point group belongs to which crystal system? What is the meaning of point group? Point group means, in case of point group means the point defines if the symmetry operation will act, at least one of these point will be remain fixed during this operation. The point is coming from the corner of the origin. Okay. Second is group. If how many numbers of symmetry operations are operating? The collection of the symmetry operation, they are forming this group and it will obey this, all these group axioms. That's why the, whenever we are describing this point group, all these point groups can be described based upon the how many numbers of total number of symmetry operation describing the, that point group and that point group belongs to that particular crystal system. So how to judge which, which point group belongs to which crystal system? So I'm giving some, idea. If in case of monoclinic, if one will be there in the first number, that is triclinic. If two will be there, only two in the first one, one number will be there. 
that will become monoclinic 2 or 2m bar. If there will be 3, 2, 2, 2, that corresponds to orthodromy. If 4 will be there in the first number, provided the 3 will not be there in the second number, that corresponds to tetragonal. If 4 will be there in the first number, if 3 will be there in the second number, second number, that corresponds to cubic crystal systems. And if 3 will be there in the first, that belongs to trigonal. If 6 will be there in the first number, that corresponds to hexagonal. So based upon this point symmetry operation, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, you will be able to classify the 32 point groups. And these 32 point groups belong to the seven crystal systems. So these are the centering of the simulation. This is the primitive one. This is A center, A base center, B base center, C base center. This is the body center and this is the pair center. If I combine all these symmetry operations, then what you will get? We will get the 14 gravis lattices. These are the 14 gravis lattices corresponds to the seven crystal systems. So whenever we are describing this 14 gravis lattices, the unit cell, the unit cell should, come up, should suggest the highest symmetry with the smallest Value, so with, with, with the smallest value of the unit cell. That's why based upon this one, what we are describing, we are describing there are only 14 gravis lattices. So whenever we are describing a space group, the space group is the group of operation which leads the crystal invariant. The, the space group is consists of a point symmetry operation or the point group plus translation. So based on this idea, we'll try to, I'll try to describe the classify the seven crystal system based upon this point symmetry operation. I have already described these are the point symmetry operation. This, these are the operations which are in, in, in this line. If I write the number, if I write the number of symmetry operation which is described in this point group, all these cases one bar symmetry operation will be there. If one bar symmetry operation will be there, if that symmetry operation will act on this unit cell, there will be central symmetric. So piezoelectric, so the piezoelectric ferroelectric property will not be there. Out of this 32, this, these are the 11, this 21 will be central or will be non-central symmetric, but out of this non-central symmetric, these are the group. This group will show in this ferroelectric property. Those point groups are 1, 2M, 2MM, 3, 3MM, 3M, 4, 4MM, 6MM. These are the only point groups that those are showing this ferroelectric property. This is the group subgroup relationship. Group subgroup relationship means whenever we have a group, the group can be described by means of an order. The order of a group means how many numbers of symmetry operations are there to describe this point group. So this is 4 by m, 3 by m, this is m3 by m point group. This m3 by m point group belongs to the point group of barium type net in high temperature uh, cubic phase. In this phase, the number of symmetry operations are 48. Whenever it is coming to the tetragonal point group 4 mm, the, in this case the point group operation is 8. And accordingly, whenever it is come to the orthorhombic system, the point group operation is mm2. Then after that, it will come into uh, the rhomboidal system finally. These are the group subgroup relationship. Most of the cases, whenever there is a phase transition occurring, the high temperature phase must be a super group of a low temperature phase or otherwise, the low temperature phase must be a subgroup of high temperature phase. Whenever we are describing this phase transition, the high temperature phase in case of barium type net or, or means the, or possess the symmetry operation or possess the group of 48, but at the same time the point group of 4 mm, which is showing this point group of uh, group order of H. So how many numbers of this is six time change in this symmetry operation? That's how the six time change in the symmetry operation give rise to the ferroelectric properties that also I will try to show you. So this is the hierarchy of symmetry. The hierarchy of symmetry means how the seven crystal system can be derived from the cubic. So I am defining, let us say I have a cubic crystal system. A, B, A equal to B equal to C, alpha, beta, gamma equal to 90 degree. Let us take I have a cubic, I drag it along the C diagonal, C axis, so that A, B, and C, A, B, A equal to B, and C is not changing, that will give me tetragonal. And if I drag it along B axis, then what will happen? A is not equal to B not equal C, I will get orthorhombic. Then if I change the lattice parameter, A is not equal to B, C, not equal to B not equal to C, alpha and gamma is equal to 90 degrees and not equal to beta, that corresponds to monoclinic, and finally I get the And what is the relation between cubic and rhomboheda? I have to be able drag it along this body diagonal in such a way that a, B, A, B, A will be equal to B equal to C, but alpha, beta, gamma will be equal, but not equal to 90 degree. Then cubic will be transformed into rhomboidal. So 
So whenever the transition will be some time occur, QBIC can be directly go to rhomboidal. Rhomboidal can be di directly go to monoclinic crystal system. And another crystal system is called hexagonal crystal system. The hexagonal and rhomboidal crystal system, if you, if you, if you know a transformation matrix, a three plus three matrix, directly you can change from rhomboidal crystal structure to hexagonal crystal structure. So whenever we are describing the seven crystal systems, we have to describe according to symmetry. So cubic is the highest symmetric state. If cubic is the highest symmetric state means and the order of this point group will be highest number of symmetry operation will be necessary to describe this cube. Triclinic is the lowest symmetry point group or the lowest symmetry crystal system. In this means in this case we need very less number of symmetry operation to describe this crystal system. So accordingly the symmetry changing, how the symmetry is changing, accordingly the crystal structure is changing. If the crystal structure is changing, that is should be reflected in terms of change in the ferroviaries properties. In case of barium tightness, the high temperature phase is a cubic step. If I decrease the temperature, it will go to tetragonal, tetragonal again it will go to orthorhombic. These are the sequence of the text transfer. Always that has been maintained whenever you are going from uh, high temperature phase to low temperature phase in case of ferroviaries phase transfer. So this is the seven crystal system I have described. Now I will go a little bit about the Landau theory of phase transition. Before going to the Landau theory of phase transition, let me define what do you mean by a phase. A given assembly of atoms or molecules that may be homogeneous or non-homogeneous. The homogeneous part of this assembly is called the phase. Whenever there will be a phase, that phase can be described by thermodynamical quantities. The thermodynamical quantities can be volume, pressure, temperature, and energy. Whenever there will be a phase, if the phase will be stable, the if free energy should be minimum. If the free energy is not minimum, sometimes what will happen? There will be two types of minima. One is local minima, another is the global minima. If the local minima, if the if the phase is in local minima and uh, which is different from this global minima, then there will be an energy barrier exist. If the energy barrier exists, that is called a metastable state. If energy barrier does not exist, this means the state is unstable. By Changing some of the thermodynamical conditions, the unstable state will go to a stable state. Whenever there will be a phase transition occurring, the free energy changes smoothly or continuously. Based on although the free energy changes smoothly or continuously, but some of the thermodynamical variables they changes continuously or discontinuously. Based upon the changing of the thermodynamical variable changes continuously or discontinuously, the phase transition uh, can be classified. Whenever the other condition will be unstable, it will, it will be under by a phase transition to another phase. Sometimes what will happen? If we give some external condition, the external stimuli can be temperature, pressure, electric field, magnetic field. Then one state, one state will go to one, uh, one thermodynamical stable state can be go to another stable state, then the phase transition occurs. Whenever there will be a phase transition occur, at least there will be a discontinuous change in one of these properties. During this phase transition, the free energy of the system changes continuously, but there will be some thermodynamical parameters so just like entropy, volume, heat of capacity that changing discontinuously. Based upon this idea, the phase transition can be classified into two groups. One is first order phase transition, then the second one is second order phase transition. In case of first order phase transition, at least one of this first order derivative of this fixed energy will be changes discontinuously. If at least one of this uh, one of this parameter, one of this parameter means first order derivative of this fixed parameter parameter will change this discontinuously, that will be first order phase transition. Let us say I am writing this fixed energy is equal to F is equal to P into V. F is my Helmholtz potential, P V is pressure volume. And I am taking some magnetic contribution, but most of the cases magnetic contribution can be neglect, ne neglected. So F is this uh, Helmholtz potential. So Helmholtz potential is equal to E into Ts. E is equal to internal energy. T is equal to temperature. F is equal to entropy. So E will be equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy. So this energy can be written as E internal energy plus Pb minus Ts. I am taking the derivative. If I take the derivative and if I take uh, dg is equal to de plus pdb plus bdp minus tds minus sdg. Since dq is equal to de plus pdb is equal to minus tds, if I take this value, dg will be can be represented d into, d into dt minus s into dt. So if I take the derivative delta g by delta t, it will be d, delta g by delta t, it will be minus s. 
So the first order derivative of this gives energy is value and the entropy. If there will be a third condition, if the parameter we measure volume and the entropy, this is if the, if the parameter volume and entropy is changed continuously during this phase transition, this phase transition is called the first order phase transition because there is a first order derivative of this Gibbs energy. So the first order derivative of this Gibbs energy, energy, if they are changing this continuously, then that is called a first order phase transition. Now let us check the double derivative of this one, second order derivative. If I take the second order derivative of this prop from, from the previous equation, I will get V minus beta. And if I take the derivative delta g square by delta p into delta t, I will get this one. And if I take the double derivative, I will get this one. So what is beta? Beta, beta is my compressibility. Alpha is my volume thermal expansion. Cp is my specific heat or heat capacity. The second order derivative is a heat capacity. So during the second order phase transition, at least the second order derivative will be changing discontinuously. For the, if there is a discontinuous change in the heat capacity or thermal expansivity, or compressibility of a material during this phase transition, then that is called a second order phase transition. So in general sense, if the energy will changing for the first time uh, during this phase transition, then that is called the third order phase transition. But however, third order or higher order phase transition does not exist. So based upon this, uh, the derivative of which order parameter, derivative of Gibbs P energy function it's changing discontinuously, which other derivative of this Gibbs free energy function is there, it means changing continuously or discontinuously, we can describe the first phase transfer. If the first order derivative of this Gibbs free energy function changing discontinuously, then that is first order phase transition. If the second order derivative of this Gibbs free energy function is changing discontinuously, then that is the second order phase transition. Okay, this phase transition, one of what, whatever the first order, second order phase transition, that phase transition is mainly given on the thermal argument and the macroscopic matter variable. But in this case, during the interaction between the individual constituents and the how the crystal structure is changing, that didn't account what the phase transition we have discussed, the first order or the second order phase transition. Again, to describe the first order, second order phase transition, let us describe how the Gibbs energy function is changing. In case of the first order phase transition, this is the this energy function below the phase transition and above the phase transition. G1 and G2. G1 is the Gibbs energy for one of the states. G2 is the Gibbs energy for another state. G1 and G2. G2, which Gibbs energy G1? Uh, in this case, that is the, in the lower energy state. This is the stable state. G2 is the unstable state. Whenever there will be a fast order phase transition taking place, the intersection between G1 and G2 will be taking place. And at the, the intersection will be taking place at the phase transition temperature. Okay, in this case, the more stable state is the state which is at the lower state. Why is in why in, then in case of this first order phase transition, and what is changing discontinuously? Because in, in case of first order phase transition, the curve, the first order derivative of this curve should change discontinuously. All of you know the first order derivative of a curve means that is the slope. In this case of first order phase transition, around the phase transition, the slope of this curve that changes discontinuously. If the slope of this curve changes discontinuously, that is corresponds to a first order phase transition. And all of you know the first order derivative of entropy that is changing, changing discontinuously. So in case of first order phase transition, the uh, Gibbs free energy curve, uh, the first order derivative of this Gibbs free energy curve, this means the uh, slope of this curve changing discontinuously, that's why this is, this is called a first order phase transfer. But for the second order phase transfer, if I define the Gibbs free energy curve, this thing, this, this Gibbs free energy curve, this is the below above this phase transfer temperature, this is the G2 state. Without doing anything, if I computer this graph or if I extrapolate this graph, the extrapolation graph will be this one. But actually the graph will be G1, this is the lowest energy state, and this is the lowest energy state above this phase transfer temperature, this is the lowest energy state below this phase transition temperature. In this case, G2, this G2 curve represents the hypothetical curve above this phase, below this phase transition temperature. In this case, G1 ends uh, around the phase transition temperature, which is more with G2. But what is the second order derivative? If you take as the curve, the second order derivative of the curve is called the curvature. But if you check, if you check the curvature of this line, the curvature of this line is changing discontinuously 
around this phase transition temperature. That's why in case of second order phase transition, the curvature of this V free energy curve changes discontinuously across this phase transition temperature. That's why this is called a second order phase transition temperature. And accordingly, the entropy changes continuously, but the second order derivative of this free energy specifically changes discontinuously. That's why it is called a second order phase transition. So, in this way, we can classify the first order and the second order phase transition. Then the thermodynamic of phase transition, there are some other phase transition phenomena. Those phase transitions are called the lambda transition. In case of this lambda phase transition, most of the cases people are defining that is a second order phase transition, but it is not a second order phase transition, it is an order degree of phase transition. So another way to describe this phase transition are called the reconstructive phase transition and the displacing phase transition and the order disorder phase transition. In case of reconstructive phase transition, what is happening now? Chemical bonds are bonds so are broken and joined together, and in this case, the atom are moving considerably. They are moving with respect to each other, and the motion of these atoms are the subdivisive motion. In that way, the movement of this atom is taking sub, uh, of the order of time 10 to the minus 9 seconds. If the transition, if this type of behavior is observed the in the transition, that transition is called the reconstructive phase transition. Secondly, the oral disorder phase tension, actually the oral disorder phase tension people are usually used, but usually still in the disorder state, some oralness is maintained. So that's why few people is now telling, instead of telling this oral disorder phase tension, they are telling oral disorder phase tension. One of these examples of oral disorder phase tension is sodium NaNO2. In this case, below the phase tension temperature in the ferroelectric phase, the atoms, the Na and Fe, these triangles, are, they have been arranged regularly. But below this phase transition temperature, this Na atom will be equal probability along this B axis at both the sides. That's why below this phase transition, above this phase transition temperature, they have been disorderly arranged. Another example is called the beta brass, copper zinc. A, let us take A is equal to copper, Z is equal to zinc. Below the phase transition temperature, they have been regularly arranged. But above this phase transition temperature, they have been randomly added in the body center cubic lattice. Another example of this border digital phase tension or border digital phase tension is potassium dihydrogen phosphate and TGS. Other way, in crystallographically, how can we describe this phase tension? Let us take we are taking the example of a copper zinc. Copper zinc. In below, below this phase tension temperature, meaning in the other state, each of this atom is not shared by on the other of this atom. Or in, in, in case of a unit cell, crystallographically, each point can be represented by units of a Vico position. The Vico position should describe the fractional coordinates of a unit cell. In case of oral state, each of these atom is not shared by any of these uh, Vico positions. But in case of these other state, each point will be shared by both the copper and zinc positions. So whenever crystallographically we can de describe the order these other phase transition as when in this case the atoms are statically stat statistically occupied the same crystallographic uh, Vico positions in the digital state, but in the other state they are occupying their original positions. So in this way also we can de describe this order digital phase transition. The third phase transition is called the displacive phase transition. In the case of displacive phase transition, the atom will be shifted from its equilibrium positions. The shifting should be very, very small, small with respect to nuclear distance. In this case, the, the atoms will be very, very small. The time taken will be something 10 to power minus 11 to 10 to power minus 15 seconds. If you take this one, this will be related to, uh, this can be correlated to optical phonons. That's why this is the soft phonon mode is better describe the uh, displacive phase transitions. In case of a displacive phase transition, the crystal structure changes. The how the crystal structure changes, the high temperature phase is a high symmetric phase and the low temperature phase is a low symmetric phase. This is the example of a displacive phase tension in the barium titanate in the equilibrium state. All these atoms are the, at the equilibrium state. And below this phase tension temperature, both the barium, barium, oxygen, and titanium, they are shifted a little bit. After shifting, the ferroelectric property is being developed. That's why this is the phase tension. One of these materials is called a structure. In the case of ABOC structure, A atoms are sitting at this corner. The atoms are uh, sitting at its uh, body centers and oxygen at the uh, phase center. But there is two ways to represent. One cases we are represent the A atom will be at this half 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 position. Other cases we can represent the A atom at the zero zero position. There will be two different choice of origin. 
So in case of this, in, in case of pair stress structure, if the phase transition is being taking place, the phase transition are the mainly three types. One is the cation displacement. The best example is barium titanate. In this case, the cations are displaced from this equilibrium position by decreasing the temperature towards the below phase, below the phase transition temperature. Another phase transition temperature is below six octahedral. The, the octahedral instead of the cation move, the octahedral tilt. The third type of phase transition is called the distortion. The BO6 octahedral distorted. The example is case you work. These are the mainly phase transition in the ferroelectric material. These are the three type of phase transition that three type of phase transition that giving the transition from a ferroelectric state to a paraelectric state. This is the example of the octahedral. The letter step without tilting, this is the octahedral. After tilting, what will happen? The octahedral letter step one will be shifted this way. Another will be shifted this way. So what will happen due to this one? The symmetry is being maintained. With respect to by doubling of this unit cell. If this, there will be doubling of this unit cell, this corresponds to the appearance of super lattice reflection in X ray diffraction pattern. So, one of the best example is in case of barium tightness, the phase transfer transfer to orthonomic, orthonomic order, cubic phase structure is PM3 barium. In the tetragonal, the atom will be the polarization will be developed along C direction. In the orthodromic, the polarization will be developed along 1, 1, 0 direction. In the rhombohedral, the polarization will be developed along 1, 1, 1 direction. The cubic head, the point group is PM3 by M. Now, if I decrease the temperature from the PM3 by M to M, it will go to the P4 mm. In this case, the polarization will be developed along with C direction. Then it will go to the AMM2, the polarization will be developed along 1, 1, 0 direction. Finally, the polarization will be developed along this body diagonal along 1, 1, 1 direction. This is the example of the diagonal. Actually, in phase transition, what is actually happening? I am writing this is the uh, y co positions. In the y co position, we see these are the five symmetry 1A, 1, 1A, 1B, 3C. This 3C is the oxygen is sitting at the 3C position, uh, half, 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 zero, half. During this phase transition, whenever transition from P M3 bar to M to P4 mm taking place, what is happening? This three, three is there is three symmetrical equivalent position for the oxygen. This will be splitted into 1B and 2C. So what is happening during this phase transition? The wake of splitting of this orbit is taking place. Whenever the wake of splitting of this orbit will be taking place, that leads to the reduction in the symmetry. So if that is returns to the, if that is changing to the reduction of the symmetry, that corresponds to the phase transition. Whenever there will be a phase transition from let us say cubic M3 bar M for barium tightness to P4 mm taking place, this phase transition from P M3 bar M2 is not a direct one because P M3 bar M, P4 mm, they don't, do not obey the normal subgroup conditions. That's why another P4 by mm by condition is there. Whenever there will be a phase transition, the phase transition always people are describing in this case the titanium ion is moving for the barium tightness. But actually, that is not the clear story. The story is Whenever there will be a phase transition taking place, the mode is changing. The vibrational mode in case of lattice, which is a collective and polyelectric vibrational motion of all these atoms. In this case, if there will be a phase transition is taking place, not only the titanium ion will be moving, what will happen? The barium, the barium and oxygen and titanium, all these atoms, they are correlately moving during this phase transition whenever we are going from high symmetric phase to a low symmetric phase. Uh, based upon this one, what we did, we have tried to calculate actually how much is barium moving. These are the barium ion, this is moving along this direction. The titanium ion is moving along this direction. In case of tetragonal barium titan, there are two types of oxygen. One oxygen is called the basal oxygen, these are the base along this three direction. Other type of oxygen is called the facial oxygen. All these atoms, they are moving this way. If I combine this one, actually, all these atoms are moving, but the more, more prominently the titanium ion is moving with respect to both the oxygen. That's why that, that, that change in the titanium and the oxygen movement is clearly visible to us, uh, us and that gives rise to the phase transition. This is one of my master students did this work. And this is the phase transition. Uh, okay. Whenever the landing theory phase transition is taking place, let us take we have an initial structure G, high temperature phase. Whenever we are going to a low temperature phase F, high temperature structure is the group, let us take high temperature phase structure is group G, low temperature structure is F, G and F must be obey the group subgroup relationship. Along that one, a distortion will be taking place. If the, if the distortion will be small, that will lead to phase transition. This is the fundamental theory of landing theory phase transition.
most of the cases, whenever we describe the phase transition, we describe the phase transition in terms of this order parameter because the lambda transition could not be explained by how much the how the derivative of this least free energy is changing with respect to some of the thermodynamical variables. That's why people are trying to explain the phase transition based upon this first order or second order phase transition, how this order parameter is changing with respect to order temperature. If the order parameter is changing discontinuously, that corresponds to first order phase transition. If the order parameter is changing continuously, that corresponds to a second order phase transition. Based on this one, we will now di discuss within five minutes the Landau theory of phase transition. In the Landau theory of phase transition, which is given by Landau, this is mainly based upon the symmetry consideration. Let us take, I am calculating, this is the, this, this case is the, this dotted line corresponds to the energy uh, electron density, uh, charge density or the electron density with respect to uh, how the uh, variation of R. This dotted line is maintaining the periodicity up to A. Whenever we are going from T is equal to greater than T C, or sorry, T is less than T C, this there is a doubling of this unit cell is taking place. So what is happening? During this phase transition, low temperature phase, showing the low symmetry and high temperature phase, showing the low high symmetry phase. So in case of second order phase transition, the high temperature phase, uh, the low temperature phase must be a subgroup of this high temperature phase, which means that low symmetry phase is always a subgroup of high symmetry phase. This is the first criteria for the Landau theory of phase transition. What is the meaning of symmetry breaking? Let me explain. Let us take I am taking a cube or a sphere. Along this body diagram, if I rotate, if I if, if, if I want to rotate, by rotating any amount of angle, I will get the symmetrical equivalent position. To describe the total number of symmetry operation here, I want n number of symmetry operations, infinite number of symmetry operations. But in this case, if I want to rotate, what I'll do? By rotating only 90 degree, I will get the get the symmetrical equivalent position. Here, how much there will be only four symmetry operations, but in this case, there will be infinite number of symmetry operations. Whenever there is a transition, we are changing from a cube to a, so we are changing from a sphere to a cube. The symmetry, infinite number of symmetry is converted into the whole number of symmetry. This is the meaning of symmetry breaking. Whenever this cube will be changed to a parallel pipette, in this case, by rotating how much? Rotating 180 degrees only, I will get the symmetrical equivalent position. In this way, the symmetry changing is being taking place whenever there is a fetch transition is taking place. So the, uh, as the requirement of this phase transition for the Landau theory is the symmetry group of the low temperature phase must be a subgroup of high temperature phase. Whenever the phase transition temperature, the, uh, the phase transition temperature is close, the, uh, the temperature is close to the phase transition temperature, the order parameter is very, very small. If the order parameter is very, very small, that can be expanded in power series expansion, G, 0 TP, B, first order square term, Q term, Fourth term and sixth term. But whenever, whenever uh, based upon this uh, calculations, what we can do? If my gives free energy is the function of this order parameter, the gives free energy must be same whatever if the order parameter changes direction or if, if the order parameter changing its time. If the order parameter changing its time, if the gives free energy is, change, is not changing, this means that. Whenever the even power, even order, even order means uh, the order of one, the even power of n, this means one term, q term, and fifth term, that must be equal to zero. If that, if we neglect this term, finally we will get this, h transition, we will get this equation. Okay, these are the equations. Okay. After taking this equation, one the Landau, Landau thought that a into pt is equal to q square, a is the form parameter which is depends upon the temperature that can be dependent on a p minus t g which is which which is g which is greater than zero for t is greater than t c less than zero for t less than t c after this i can write down this term my gives free energy function if i know this gives free energy function this term corresponds to the low high temperature paraelectric phase this term corresponds to the low temperature uh, low symmetry ferroelectric phase and now if I know this gives free energy, then easily I can calculate all these thermodynamical variables. Now what are the thermodynamical variables? Then after this, if my condition is satisfied, then what I have to do? If my if for the stability of this phase, what I have to do? I have to take the first order derivative must be equal to zero, the second order derivative must be greater than equal to zero. If I check this condition, after checking this one, what I will get? I will get the Q square equal to minus A by twice of C, T minus T C. If I do this one and if I plot a graph, if I plot a graph between Q and T, Q is my order parameter, what I can see? I can see that 
the order parameter is changing the order parameter is changing continuously with respect to this temperature similarly if i know this order if i know this value of g i can also calculate the entropy it has been seen that the calculation of entropy will be this much the entropy is changing entropy is equal to s0 if t will be greater than tc entropy is equal to s minus s square by twice c plus c if t is less than tc if i decrease the temperature what will happen this is the entropy of this system will be decreases continuously this is satisfying if the entropy of the system is decreases continuously means with decreasing the temperature the state is become more order state so by calculating this entropy we got the heat is that the low temperature phase is the order order phase and the high temperature phase is a disorder state in the case of phase transition then also we can calculate the specific heat specific heat is equal to cp is equal to t into delta s by delta t if i calculate i will get this equation if i plot the graph between if if i plot i i'll get this equation if i plot the graph between cp and t what will happen the cp and t will be changing will be will be increases with increasing temperature of cp c and after that it will become cp if it will become zero the slope of this graph will be a square by 12 so so in yes dr dilip uh, uh, is out last last I'll, five minutes oh uh, maximum two three minutes i'll take madam okay okay sir okay okay continue okay. Okay. Then if this will be my specific heat, the specific heat is changing discontinuously around the second order phase transition. Similarly, another parameter that parameter is called the equation of state. What equation of state? It relates the order parameters to its conjugative field. In the case of ferroelectric material, the order parameter is polarization, and its conjugative field is E. See if if we apply the electric field, and if we if we want to measure how this polarization, how how this order parameter is changing, that can be represented. by means of this equation of state e let us take my equation of state by the application of electric field g prime is equal to g minus q into psi psi is my conjugate field the conjugate field in case of ferroelectric material is equal to e so g is equal to g minus qe if i do the if if i do the uh, partial derivative and minimize this equation and uh, to equal to zero what i get i get that q is equal to this value when our t is equal to tc this means that by the application of electric field the phase transition temperature tells that even if above this phase transition temperature there will be some value of polarization let us get into that picture without application of electric field the polarization is held varying continuously but whenever i am applying this electric field the polarization even if the my transition temperature t is equal to tc the polarization is not equal to zero so because of this presence of this conjugate field the polarization or the order parameter is not equal to g not equal to zero at t is equal to tc and above tc so after this the susceptibility can also be calculated the susceptibility q by y is equal to sorry q by psi q is the order parameter order parameter by electric field in this case it will be i get this value after getting this value if i draw this graph the susceptibility the susceptibility will take this behavior so sorry so this is the susceptibility what will i get i will get that the susceptibility will be diverge uh around the phase transition temperature but if i plot the one by susceptibility versus temperature i will get this straight line curve most of the cases the phase of susceptibility is changing the inverse of such susceptibility is changing this way finally for the phase transition let us take g is equal to by this value i got this one i get the two solution two solution is this one i already know if q is equal to 0 above t is equal to tc if i put this equation and if i want to plot this graph let us take q is equal to 0 above t is equal to tc and if i want to plot the gives gives free energy curve with respect to this polarization axis how the solution will be look like if i plot if 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 this is my g is equal to g0 a into t minus tc q square into cq if t my if t is greater than tc this term will be positive this term will be positive so how this g will vary with respect to q the g will be vary with respect to the q square term will be dominating because q is very close to g, close to t is equal to c q is very small so the term will be vary q square plus q to the power 4 the behavior will be a parabolic behavior whenever t will be around tc close to tc there will be some thickness will be there whenever t will be less than tc this term will be negative this term will be dominating 
up to a certain value of q and above that q, value of q this term will dominate if i plot if i plot the graph p is less than tc by this equation the parame this term will give me the inverse parabola and this term will give me q to the power fourth term if i plot the graph the graph will be look like this so in case of ferroelectric state even if the ferroelectric value the in case even if the polarization value q the order parameter value q is equal to 0 for that case there will be two stable state of polarization. This two stable state of polarization corresponds to two of its two of its solutions. So in case of this in case of this gift energy function, we are getting a double well potential because whenever T will be less than Tc, at there this term will be varying just like a just like a inverse parabola function. If this term will be varying just like a parabolic function, so we are getting this type of behavior. So this is the for the second order phase tension, the uh, the polarization is changing discontinuously. The specific sorry, the susceptibility diverge discontinuous diverge at t is equal to tc, and this is the behavior how the polar how the order parameter how the Gibbs free energy and the order parameters are changing. Now another the first order phase tension. If I add the q to the power six term, these are the Gibbs free energy curve you can get. This student can take this as a homework to do this one. Similarly, whatever I did, people can do that one. Or if you take a, if you add a Q term, this also you can get this one. This is the example of a water and ice phase tension. In case of water and ice phase tension, what is happening? If the phase tension is, T is very, very greater than Tc. Means above this, above this very, very higher temperature than 0 degree Kelvin. It has only water state. Whenever T will be very, very less than Tc, it has only uh, ice state. But in between some temperature will be there, in that some temperature both, both ice and water will be there. So the existence of co to two phases is one of the signature of this first order phase transition that can be explained by adding a Q3, Q3 term. So based on this one, I have explained the second order phase transition, the first order phase transition, whether you are adding a Q to the per six term or Q to the per Q term, this order this can be explained. But most of the cases, whatever I told, I am taking this reference from these are the two groups. This group for solid state science scientist by Mike Glazer and the symmetry relationship between crystal structure by Ulrik Muller. And some of this data I have taken from the Bilbao crystallographic server. And then these are the reference people can follow. But uh, men is uh, you always before starting any experiment, at least you should understand a little bit of crystallography and how that crystallography is related to structural size science in case of ferroelectric materials. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ravi, wonderful. And you start from very basic. So it's a very interesting lecture. Now there is a, yes. one uh, query related to this. This is asked by Praveen Kadhane. Yes. He, he asks, is there uh, any aspect of ionic or dipole polarization for phase transition in case of BAT IO3? Uh, can you repeat the question? Is there any aspect of ionic or dipole polarization for phase transition in case of BAT IO3? In case of barium titanate, mainly dipole polarization yeah. contributed to the phase transition. Ionic, he is asking whether ionic... Ionic contribution, ionic, uh, ionic contribution, the temperature variation of ionic contribution, I think the, it is very, uh, if I remember correctly, the variation is not uh, so significant. The ionic, uh, ionic polarization, the ionic variation of ionic polarization with respect to temperature. So most of the cases in ferroelectric phase transition temperature, the dipolar polarization is giving the phase transition. Okay. Okay, maybe uh, the Pravin Khandani is get satisfied. So second question is that, can you tell us about glazier notation? Okay, glazier notation. Uh, actually, I have only one slide. If anybody wants, then I can give them the slide. Actually, the glazers. Actually, this, uh, these are the slides. I, similarly, I am taking some some of these glazers uh, presentations. I also took his permission. 
Let us take this is my BO6 octahedral. This BO6 octahedral can be represented this way. In case of octahedral tilting, what will happen? Let us take one octahedral is moving this way with respect to this. If I compare this octahedral is moving this way and this octahedral is moving this way. So what is happening? If I take this is my B axis and this is my A axis. So uh, in case of this one, due to this tilt of this octahedral, now here I am by changing the lattice parameter this value I am getting the periodicity. But here by changing this distance I am not able to get the periodicity. I am only able to get the periodicity by changing this one. So this case due to the octahedral tilting, most of the cases there is a doubling of the unit cell taking place. So what is happening? In, to get the periodic conditions, along A direction I multiply it to, along B direction I multiply it to, but along the C direction C. So if this condition will be there, that can be represented as A0, A0, C. These are the uh, notations. This, these are the, there are 12 type of notation. They are that is given by Clutter. That notation uh, mainly related to how the octahedral tilting uh, give rise to structural pattern. Best suggestion would be 1973 and 74. He published two papers, and after that, uh, two three people published three four papers. If you read that one, that will be more clear because it itself is a the glazier notation itself is a lecture of half an hour. So I didn't prepare for that one exactly. But but that but that is mainly related to uh, uh, tilting of this octahedral, which gives rise to structural pattern. Okay. Uh, is, is a Pravin, Pravin say you want to say something? Pravin, can I, I, I yeah. make you un unmute? You can directly ask. Yeah. yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, hello. Can I uh, audible? Ah, yes. Yes. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, Proceed. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, for such a wonderful lecture. Uh, I just have one query about. Uh, this ionic and bipolar polarization because it uh, in uh, structural phase transition uh, if you see the polarization is strictly diminishes after the Curie temperature and uh, before that we are uh, saying that it is uh, some sort of space polarization or ionic polarization or dipole polarization so my question is that what exactly happens for the uh, this polarization uh, during the uh, structural transition during the structural phase transition, mainly the polarization, polarization in this case, the dipolar polarization that is changing with this temperature. Probably I forgot uh, the, 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 the ionic polarization, the, the, the change of this ionic polarization with respect to temperature, that uh, equation I forgot. But uh, this equation tells that it will be for the second order phase transition, it will be changing continuously. But uh, okay. for the ionic polarization, if I remember correctly, that is uh, just like the variation of this atom that, sorry, ionic polarization with respect to temperature that is very, very small. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, Dr. Dilip, uh, the yes. Shanti Ranjan uh, say that uh, you should uh, switch on your video. Please keep okay. your video on. So throughout lectures, you have to keep your video off. It's okay because sometimes the connectivity problem is there, but now just in the last session, we want to see you. Actually, I found yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Now, sometimes when we on the video, no, then it gets a little bit problem in processing. But now you can make the video <laughs> Okay. Hello, Dilip. Hello, Dilip. Yes, sir. For tutorial, you have been an excellent. Talk, I must congratulate you. An excellent talk. Uh, I, 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 I understand you done well. If the students watch this slide, I can share them also. I don't have any problems. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, we have actually make video. Every for every uh, session, yeah, we have make video. So that, that, that is, uh, yeah, yeah. I can, I can share. But really, please, you have. Yeah, you have taken every aspect about phase transition. Really, very oh, interesting. Yeah, and yeah, start ha. from basic. It's really, really important. Actually, the Landau theory, I, could, I, I have uh, moved a little bit fast. Otherwise, if you give another half an hour to the student, 
they can work out all these problems. So this, this, these are the things that uh, Professor Chaudhuri, Professor S.M. Behera and one of my collaborators from Bilbao, uh, Professor Moit, they taught me this uh, group theory, test and some of these, 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 uh, this aspect I'm mainly working. Yeah, 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 it's really very basic and it's really required in tutorial session actually. Right, right, <laughs> the, right. the beginners can understand this theory. <laughs> Thank you, Dilip. Thank you very much, Dr. Dilip. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dilip. That's Kiran here. Thank you very much for the nice uh, information. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Dilip, I think you recognize. It's really yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Students yeah. are doing uh, experiment, but they must yes. understand that how these things are uh, happening. Yes. So thanks a lot for a wonderful yes. talk. Actually, I suggest that books, that books, whatever I am suggesting, uh, this book, uh, at least every should go through this one because this is the book, these are the two books, uh, this is really very helpful to all of these people. Because they have uh, they have described this space group for holistic scientists, they have described the point of space group by taking 200, 200, the why 7 crystal system, why 14 graphic lattices, why 32 point groups, why 230 space group, he means uh, uh, he, 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 he very accurate. Actually, I met him twice. He also suggested right. me to read, to read that book. Dilip, hey, above, above all, so teaching fast. is required. Above all, teaching is required. Understand. <laughs> and guru is required too. <laughs> I am sir, I'm trying group to theory. understand I'm... this group, group theory. Okay. okay. Uh, sir, uh, sir, we stop here and already yeah. we are getting late for by five minutes. At least we take so a five minute interruption and we join right. and, uh, at 425. The, uh, Dr. Oh, RMP okay. also you joined that, that session because it is a felicitation session. Okay. Okay. This, just I take a small break and then we will continue. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay.
Hello, are we all back again? <laughs> Dr. Srinivasu? Dr. Srinivasu? Yes, Dr. Srinivasan, have you hi? I'm here. Have you huh, have you joined here? Huh? Yeah. Yes, I'm fine. Uh, sir, one minute, one minute. Okay. Because our earlier session is little bit delayed, so get delayed yeah. uh, due to that we take the small interval. Small five minute interval. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you should also provide. Hello, sir. Online, you should provide online coffee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes. I'm yes. offering you online. Yes, Hello, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Could you recognize me? Yes, yes, it's Professor, Professor Kamal Swain, yes, speak Yes, yes, yes. Whenever yes. I see you, I remember my man Singh Ah, sure. <laughs> you are with coming to Nagpur. You are coming to Nagpur? Sure. No, no, I'm saying we really missed coming to Nagpur for this project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you have come in 1994, I suppose. Yes, long ago. Yeah. So, Professor K. Srinivas, we start yes. uh, se yes. uh, the session. Uh, this yes. is the third session. And I just introduced the Dr. K. Srinivas. He is the chairperson of this session. Okay. Dr. K. Srinivas <coughs> he was a professor, Department of Physics and Astrophysics, University Delhi. His research interest includes condensed matter physics, experimental, gas sensing mechanism, dielectrics, ferroelectrics, and piezoelectric properties in ceramic composite single crystal and sputtered film, magnetron sputtering, surface acoustic wave devices, ferroelectric memories, acoustic electron, electric and magnetoelectric effect, UV light detector and light up conversion effect. Sir is the recipient of several awards and honors. Government of India's National Merit Scholarship in 1972, UGC nominee for Center for Advanced Study at University of Badman. Uh, West Bengal and Indian School of Mines, Dhanbad. 27 best uh, speaker, best team prizes in English debating at college university level during the year 1970 to the 80. Annual Canadian uh, Ceramographic Computation Award in 1987 and 1989. Sir is the director of University Science Instrumentation Center, University of Delhi. He had been Dean International Relations, Science and Technology, University of Delhi from 2008 to 2017. Scientist and Engineer at Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, in 1996. Visiting Scientist at Royal Institute of Technology, uh, KTH, Scotland, during uh, 1993 to 95. Group Leader in Swiss Fed Institute of Technology, EPFL, Luazen, Switzerland. Manager, Postdoctoral Fellow, Queen University, Kingston, uh, Kingston, Canada, during the year 1985-89. He has guided around 27 PhD scholars. Sir has authored several books and monograms. He has more than 150 research publications in index peer review journal and 75 conferences presentation. Sir is a member of Laser and Spectroscopic Society of India and Electron Microscope Society of India. He has completed about 15 major research projects sponsored by DRO, DST, UGC, DOE, MI, and RMIT from 1997 to 2015. Sir is actively involved in various international national research activities. So I kindly request uh, Sir to take the ch uh, charge of this session. Dr. K. Srinivasu, please take the charge of this session. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. This session we have to, uh, I hope I'm audible to everyone. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. We clearly uh, hear you. Okay, fine. That's good. So, our first speaker is uh, 
Professor Kamal Singh, and uh, she would be uh, talking about yes. the history of dialect. Oh, ah. Sorry, sorry, Sita ji. On the screen, your Ashok Kumar video is coming. You have to remove it. Ah. Past, present, and future. Ashok Hello. Kumar. Hello, Dr. Sita Chai. या या यस सर 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 यस यस सर यस सर Nagpur University, and she is also uh, has been the Vice Chancellor of Amravati. Dr. Kamal Singh, she has various distinguished positions in Nagpur and Amravati University. She has been Chairman of Board of Studies in Civic, Director of UCUC and RTMU. She has been the Professor and Head of the Department of Civic. At both RTMU and about. She has a long teaching experience of 31 years, administrative experience of 31 years, and research experience of only four decades. She has published more than 173 papers and in various journals of national and international and also issued several papers. Madam has guided about 30 PhD students, authored several books, and organized a number of conferences. She has implicated various academic and administrative reforms. She has completed several research projects sponsored by the CSIR and CSIR. Her areas of interest include solid electrolytes, solid state batteries, centers and actuators, ferroelectric and dielectric, virtual instrumentation. There are abounding awards and achievements to her credit. She is the recipient of the research award under the ninth year plan by University Grants Commission. Takahashi Fellowship has been created in 1997, National Ferroelectric Award Institute by Kandit Ravishankar Shikla University for Outstanding Lifestyle Contribution. She has been a visiting scientist fellowship to ICTP Italy in 1998, and later a post fellowship, and with the Swedish government in 1984, and Hario Ashram Prairie, Dr. K. R. Ramanathan Teaching Aid Award in Physics in Madam is a life member of many professional societies like the Indian Civic Association, Indian Society for Solid State Islands, Indian Science Congress, etc., and has been a member of Asian Society for Solid State Islands, Council of International Society for Scientific Science, several academic and management councils, selection committees, and advisory committees. Madam Deputy of the Institute of International Journals, such as the General Electric Energy Society, Central and Active. And today we will be listening to her and we are very fortunate youngsters we love to hear about the history of dielectric and paralytic research. We welcome Professor Kamal Singh for her tutorial lecture. Madam, please. Hello? Hello? Sir, yes, uh, she, is, uh, she is starting the... Uh... Okay, okay, yeah, I was worried. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, everything is going fine. No, 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 sir, one minute, she is going to... Okay. हाँ तो अभी अने इनको पीपी के दिखाना शेयर शेयर हो गया पार्टिसिपेट किया ना
नहीं नहीं पैनलिस्ट को एंड नहीं कर सकते हम नहीं हो सकता क्या एक मिनट तो लॉग इन कहा से करेंगे कहा से करेंगे मतलब कहा से जाना पड़ेगा अभी इसमें मेरे इसमें दिखा सकते ना नहीं तो मैडम चाहिए नो प्रॉब्लम है ना क्यों डर लॉग इन अभी जाते ये करते है ना मैडम को मेरे इसमें दिखा तो वो बहुत शेयर द स्क्रीन अजीत का बयान सुनिए करूं मेरे इसमें या यू मेरी पार्टिसिपेंट हाँ ना प्रेजेंटर जब अनलेस एन अंटिल आई बिकम प्रेजेंटर आई कांट हाँ क्यों नहीं प्रेजेंटर क्यों नहीं शेयर क्यों नहीं हो रही है वो कर रही ना मैं बॉल जा ही नहीं रहा हाँ हाँ ओके करो फिर मैं यहाँ से ट्राई कर रही थी ओके मेरा दिल का अच्छा वाला फोटो नहीं था नहीं तुम्हारे इसका कर दो नहीं तो मैंने देखा हाँ इतने भी अटेंड करा ना ऑनलाइन बढ़िया मेरे ईमेल पे भी भेजा है ना सेकेंड वाला लेना डेस्कटॉप पे लोड कर दीजिए स्लाइड शो है ना हाँ जी हाँ स्लाइड यस यस ओके हैप्पी न्यू ईयर टू माई चेयरमैन एंड फ्रेंड सीनियर प्रोफेसर एक्चुअली ओके ओके आई थॉट आप शेयरिंग आई थॉट ऑन फेरोलेक्ट्रिक आई एम शेयरिंग माई थॉट ऑन फेरोलेक्ट्रिक मटीरियल एज अ टीचर एंड एज अ रिसर्चर एज यू नो दैट आई वर्क ऑन लिथियम न्यूबेट विच वॉज वेरी क्लोज टू योर प्रोफेसर अब हेमान सिंह ऑल्सो लाइक सुबह ऑफर ऊपर जाना है चलो तो एक्चुअली बिकॉज इट इज ए फेरोलेक्ट्रिक एंड डायलेक्ट्रिक 
our family and uh, for youngsters those who are working in the ferroelectric ferroelectric field has grown to skies now and it is now being used very well specifically the perovskite materials which i will be following in my slides in medical field which has become the need of the hour of these materials to be developed processed and properties the youngsters can do the processing characterization properties and then the applications the applications part of in india specifically cannot be much done at the state level universities however iits can be can be approached or the central universities also or your center at ugc center research center can be approached for trying for application and unfortunately even if the university produces good materials of ferroelectrics or solid electrolyzed or battery material or sensor material or actuators but there is no middleman or no path is available or no bridge is available for us to take that thing which is developed in the laboratories of the state level universities because i have spent my life in the state level university to the industry as it usually happens in usa or uk i am very glad that uh, before i joined here today the dilip ha uh, dilip pradhan dr dilip pradhan who was talking on phase transitions so the landau theory as he did gave too many of details for the student i have earnest request to my young fellows that understand each thing like landau theory of phase transitions then your dielectric series don't forget to refer johnster's book and then in ferroelectrics all theories which are dipole theory and then for phase transitions the other theory but the dipole theory was first given to understand how really dipole or the polarization exist so i am starting with that the analogy of electricity was drawn long back from ferromagnetic so a ferroelectric uh, material is like a ferromagnetic material except that ferromagnetic material has magnetic moments which get polarized whereas in ferroelectric material an electric polarization gets like in the direction of the polarized direction because ferroelectricity can be controlled by external electric field ferroelectric materials can be used in tunable capacitor also hysteresis occurs in ferroelectric material as i said as in bh curve we see the magnetic hysteresis likewise in polar electric polarization and electric field we see the hysteresis and these materials because of that can be used in random access memory for computers and rfid cards so who named it actually we say joseph falsek discovered it in the cell salt way back in now it is 100 years so in 1923 20 sorry 21 but he was not a researcher he was undergraduate student and his, his professor asked him to develop a unit for recording the vibrations during the earthquake and doing so he got the rock salt and then he went further with it and the salt was discovered but when beaver was seen by erwin shodin he thought 
that it should exist and coin the term federativity. Although he did not use in Schrodinger's term. And so federativity is an odd term for the effect because prefix ferro means iron. As I said, ferromagnetic. And in ferroelectric, uh, ferro there is no iron content. What are these materials ferroelectric materials are related to? Ferroelectric materials are pyroelectric. Not all pyroelectric materials are ferroelectric. And pyroelectric materials are piezoelectric. So it can be said that piezoelectric material are pyroelectric. If it is not piezoelectric, then it is not pyroelectric. And if it is not pyroelectric, then it cannot be ferroelectric. So Pierre and Ellie Signet in the Rochelle salt first made Rochelle salt around 1665. And for this reason, it was proposed to rename ferroelectricity to Signet electricity. But Electricity sounded easy and attractive, much better. So since then, it is used as a relative. This actually peculiar phenomena, known as ferroelectricity, has been first discovered in Rochelle salt 100 years ago. Nomenclature ferroelectricity has been consequence of phenomenological similarity with ferromagnetism. However, quite surprisingly, Microscopic origin of this phenomena has been altogether different. In out of 32 classes, crystal classes found to be polar, exhibit both piezoelectricity as well as pyroelectricity. These crystal classes are represented by the notation by the mirror planes. So if you go deeper in the crystallography, which I am not dealing here. That is M, MM2, 4, 4MM, 3, 3MM, 3M, 6, and 6MM. Polar crystal have the property that is possessing a spontaneous polarization. If we look at ferroelectricity and antiferroelectricity, like exactly like ferromagnetism and antiferromagnetism. So it is having ferroelectricity having all polar parallel dipoles and anti-parallel means it is 180 out of phase. What are the special features? Dielectric hysteresis is the most special feature. And today in the morning I mentioned that we only look at the dielectric properties. Professor Ajit Kulkarni and myself we are really thinking of having this unit fabricated, but later after the decade or so, I was informed that Ajit Kulkarni has procured it from some U.S. company. But one of my students, Mrs. Dani, who was working on antiferroelectric lead zirconet, we fabricated it. And why I'm stressing upon, because the students, they want that everything should be available to them. And nobody, exceptions are always there. But the students don't bother about really to really think of and go to the Mullard first circuit. And S.C. Abraham at the Bell Laboratory has appreciated our work and he has quoted also our references. And me and him were quite some time in contact with the this our and tower circuit. One of my students was an electronic engineer, Lima. He made it, and we could really test what is required what is here. What has happened? Huh. And what is here required? Why I'm saying because I want the student to take these things to work with hand. I listen. I forget. I see. I. Remember, but when I do with hand, I don't forget. This is what I always tell to my students. So, power and tower circuit could be fabricated if you have very high current transformer um, um, wound 
from any industry of transformers. And then the tunable capacitor, that is jank condenser, which used to be used in the radios to change the band. It is very essential because in parallel to your sample capacitor, you need a variable capacitor to match it. So only these two fundamental things, if you are properly looked at, the student can construct those things in the laboratory. Why I say? Because ferromagnetic hysteresis can be easily seen, whereas is matching in parallel variable capacitor makes ferroelectric hysteresis units or entire unit little bit difficult. So ferroelectric crystal are subgroup of pyroelectrics and pyroelectric crystals with reversible polarization. This is reminding me of Professor Abhay Man Singh because when in 1994 we organized a workshop, three days workshop, followed by the ferroelectric seminar, Professor Man Singh has demonstrated, he brought his group of students and who has this pyroelectric reversible polarization unit and which was shown to students how to make and how to perform and how to test their crystals. And polar structure of a ferroelectric crystal has a slightly distorted non-polar because it gives rise to reversibility with the reversing electric field. So, if sorry, it exhibit dielectric hysteresis below PC when it is in the ferroelectric phase. When it is in a paraelectric phase, it disappears. Exhibit high dielectric constant along the polar axis where all dipoles are aligned in the in this direction. There is a difference between the optics axis and the polar axis. Simply, if you are working with the crystal, then you have to identify properly that which is your optic axis, what is your polar direction, whether it is A axis, B axis, C axis. About TC, epsilon R is the relative permittivity, false obeying Curie-Wiesler, law. And given by this equation, which is given here, epsilon R is equal to C upon T minus T0. T0 is extended if you take the epsilon R with 1 by T on Y axis and temperature on the uh, X axis is the epsilon R. I don't have that figure here. But then you can extrapolate and you can find the T0. And it uh, possesses a pseudosymmetric structure. About TC forms structure of higher symmetry and TC can be raised by the application of the field or the hydro hydrostatic pressure. A sudden appearance of surface charges at the transition temperature reaches, then we get this surface charge development. Most technologically important ferroelectric materials are perovskite structure materials. And perovskite is there, the geology name is perovskite structure, ABO3. So at high temperature, we get ABO3 structure. And it is retained as a pseudo cell derived from the ideal cubic structure, E21, by small distortion, either of cell edge or interaxial angle. As shown here in the figure, the Perovskite structure, A is oxygen at the corner of the tube, and oxygen octahedra at the center, and B is the responsible ion in displacing phase transition, which displaces from its 0, 0, 0 position to the C direction. It can be A direction, B direction, or C direction. If it is a C direction with the polarized, polarized axis, then it um, displaces and there the symmetry changes and it changes from, say, it gives rise to the displacive phase transition. And structure lays emphasis on common crystal type 
and do not carry any chemical implications. Tilt of oxygen hydra, uh, oxygen octahedra gives polarization. I am referring here Professor Michael Glazer, who was the examiner of my one of my students who worked on displacive phase transition, and he has suggested that the oxygen octahedra tilt, because there is still not a unified theory found, which will be given. Empirical relations are there. We have work on the empirical equations, and no theory is existing exactly to tell us that what really causes the low transition or high transition. I was working with Professor Subbarao on high, hard ferroelectrics giving why they give high transition, high phase transition. And that work was actually based on S. C. Abraham's work where he has suggested that delta Z, that is atomic displacement, proportional to T minus Tc square. But when this relation was examined, the power did not give the square term, but it came 1.66. And that is due to the phonon-phonon interaction. So the tilt of oxygen octahedra is specifically those who are working in displacive phase transition has to be tried by, and for that, Michael Glazer's space and a space group based, um, that uh, book can be referred. We have referred it. Ideally, perverse kite structure has two principal bonds. Generally, what we do when we measure the properties, we do not, we go to the bulk, but we do not go to the basic chemistry of it. And why it is so? Because now the new application, molecular ferroelectric has come in, where molar molecule or molar chemistry is important. And they are discussing it is not properly understood. So that is also a good challenge for my young friends who are attending the conference. So I'm talking about that AO, that is corner atom, and oxygen, that is ionic character, and BO, that is body-centered atom, and the oxygen at the corner gives covalent character. And in unit cell, if you get X is along, OB, along the z-axis, then we get OBO bonds, and then for A plus upon A double plus lies at corner of a squares of cubic structure in XY plane. Expedient to emphasize the role of large size A ions because what happens when you increase the temperature? Dr. Taudri has worked with Kakran and Kakran has given the this lattice vibrations contribution, very good theory he has suggested and very good book he has. Huh he has on the phase transitions. And there also it is being said that corner atoms do not much contribute in the displacement being the big in size. So there is a considerable overlap of charge cloud of A ions with oxygen that gives the deformation of the central B and charge cloud. BO bond in perovskite is affected by the P bond sharing of charge cloud between A and O. Wave functions for molecular orbital for by a mixture of atomic orbital involved in molecular parameter due to polar covalent bonds. Bond strength depends on the interatomic distances and energy difference del E between the sets of cation and anionic orbitals. BO3, as I said that AO is partially covalent, BO is partially ionic. So degree of covalence between AO and BO bonds such that states of directed covalent bond and non-directed ionic bond are energetically close. And thermal motion of ions may be sufficient to disturb directionality of any bond. And so they are interconvertible, convertible, with the temperature. 
nuclei ions get located at the center of oxygen octahedra when BO bond distance is equal to provide equal degree of covalence to all six oxygen bonds in octahedra. So cubic structure of ABO3 is in paraelectric phase is above transition temperature that is Tc. A small changes here I would like to refer to that not all material really gives you um, this disappearance at Tc like lithium nubet which has a 1210 Tc and 1249 as a melting point. So a small change in covalence of any one of the six bio bonds causes distortion in oxygen octahedra which is accompanied with the phase transition. And degree of covalence between AO and ionic bond in late detonant are exactly for these factors are highly polarizable. Polarizability of lead is equally important because it really get polarized as the Ti and enhances covalency of TiO. And even though materials have the same B ions, because in barium titanate and lead titanate, you don't get the contribution of BA polarizability to the phase transition, but in lead titanate one gets because of the movement of the lead in the same direction as the uh, central body atoms. And therefore, total bound covalence in lead titanate is greater than that in barium titanate. And so the temperature range of existence of aerolytic phase transition is greater in lead titanate than the barium titanate. It is almost double. So similarly, the barium titanate and potassium neobate are having many properties same, specifically the domain structure is exactly the replica of each other. And so whereas BAO and KO are approximately same, whereas NB and TI is better than TIO. And that is the result is in total bound covalent. So temperature range existence of ferroelectric phase transition in TN3 is greater than that of barium titanate. Now, for these ferroelectric material, as I said, they are very smart materials, and the smart materials are non-living that integrate the function systems like sensing, actuation, logic, and uh, computer application to respond to changes in their conditions or environment to which they are exposed in a useful or repetitive manner like ceramic shape memory alloys, optical fiber and conducting conductive polymers. Smart sensors like eye where we need composites, electronics brain where we need ceramics, logic design we need ceramic with polyester, uh, polymer crystals. Actuators are electromechanical, electrostrictive. So during delivery, insulin, adjustable wing aircraft, collision avoidance, smart highway, artificial muscles, self-repairing bridges in the building. And these are very simple. In the, this is because it is in the session of uh, the students. No? So I'm referring to this because ferroelectric popular ceramic sensor and transducers, a student can, in our country, can make themselves. Like, like the NTC thermistor and PTC, ferroelectric materials, they show PTC, positive temperature coefficient. And where transition metals were doped in the barium titanate, we showed. And this work was done by uh, TRDDC, where Prasad was working with Professor Subbarao. They have given the, the night heaters we used to use, they used to use barium titanate pellets. And chemical gas humidity, then mechanical piezoelectric PZT ceramic, 
reinforced with optical fibers, electrical resistor phosphorus, optical magnetic memories. The most important this is the MEMS. Now we are using MEMS technology in our car things. So it automatically opens, it closes, and that is the MEMS technology, which is micro electromechanical system MEMS is a integrated system which has mechanical element, sensor, actuator, and electronics. On common silicon SI substrate through microfabrication technology. Why means integrated circuit on the ICs can be designed, brain of the system and means augment decision making capability with eyes and all microsystem to allow sensing and control of the environment, remote environment monitoring control building, then automatic application, dispensing medicine or to patient, manipulation of gene on a routine basis. Neural problem probes, motor, motors for hair, airbag, electric memories, semiconductor type, static random access memory, dynamic random access memory, read only memory ROM, magnetic memories, capacity, read access and write access time, operation and storage time for non volatile memory, especially retention and endurance. Recently, I came across that uh, I think last year I have seen this paper, Ashutosh Kumar Dubey and his team. They have developed perovskite ceramic as a new generation material for orthopedic application. I mentioned here, the Oxford and in England, Queen Mary College, people were working on the mixing of ferroelectric ceramics with the alumina ceramics, and they were making uh, safe uh, paste for uh, joints. When we break our bones, so they used to use that. Here they put rod and put the bandage and all that, but they were putting those compositions which were very much close to the bone composition, that is calcium phosphate with the 4H2 uptight, they say. And that was put with the, these ferroelectric powders uh, made by in England people. And they were diffusing into each other faster and helping in joining the bones. So this team is with BHUIT, Material Science, and ISC Bangalore. So look ahead now, molecular ferroelectric, where electronics meet biology. And now the corona has made us to think more about the medical applications because the biomedical application of signal processing and image processing is already open and it is opening a good field with the basics because the concept of molecular ferroelectric is still not very understood. I was trying to, at least I did not follow yet. I'm going through. It is a single molecule chemistry is the top, which I'm, because I'm not chemist, I could not follow. But I want that our students have to focus in new areas, and instead of doing routine type of work, they should come out of it and let our professors and supervisors make them think freely so that they can come up with the devices. So, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for introductory talk. Now, I this. So, Dr. Srinivasu, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Sushan is joined. So, we welcome Dr. Sushan and Dr. Srinivasu. Hello, Srinivas. hello, yes. Dr. Srinivas. Yes, hello. Welcome, uh, yes. welcome Sushan. Welcome, yes. Sushan, ma'am. Uh -huh. Just okay. uh, we introduce uh, you introduce the uh, Dr. Sushan and we yes, start yes. her presentation. Sure, I will. Uh, first of all, uh, we thank Professor Kamal Singh for this informative lecture, which much uh, excited the students who are out of the field, things that are happening internationally and 
Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate. I will be speaking today, uh, as I was asked to, on the fundamentals of ferroelectric materials. And hopefully you can see that. Uh, because this is a talk on fundamentals, 
It's always most useful if you feel free to ask questions as we move through. So the, the point of this is to hopefully provide information. And um, if I can provide any clarification as we go forward, that would be uh, particularly delightful. So uh, as, as you heard, my name is Susan Trollier mckinstry I'm from the Material Science and Engineering Department at the Pennsylvania State University. The, I, you've heard several talks at this point on the fundamentals of ferroelectric, so I thought the, the piece that I would focus on would really be on the crystal structures of some of the important piezoelectric and ferroelectric systems. I'll say a few words about domain structures and the link between the domain structures and domain wall mobility on the functional properties, including the low and high field dielectric and piezoelectric responses. So as you have already seen in uh, talks in this conference, all ferroelectric materials are polar. By definition, a ferroelectric material is one where we have a spontaneous polarization that can be reoriented between crystallographically defined states by, the, uh, by an applied electric field, which is low enough in magnitude that the material doesn't blow up which means fundamentally we need to have a polar crystal, a material where we have a net polarization. And of course, because the net polarization is typically defined by the crystallography, and crystallography varies somewhat as a function of temperature, nearly all polar materials have finite pyroelectric coefficients, such that there is a change in polarization in response to a change in temperature where the constant of proportionality is the pyroelectric response. And there is, of course, a strong link between the polarization and the symmetry of the material. So I want to remind you of stereographic projections for various point groups. So this is a series of point group symmetries. And as you recall from your classes, if I imagine having a sphere of material and I put a point on that sphere, I will operate on that point with the symmetry in the material. And because it's hard to draw in three dimensions the sphere, we're going to show that point on the equatorial plane of the sphere by taking that point, connecting it to the opposite pole, and wherever that appears, wherever that line intersects the equatorial plane is where we're going to put that point. So if I imagine having point group two over M and I take a point in the northern hemisphere, which I show as a dot, then if I have my twofold rotation axis, that's equivalent to saying I have now a twofold rotation axis oriented vertically. I'll take this point rotate 180 degrees and that point should reappear. And so this point in the Northern Hemisphere is symmetry related to this point in the Northern Hemisphere. This slash denotes the fact that the next mirror plane is perpendicular to that twofold rotation axis and hence it is in the plane of the stereographic projection itself. So here is my sphere, there was my twofold axis. Here is the perpendicular mirror plane. We now have these two points in the northern hemisphere, symmetry related to two points in the southern hemisphere. And if I imagine drawing a vector from the center of that stereographic projection to each of those points, I now have two vectors pointed up and two vectors pointed down. And if I look at the projection of those vectors along orthogonal X, Y, and Z axes, then it's quite clear that all of the components of that vector is symmetry related to one pointed in the opposite direction. A vector that's related to its own negative will, of course, be zero. And so any material that has symmetry of 2 over m, in fact, has an inversion center, so every dipole is canceled by its equal and opposite, such a material will be nonpolar, and there will be no piezoelectricity or pyroelectricity.
If I go now to point group 222, two, two, that's three orthogonal twofold rotation axes. Now let's start by taking this point in an arbitrary location and operating on that with a twofold rotation that's coming out of the plane of the page. That symmetry relates that point to that point. And now we need to be able to have a twofold rotation axis that's in the plane of the stereographic projection. That would be the equivalent of taking this point in the northern hemisphere, operating on it with a twofold rotation axis that's pointed straight towards you. That will take this twofold or this point and symmetry relate it to one in the southern hemisphere. And when I do that for all of the points, and again, look, can I have a net vector? It's apparent that it's impossible for any material in point group 222 to have a net spontaneous polarization. So such materials can be neither pyroelectric nor ferroelectric. But with an appropriate shear stress, I can generate uh, polarization. And so such a material, although not pyro or ferroelectric, is potentially piezoelectric. When the symmetry drops still further, simply to a two-fold rotation axis, well now, quite clearly, both of those points are in the northern hemisphere. And I will have a net polarization, which is parallel to that two-fold rotation axis. Such a material will be pyroelectric. All pyroelectrics are also piezoelectric. And such a material is potentially ferroelectric if I can reverse the polarization. Likewise, if I simply had a mirror plane, we have points that are in the northern hemisphere. Both are pointed towards the bottom of the stereographic projection. Now I can have a net polarization, which is parallel to the mirror plane. And I could have components along both the <clears throat> y-axis here, as well as the z-axis, the axis that's oriented as plane. So it's possible to look simply at the point group symmetry and make reasonable estimations as to whether or not a material can be pyroelectric or piezoelectric. And these provide guides as to whether material is possibly ferroelectric. So let's look at that for a few specific examples. Let's consider the case of zinc oxide. In zinc oxide, we have zinc atoms in tetrahedral arrangement with oxygens. And you'll notice that all of those are oriented in the same direction in a single crystal. So I've drawn it as though we have one up-pointing neighbor and three neighbors that are at angles uh, down below the zinc. There are none which are flipped in this orientation. And so in this material, the absolute position of the zinc is not fixed by crystallography. So that can actually move up and down within the tetrahedra. And as a function of temperature, that's indeed what happens. And because if I look at one of those tetrahedra, the center of positive charge, the location of the zinc atom, and the center of the negative charge, the averaged position of the oxygen atoms, are not at exactly the same position. Because the center of positive charge and center of negative charge are not at located at the same point in space, such a material is, pi, uh, is polar. And because the absolute position can change as a function of temperature, the material will also be pyroelectric. And so you can actually estimate the polarization based on the Z parameter for that zinc atom. And you can estimate the pyroelectric coefficient as a function of temperature based on the fact that that Z position varies. In this case, on the order of 10 to the minus five angstroms per Kelvin, so the changes are subtle, but they are finite. And that accounts for about two thirds of the total pyroelectric coefficient of zinc oxide. If we now consider ferroelectricity, a ferroelectric material must have such a polar moment, and I must be able to reorient that polar moment between 
crystallographically allowed direction as a function of an applied electric field. And that can occur via two main structural mechanisms. The first is what we will call an order disorder ferroelectric, in which you can identify local polar moments at many temperatures, and those Polar moments go from being randomly arranged at elevated temperatures to an ordered configuration at lower temperatures in an order disorder ferroelectric. And I've shown you three examples of that here, potassium dihydrogen phosphate, uh, which was the first known ferroelectric material. And in KDP, we have our phosphate tetrahedra, which you see here, which are linked to other phosphate tetrahedra via hydrogen bonds. And at, as a function of temperature, these hydrogen bonds will go from either disordered, such that the hydrogen could occupy either this position or this position, to an ordered one in which they, they're all arranged in the same configuration. And when those hydrogen bonds order, there are associated positions, shifts in the position of the potassium atom that introduces a net polarization. This is perhaps easier to see in the case of sodium uh, nitrite. And in sodium nitrite, we have, uh, in sodium nitrate, excuse me, we have NO2 groups. The NO2 forms a bent molecule where the Sodium atom, excuse me, the, the nitrogen atom and the oxygen atoms form a molecule which is bent like this. And in that molecule itself, the nitrogen acts as the positive charge and the location that's spatially averaged between the oxygen acts as the center of negative charge. We now have a dipole moment pointed, excuse me, from the center of negative charge towards the center of positive charge. Apologize for that. Um, and at elevated temperatures, those two positions for the nitrate group are equally possible. And so we will have randomized locations for those nitrate or uh, nitrate groups at elevated temperatures. When I have equal numbers of this and this, that means I have equal numbers of polarization pointed to the left or pointed towards the right. And the net result is that I get no net polarization. Now I can see at elevated temperatures a local polarization associated with those molecules, but it's randomized. In fact, when I drop below the Curie temperature, I will favor an oriented motion of the or orientation of those molecules with the net result that I go from a disordered to an ordered phase from no polarization to finite polarization. So that would be perhaps the easiest to visualize of the order disorder ferroelectrics. We can also have displacive phase transformations in ferroelectrics, and I wanted to just walk you through some examples of that here. So this is a, a slightly exaggerated um, set of displacements for barium titanate. So what I've done is to take the actual crystallography of the system, and I've multiplied the displacements by five to make them easier to see, and then I volume conserved. So this is the perovskite unit cell where the barium atoms are shown as the large green atoms on the corners of the unit cell. The oxygens are the blue atoms that are shown close to the face centers of the unit cell. And the titanium is the small red atom shown at the center of the unit cell. And now if we go back and look at that phase transformation sequence again, it will be apparent that at elevated temperatures above the Curie temperature, the titanium atom is at the center of the unit cell. If I look at that single case where the titanium atom is at the center of the unit cell, the center of positive charge, which is the spatially averaged position of the, of the cations, is at the center of the unit cell. 
the spatially averaged position of the negative ions is at the center of the unit cell, no polarization. But this material develops a polarization when the titanium displaces from the center of the unit cell, the oxygens also displace a finite amount. And now the center of positive charge is geometrically at a different location than the center of negative charge in the system. The material has developed a, a polarization in response to that. And as you can see, the entire unit cell distorts such that there is a spontaneous strain associated with that spontaneous polarization. And that really helps explain many of the important functional properties of ferroelectric materials. So if I look at the possible displacement directions for that atom that was at the center of the unit cell, if that atom displaces parallel to one of the original cube axes, that gives us a tetragonal distortion where the unit cell elongates parallel to the polarization direction, it contracts laterally. And that atom that was at the center of the unit cell has moved close to one of the adjacent oxygens. It was octahedrally coordinated, thus there were six possible or oxygens it could have displaced towards. So it, I've shown it oriented in the up direction here, but it was equally possible for that titanium atom to have displaced down towards the oxygen below it, forward, back, left, or right. Because all of those were equally possible, I have six possible polarization directions oriented parallel to what was one of the original pseudocube 100 directions. In a rhombohedrally distorted material, this atom displaces towards one of the corners of the cube. There were eight corners on the cube, hence there were eight possible polarization directions oriented parallel to one of the 111 directions of the original cube. In the orthorhombic version, this atom displaces parallel to one of the face diagonals of a cube. There are 12 face diagonals of the cube. Those correspond to displacements along the 110 family of directions. And that gives us 12 possible polarization directions. The monoclinic phases in the perovskites corresponds to intermediates between those three uh, distortion directions. So the MC phase would be intermediate between the tetragonal and the orthorhombic, the MA phase between the rhombohedral and the tetragonal, and the MB phase between the orthorhombic and the rhombohedral. And it's important to note that those displacements, in addition to allowing ferroelectricity, also induce spontaneous strain in the material. So I show here the lattice parameters as a function of temperature for barium titanate. Beyond about 130 degrees C, the material is cubic, and so we have only a single lattice parameter. Below the ferroelectric phase transformation, we go first to a tetragonal phase where the material elongates parallel to the polarization directions. It contracts orthogonal to them. That produces the spontaneous strain in the material. Notice that if you take the cube root of the volume, you get this line here. And the cube root of the volume in the perovskite ferroelectric phases in general, exceeds the extrapolation of the volume that I would have had from the cubic phase. So the ferroelectric phase is larger in volume than the paraelectric phase extrapolation. The same is true in the orthorhombic phase, where we have three lattice parameters. In the rhombohedral phase, the volume is roughly equivalent to the volume that we would have had had we extrapolated that paraelectric phase. And so we go through in barium titanate a phase transformation sequence as a function of temperature from cubic to tetragonal to orthorhombic to rhombohedral. 
any time I poise the material on the brink of a structural instability, the susceptibilities become quite large. And that's manifested in several ways. I show here the relative permittivity as a function of temperature, and you can see that we have maxima in the relative permittivity when we poise the material on the brink of any of these structural instabilities, and that produces peaks in the relative permittivity. So before I move on, I'd like to ask, are there any questions on that? Because it's really one of the fundamental points we're gonna come back and address as we move through the rest of the presentation. So are there any questions on that? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to assume that I'm understood. So thank you for your good understanding. <clears throat> The property anomalies appear not just in the dielectric response, they also appear in the piezoelectric coefficients. I show here data from Satoshi Wada, where you can see as I poise the material near the brink of the structural instabilities, I get maxima in the piezoelectric coefficients as well. <coughs> when I take a material such as barium titanate and I apply a large signal, dielectric or large signal electric field, not the small signal field that I use to measure the, the dielectric response. I will find that I can reorient that polarization between crystallographically aligned directions. And that introduces the polarization electric field hysteresis loop, where when the polarization is aligned in the up direction, I can when I remove the electric field, I'll have a finite tendency to remain aligned in the up direction, inducing a remnant polarization in the up direction. I, in fact, have to apply a reverse electric field such that I have equivalent numbers of up and down domains in order to reach the negative coercive field of the solid, continuing applying the negative electric field I will continue to reorient the polarization as well as I can with respect to that field. Please, please note that in many ferroelectric materials, it is challenging to rotate the polarization off the crystallographically defined direction. It's a distinction from many magnet magnetic systems where that rotation is comparatively less energetically costly. And one of the consequences of that is that I very often in ceramic materials or in thin films, I can't achieve the full spontaneous polarization at zero electric field. I can only do that with an appropriately oriented single crystal. And so that's just an important thing to note that I will often end up with residual domain structure at the remnant polarization state. So I walk through this hysteresis loop, but I don't necessarily end up single domain anywhere on this hysteresis loop. Associated with that polarization hysteresis is also a strain hysteresis, where I reorient that spontaneous strain as I go through the ferroelectric hysteresis loop. You will notice that a strain loop looks a little bit like the top chunk of that polarization loop. And I'm now going to simply flip the negative part up to have this negative strain loop. As I mentioned, it's often quite challenging to create materials which are single domain. And so I will have in many ferroelectric materials domain walls which are the areas in space where I move from one domain, one polarization orientation to another domain. So if that domain structure will again be governed by crystallography. So I show here a tetragonal perovskite and in this tetragonal perovskite, this polarization can be oriented in any of six equivalent directions. If I have two polarization directions and two volumes of material which are anti-parallel to each other, then I will name that domain wall 
based on the angle made between those polarization directions. And so a 180 degree domain wall, those domains are 180 degrees different in polarization direction. In a 90 degree domain wall, I might have, for example, a volume that was pulled in the down direction, a volume that was pulled in the <clears throat> in, towards the right, and that boundary between those corresponds to a 90 degree domain wall. In a rhombohedral system, if you look at the crystallography, again, this central atom is displacing towards one of the corners of the cube in a material like barium titanate or lead zirconate titanate. And that allows me to have 71, 109, or 180 degree domain walls. Crystallographically, the walls, and I've shown them somewhat simplified here, I've shown them as though they really occur within essentially a one unit cell uh, change. And in practice, they can be somewhat wider than that. But you can see a 180 degree domain wall here, where over on this side, all the titaniums are displaced in the up direction. Over here, they're all displaced in the down direction. Here, I have a 90 degree domain wall where I have polarization up and polarization to the right in, this, in that system. And if I look then at any single crystal in a ceramic, any grain in a ceramic, or I look at a single crystal, all those domains are likely to be present. And so you see here a single grain in a ceramic and all these lines that you see here corresponds to different domains where I have different orientations for that spontaneous polarization. I think you've seen some of the rest of this, so I'm going to skip through those next slides and just continue on with the crystallography. Uh, for barium titanate, there are some important consequences for that. So I show here the phase transition temperatures as a function of pressure in barium titanate. Recall that we said that the volume of the ferroelectric phases exceeded the volume of the paraelectric phases. And that means that if I apply a hydrostatic pressure, I will favor the low volume phase, which means that the cubic phase becomes favorable under pressure. Now, the details here are very important. It will matter if I am applying a hydrostatic pressure or if I'm applying a uniaxial or a biaxial stress, I can change the relative stabilities of the materials um, depending on what type of stress I apply. In many of the ferro, many, not all, in many of the ferroelectric perovskites, if I look at the Octahedra associated with the B site cation, for example, the, tit the titanate octahedra. The crystal structure um, showing those octahedra is shown here. And in many of the ferroelectric materials, the angle made from the B site ion to the oxygen to the next B site ion is 180 degrees. It is critical to note, and you heard this in the last talk, that sometimes those octahedra tilt with respect to each other. We often use glazer notation to describe those tilt angles. And as a rule of thumb, okay, so not always true, but often true, tilt is incompatible with ferroelectricity. If the material chooses to tilt, it will often choose not to distort the octahedra to produce a net polarization. So if, for example, that B site ion stays right at the center of the octahedra and the octahedral tilt angle changes, the material still has no net polarization. And in fact, I, I need some coupling of distortions in order to achieve net ferroelectricity in that case. So the most common phase transformations in the perovskites, if you look at the very broad family of perovskites that are known, tilt transitions are more common than ferroelectric phase transformations. 
So that's what I was going to say about the crystallography of the perovskites, but that's going to guide us in terms of understanding ferroelectricity in many other systems. I look here at the bismuth layer structure ferroelectrics, and in the bismuth layer structure ferroelectrics, we can see these uh, some some layers which have octahedral arrangements of atoms that look very much like slabs of perovskite. And we can have different numbers of octahedra in those slabs. So here you see, as for strontium bismuth tantalate, two octahedra high before we hit an interruption of a bismuth oxide layer. In bismuth titanate, here you can see we have three ox or oxygen octahedra before we hit the interruption associated with the, um, uh, the bismuth oxide. Uh, layer. If you look at the symmetry of the materials, the vast majority of the polarization in these bismuth layer structure ferroelectrics will develop in the plane of the ferroelectric. So relatively little of it and sometimes none of it is oriented perpendicular to the layers. The symmetry of these crystal structures says that when you have two octahedra or indeed any bismuth layer structure with an even number of octahedra in a layer, when that occurs, all of the polarization will occur within the layer. There's no symmetry allowed component perpendicular to the layers. When you have an odd number of octahedra, the majority of the polarization still orients parallel to the layer, but there will be a small toggle component. You can see the anisotropy uh, here. It's 50 microcoulombs per centimeter square in the layer and about four perpendicular to the layers. And it's really important because it is hard in many ferroelectrics to rotate the polarization off the preferred direction, I now need to be really thoughtful about what my orientation of the grains is or orientation of the domains is with respect to the electrodes to know whether or not I can observe ferroelectricity. Another beautiful crystal structure, which also is ferroelectric, is the lithium niobate crystal structure. You can regard this as being a derivative of the crystal structure of corundum, where we have face shared octahedra. And I've shown those here. Um, you can see that the face sharing occurs between a lithium and a niobium octahedra. The, if I look down the C axis, you can see that in lithium niobate, the octahedra are arranged lithium, niobium, and then there's a vacant octahedra here. Lithium, niobium, vacancy. And that orientation occurs if I go down the C-axis everywhere. It will be lithium niobium vacancy, lithium niobium vacancy. And in such a material, the allowed spontaneous polarization occurs along that C-axis only. There are no allowed orientations for the spontaneous polarization due to symmetry in the A-B plane of that crystal structure which means that the only allowed domain walls are 180 degree domain walls between the up and down polarization directions. To reorient that polarization, you actually need to drive this lithium atom through the three, the opening, the gap between the three oxygens above it and force it into the next octahedra over here. That's a large displacement. It's energetically costly. And because it's energetically costly, it will take large electric fields to drive that phase transformation. Uh, the lithium niobate materials are of considerable interest for optical applications. It's probably the most important electro-optic ferroelectric. A more complex material that's of interest for optical applications and also for pyroelectric applications are the tungsten bronzes. I show here the crystallography of the strontium barium niobate tungsten bronze. 
This is a far more complex crystal structure. You can see it does consist of oxygen octahedra. They are corner shared, as in the perovskites, but the corner sharing is far more complex in the plane. And so instead of having kind of square shaped channels, as you see here as the only possibility, as would be the case for the perovskites, we also have triangular channels and pentagonal channels, as, as you see here. And the net result is that I have far more complex arrangement of the octahedra and <clears throat> in those, it, it, within the layer. The, along the C axis, which is the axis that's coming out of the, the plane towards you, the octahedra stack on top of each other. And in this material as well, the spontaneous polarization is oriented parallel to the C axis. And the material in this case has 180 degree walls only. As you have heard, it is possible to have ferroelectricity not only in inorganic materials, it's also possible to have ferroelectricity in materials that we think of as, as more organic. And the, the case that I'm going to show here is of polyvanilidine fluoride, which is a polymeric ferroelectric material. In many single chain polymers where we have carbon-carbon single bonds, we have, um, it's, it's relatively low energy penalty to twist the chain around one of those carbon-carbon bonds. It's a single bond, there's not much energy barrier for rotation, and a result, as a result, more than one crystal structure is often common, is, is, is easily achieved. And that is the case indeed for polyvanillidine fluoride. The, the paraelectric phase is the alpha phase in which the crystal structure goes from two down carbons to two up to two down to two up. And if you look at the arrangements of the fluorines, which I've shown in white, and the hydrogens, which I've shown in black, you see we have equal numbers of the, the negative fluorines and the positive hydrogens on either side of the chain. And that result is that there is no net polarization in this crystal structure. On phase transformation to the beta phase, however, you will see that all of the positive hydrogens appear on one side of the chain, all of the negative fluorines appear on the other side of the chain, and so each chain has a net polarization. And if you look at the arrangement of the chains in space, the polarization for all of the individual chains in the unit cell line up so that we can have a material that has a net polarization. And if I apply a large enough electric field, because I can twist that chain along the backbone, I can rotate the chain such that I go from the hydrogens in the up position to a case where the hydrogens are now in the down position. Uh, and so PVDF is a perfectly appropriate ferroelectric material. It's much mechanically less soft or more soft than the, the oxides tend to be. And so it turns out to be a better electrical, um, excuse me, a better acoustic impedance match to human tissue. And as a result, the material is, is of interest for um, medical ultrasound applications, uh, and for flexible ferroelectric applications. Antimony sulfoiodide is um, a somewhat unusual inorganic chain ferroelectric in which we have antimonies in a chain arrangement with the sulfur and the iodine and they form chains that go parallel to a single axis in the material, so all the chains line up. This material also is ferroelectric, where the ferroelectricity can appear along the chain axis. For a comparatively long time, that was the majority of the commercially important ferroelectrics had one of the crystal structures that I just showed you. 
But in the last dozen years or so, we've begun to find ferroelectric materials that seem like they will be commercially important in families of materials that we did not we did not normally think of as ferroelectric. And we've done that in a couple of different ways um, by finding uh, crystal structures where we can induce metastable ferroelectric phases or by making materials that we've historically thought of as polar but non-switchable, switchable. And some of the motivation for this actually comes from Professor Helen McGaw. She was a crystallographer who, who did the first good structure refinement of the crystal structure of barium titanate. She wrote the very first textbook in ferroelectricity. And she made it very clear that there's a close relationship between spontaneous polarization and pyroelectricity, as I showed you very early on in the talk. In a ferroelectric material, that spontaneous polarization needs to be reorientable. And only in the case where the pyroelectrics can tolerate the high enough fields to cause switching does the material, in fact, become ferroelectric. And I'll show you here the first good example of a material that we think of as, as kind of a metastable ferroelectric. And these are the ferroelectric materials based on hafnium oxide. The fluorite crystal structure is one you should remember from your crystallography classes. We have the cations on the face-centered positions of a cubic unit cell. And we have the oxygens, they should be, at the quarter, quarter, quarter positions. When they are, in fact, at those quarter, quarter, quarter positions, there's no net polarization. But in the ferroelectric orthorhombic versions of these hafnia-based materials, the oxygens displace from their perfect quarter, quarter, quarter positions up or down. And as they do so, we develop a spontaneous polarization in the up or the down configurations. And this uh, can be stabilized by many factors. Um, among the ones that are important is substrate or interface strain, doping, oxygen non-stoichiometry appears to be favorable to, to get this um, ferroelectric distortion in the case where we're slightly oxygen deficient. Interactions of the electro electrodes, for example, titanium nitride tends to be really useful in stabilizing this phase. And at least in some circumstances, the, uh, the titanium nitride steals some oxygen from the ferroelectric phase and seems to help stabilize ferroelectricity. This is very, very, so first reported in 2011 in silicon doped hafnium oxide. Very interesting because these materials, hafnium, silicon, and many of the zirconium, are considered CMOS compatible. And so we can now imagine making an easy integration of the ferroelectric phase with CMOS circuitry. Uh, we tend to get relatively modest values of the switchable polarization on order um, 5 to about 25 microcoulombs per centimeter square for the typical materials, if I don't grow an epitaxial film. But they show card-carrying ferroelectric polarization electric field hysteresis loops like so. Among the challenge with the hafnium oxide-based ferroelectrics is that those materials as grown are relatively rarely single phase. And so you often have some admixture of tetragonal orthorhombic ferroelectric and the crystallographically stable monoclinic phases, where as a function of grain size, we'll uh, favor different, um, different ones of those polymorphs and we'll have um, then different levels of ferroelectricity. So one of the main research areas in this field is trying to figure out how can I make a material which is 100% orthorhombic ferroelectric material. Another of the things that we're really working hard on is to try to lower these extremely high coercive fields in the material. 
those coercive fields tend towards the one to two megavolt per centimeter range. Those are large enough that we operate the material perilously close to the breakdown strength of the ferroelectric. It would be really nice to be able to take the energy barrier between the two polar states and decrease its magnitude. You see a second example here of a new ferroelectric material. Uh, it was demonstrated for the first time in a beautiful paper from Simon Fickner in 2019, so quite new, that if you take aluminum nitride and you destabilize partially the wurtzite crystal structure with, in this case, scandium, you can achieve a switchable polarization. So recall that we said that in the wurtzite crystal structure, it was possible for this cation to move within the anion tetrahedra. And if I can move that anion close to the base of the tetrahedra, then I can actually take it through a metastable state where it switches from being a tetrahedra that's, that's oriented with its apex down through this intermediate position to one in which the tetrahedra is oriented with its apex up. And when you do that, you develop enormous levels of spontaneous polarization here on order 100 to 150 microcoulombs per centimeter square. Um, and this beautiful paper by, uh, by Fickner demonstrated that you could flip the sign of the piezoelectric coefficients. Um, so they really did a very, very thorough characterization. And again, here, there's some real interest in being able to reduce the magnitude of the switching barrier so that we can switch these materials without blowing them up. And since we're switching through what amounts to an intermediate hexagonal phase, which is the boron nitride crystal structure, um, one of my colleagues, Professor John Paul Maria, said, well, what if we replace scandium with boron? And you find that indeed, when you do that, you have beautiful ferroelectric hysteresis loops, again, unfortunately, with large coercive fields. And so we're working now on trying to reduce those. So and that gives you some idea of the crystallography of some important ferroelectric materials. I wanted to speak next about some of the implications of that crystallography on the functional piezoelectric properties. And you can see that if we show piezoelectric properties as a function of year, there have been a series of step changes in our understanding of ferroelectricity, where we've gone from you know, tiny piezoelectric coefficients in quartz on order of two picometers per volt to barium titanate, which was an enormous change. And now we're, you know, on the order of 70 uh, picometers per volt because the material is ferroelectric, it has a nice polarizable lattice. Lead zirconate titanate with its morphotropic phase boundary gave us a, a beautiful step change. The introduction of relaxer ferroelectricity provided another step change. Composites, where we break up the crystallography to introduce second phases often of polymers were very useful in terms of increasing coupling coefficients. And our current championship piezoelectric materials are based on the relaxed or ferroelectric lead titanate single crystals. So I wanted to walk through the crystallography and some of the important contributions to the properties of those materials. So I show here the phase diagram for lead zirconate titanate, uh, where you can see that on the lead titanate side, we have the tetragonal perovskite crystal structure. On the lead zirconate side, for most of the region, we have a rhombohedral structure. It goes from an untilted to a tilted rhombohedral structure as a function of temperature. Over here on the lead zirconate, very lead zirconate rich side, we have an orthorhombic antiferroelectric phase. Now, recall that I said that in general, when you poise the material on the brink of a structural instability, the susceptibilities go high. And so you can see in terms of the relative permittivity, 
and in terms of the piezoelectric pi uh, properties, I show it here for the piezoelectric coupling coefficient, when I poise the material on the brink of the structural instability at the morphotropic phase boundary, those properties become large. It is critical to recognize that not all phase boundaries are equally useful. I see a depressing number of papers where they say, wow, I got these huge piezoelectric coefficients by poising the material on the brink of a structural instability. But they have chosen an instability where the phase transformation depends on temperature, not composition. That means I can only get a large piezoelectric coefficient near that particular phase transition temperature, which practically is useless. It is critical in lead zirconate titanate that you see that this phase boundary between the rhombohedral and the tetragonal or the monoclinic phases is a very weak function of temperature. It's a strong function of composition which means that over a broad temperature range, I can poise this material at the brink of the structural instability where the properties, the susceptibilities become very high. Lead zirconate titanate is a beautiful piezoelectric, useful over a wide temperature range. And so you can always make a material have higher piezoelectric coefficients. If you drop the phase transformation temperature closer to room temperature, you have to be very careful when you do that, that the material often becomes uh, less temperature stable. And so you can see the lead-based families of materials show, on average, much higher piezoelectric coefficient than any of the lead-free alternatives. And despite you know, 20 years of very aggressive work in this field, that's kind of the state of the situation. To choose a particular ferroelectric for a given piezoelectric application, we need to understand what the figure of merit is for that application. Not all ferroelectric materials are good for all applications. When I want large strain, the piezoelectric coefficient that I need to optimize is the piezoelectric D coefficient. And I wanted to make it clear here that in the perovskites and indeed in some other materials, there are two main contributions to that piezoelectric D coefficient. Recall that we said that when the material developed the spontaneous polarization in the perovskites, the unit cell elongated parallel to the polarization and it contracted laterally. And if I apply an electric field, I will favor a polarization aligned with respect to that electric field, which will make the polar, it'll actually drag the titanium atom further off the center of the unit cell. As we do, do so, the material continues to distort. And that change in the shape of the unit cell with respect to the applied electric field is what we refer to as the intrinsic piezoelectric coefficient. Recall also that in general, the material will have residual domain structure. And I'm showing here exaggerated. Both of these are grossly exaggerated to make it easier to see, but I'm showing here that if I have residual domain structure and I can move domain walls as a function of the applied electric field, I add to the shape change of the individual unit cells a shape change associated with the motion of the domain walls. The key points to recognize here is that although I've shown that, that boundary, that green plane, which is the domain wall, I'm showing it moving smoothly here. The reality is that these are area defects. They're area defects that have to move through defective materials. And any local electric or local elastic field can pin the motion of domain walls. What, uh, those local defects will produce variations in the potential energy as a function of position. When I have very deep potential wells, 
The domain walls tend to move reversibly. That is, I can excite the domain wall position under an electric field, but I'll tend to restore to the bottom of that potential well when the field is removed. When the potential wells are small enough, I can move a domain wall from one well to the next, and that will produce an irreversible contribution to the piezoelectric or the dielectric responses. And in practice, if I look at applications of ferroelectric materials, we use those domain wall contributions to introduce huge fractions of the net dielectric response that's used in capacitors, um, capacitors based on barium titanate. We make over a trillion of these on an annual basis and a huge fraction of the total dielectric response is due to motion of domain walls. For piezoelectric applications, for example, in diesel fuel injectors or in medical ultrasound systems that utilize um, ceramic ferroelectrics, again, up to two-thirds of the net piezoelectric constant is due to motion of domain walls at room temperature. Critical to note, though, is that domain walls will move more the more aggressively you excite them. And I can excite them either with a pressure or with an electric field, but the consequence of that is twofold. First off, it means that all the piezoelectric coefficients are dependent on the stressors that are used to excite them. And with very small stressors, I will get smaller piezoelectric coefficients at small signal. As I apply larger signals, the piezoelectric coefficients will increase in magnitude. They will also tend to, to drop off slightly with frequency because domain wall motion takes some time. The second key consequence is that domain wall motion is always hysteretic which means that my polarization, even in a polled ferroelectric material, measured unipolar parallel to the applied electric field will be hysteritic, and that will introduce hysteresis in the strain response. This ultimately means that as I excite materials in which domain wall motion is important, the materials will self-heat. We often use Rayleigh behavior to quantify the motion of domain walls under comparatively kind of small to medium signal excitations. This shows that the functional dielectric or piezoelectric properties depend on the AC electric field that's used to excite the material. Many, but not all ferroelectric materials will show Rayleigh behavior up to about half of the course of field. Beyond that, we tend to um, be applying electric fields that are large enough to perturb the domain structure itself. We start nucleating new domain walls and the validity, we fall out of the region of, of the Rayleigh behavior. But the Rayleigh behavior correctly describes the amplitude dependence of the piezoelectric coefficient of many piezoelectric ceramics. It correctly describes the hysteresis and the charge response as well. And one of the things that my group has worked on is to try and understand what controls under what conditions domain walls will be mobile. Key point to, to come away from is that anything that produces a local elastic or a local electric field will change the mobility of domain walls by changing the potential energy profile through which the material is moving. And that, in fact, can be mapped spatially using piezo response force microscopy. Any region that I show red on these diagrams of the irreversible to reversible Rayleigh coefficient, those are regions where the domain walls move well. Anything that's shown as blue is region where the domain walls don't move well. And if we grow crystals uh, uh, on bicrystal substrates, we can show that individual grain boundaries, which are the vertical lines here, are great inhibitors of domain wall motion. And the spatial extent 
at which domain walls are influenced by the existence of single grain boundaries are staggeringly large. It's hundreds of nanometers of influence of the existence of, of, of so that the, the basically the domain walls know that the grain boundary exists and it impedes the net motion of the domain walls hundreds of nanometers away from individual grain boundaries. So with that, um, it turns out to have huge implications in terms of the functional properties, but I am largely out of time here. So I would like to, I apologize, fly through kind of the end of this and summarize to say that hopefully I have shown you the crystal structures of some important piezoelectric materials. Um, I've shown you that there are both intrinsic and extrinsic contributions to the piezoelectric and dielectric responses. And I would at that point like to thank you and take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Yes, please ask a question. Uh, yeah. I would I'm sorry, two people are asking simultaneously. What option is it? Professor Chaudhry? Yes. Uh, hello. Matt? Yes. Susan? Yes. This is Ram, Ram Chaudhry. I have wrote to you. Uh, yes. This is my second, second talk I am hearing. First yes. talk I heard, I told you in 2005 at, mm -hmm. at Boston, and second time this time. My yes. 45 years of my research life, starting from Bill Cochran, and till today I'm still working. And I find your talk is excellent, and you have summarized, you have already summarized my whole life in the work, research work, in, <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in an hour or something. I'm really, really uh, extremely happy that you have accepted our invitation and your uh, your talk for our Indian community, our young researcher, the outstanding, outstanding. Thank because you very much we, for that. Why I am commenting because I started my work on crystallography with, with Cochrane and Richard names, and since then uh, I'm working on now various fields, many materials, uh, starting from your hydrogen bonded I work. KDP, ADP, and potassium, uh, thallium, hydrogen, phosphate, and now working on a, all these ceramics compounds, as you perovskite, and various other structural family. And uh, my group, yeah, and all my friends like Smita, Kamal Singh, then Srinivas, and uh, uh, all the, these are very, 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 and I'm getting a lot of things from them. And uh, last thing I can tell you, uh, my relation with Professor uh, S.C. Uh, Abraham, G.S. Samara, which is G.S. Samara, Abraham, and then your Professor, uh, your, your, your uh, friend or colleague, was, unfortunately, I missed all of them. And uh, Professor Cochran, I missed them. But I am really happy to see you here. I wish your very long, long, happy and prosperous life and academic life. I wish, I wish and pray for all your you. happy life and long life. Thank, Thank you, you, madam. Thank you, Susan, for coming and giving us guidance and blessing to our, our young colleagues and young friends and to us. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Hello, Dr. Suya. Uh, some students have yeah. Some students have asked the question. The one yeah. student have asked that uh, double perovskite like uh, double perovskite like and NA ND2 Ni MnO6 are associated with two transition temperature. How to interpret it? So that's a beautiful question, and the answer is it depends. <laughs> there is there is sadly no single answer to to your question. So one of the things that's beautiful about the, the perovskite crystal structure is just how flexible it is. It, it, some people think of it as the garbage bag of the crystal structures. You can put anything, almost 
almost anything into the perovskite crystal structure. And because it is such a tolerant crystal structure, there are many, many potential phase transformations that can happen. And so now the details really matter. So it is very common to see multiple phase transformations as a function of temperature. Uh, those phase transformations can be associated very often if the material has a comparatively smaller east side ion, the first phase transformation that will happen as a function of temperature is an octahedral tilt. So the octahedral tilt for perovskite tolerance factors below 0.96 is the most common and the, 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 the first to appear phase transformation temperature. And those tilts can be quite complicated and materials like sodium, or excuse me, like um, silver tantalate, niobate, it goes through four phase, tilt phase transformations as a function of temperature. So that the tilt transition sequence itself can be complicated. Secondly, we can have transitions where we displace atoms with respect to either the center of the octahedra or the A site ions, especially when we have lone electron pairs, can start moving laterally. And that can add to the tilt a ferroelectric component to the transition. For a limited number of materials where we have a non zero number of uh, electrons on the uh, remaining in the D shell um, can also end up with magnetic transition. And so, unfortunately, there is no single answer to your very beautiful question. It really the, the the details matter of exactly what atoms are in the system, which sequence of phase transformations will be observed. And so. Yeah, my suggestion, go do some good crystallography and that uh, couple it with electrical measurements and that will probably be the best guide as to exactly what that phase transformation sequence is. I'm sorry I can't give you an absolute sequence is this and this for, for the material you, you specified. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked on lithium new bit. Yes, but uh, uh, I I I was working in seventies, and then mm -hmm. and others were working on the same material in nineteen sixty six onwards. So yes. I found thirty five degree domains because my crystals were not gone by the Zakralski pulling technique by slow pulling of the melt. Mm -hmm. And. These 35 degree domains were attributed to that two unit cells, rhombohedral join, and the polar axis um, were making the angle 35 degree, which was studied by polarizing microscope. Yes. So I did not get 180 degree domain. Maybe that the there was. Huh. Okay, so that's a beautiful point, and and I want to uh, actually thank you for bringing it up. So the domain structures I referred to were the domain structures that occur in single domains of material. Uh, excuse me, in single cells yeah. of the material. And yeah, if I have a perfect defect-free lithium niobate, the crystal system. Um, is, is rhombohedral, uh, which means there's a threefold yeah. rotation axis, and the threefold rotation yeah. axis kills polarization in the plane. And so, in yeah. that perfect single crystal, the only allowed polarizations are up and down. But you make a beautiful point. Yeah. So, I'm going to answer this in two ways. Um, yeah. In the original crystals, because they were almost always massively lithium deficient, because they were grown, yeah. um, uh, they, they were grown from congruent, so they weren't stoichiometric. For many, yeah. many years, lithium niobate um, couldn't be switched. Uh, they, they literally blew up yeah. before yeah. you could switch them, and so it was actually yeah. incredibly hard 
to see in those early congruent yeah. crystals the 180 mm -hmm. degree domain structure. What you grew was yeah. what you got. The 35 degree domains you're referring to are what I would call a crystallographic growth um, domain. And so real crystals do not always grow as single crystals. And when there are growth defects, I can have, for example, um, instead of having exactly this connectivity everywhere, you might have a second crystal which is growing at an angle to the first. And that often will occur at very well-defined angles um, because yeah. that's where the best crystallographic matches. So those crystallographic yeah. growth twins are once they're grown in, cannot be removed. You cannot move one of those walls in the same way yeah. that you move a ferroelectric wall. So thank you for bringing that up because that's a really important point to make. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Excuse me, Susan. Yeah. That was, uh, I have given uh, explanation on the, I use the vector algebra and made two blocks of the card books, Rombahedra, and calculated the theoretically axis uh, angle. It also came uh, some 35, 30, 35 degrees, 18 minutes. Mm -hmm. so it matched. I it was published in Applied Physics. Yes, I, and exactly. And that is because of the twinning of the two cells. Twinning. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, crystallographic growth twin. Beautiful. Yeah. I like your work very much. Yeah. Thank and uh, besides the lithium and IBM vacancies, Oxygen deficiencies are also there because I have grown four stichometric compositions and always the difficulty with the physiogram which was modified later after 1949. Mm -hmm. That um, the second phase always gets precipitated slightly and gives the stichometric effect. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. lithium nibate is a hard Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Very, but very exciting to work with. It is. Okay, thank you, Susan. It's so important for electro-optics. Thank you. Yeah. So, Dr. Srinivas? Yes. There's upcoming to the pleasant teaching. I welcome you to Susan. And it was exciting to listen to her. She started right from the fundamentals and touched upon all the important materials. Outside is the inside. The high is electromechanical and couple of coefficients. So I hope the younger people and the new researchers are now aware of some of the important topics in the research area in different laboratories and research groups are focused. And once again, I thank you very much, Professor Susan, for all the time you have given early in the morning for all the young people in this country. Thank you very much. And we hope you come to India one time to get through these troubled times for international college. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Very much. Very good. Thank you, Shrinima. Yes. So now, uh, today's session are over, and uh, we join in tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock for the fourth session of this conference. So have a good day, and good morning, Sushan, ma'am, and have a good day for, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye. Shmita, Shmita. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think. Thank you for. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Debate. I am hearing, sir. You got my message. Now uh, you can close the session for uh, tomorrow. We'll see sorry. anything tomorrow. Uh, anything, any action or okay, function sir. or anything okay. tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Now people are tired. Okay, okay sir. Okay. People are tired. So for tomorrow evening we will yeah, do yeah. anything. Okay. Understand that. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. You must thank okay. my dear Susan. Whatever she has done for us, yeah. uh, from your side, for our organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
so on behalf of the peroelectric community of india i really thanks the dr sushan because she has given a very intellectual lectures and it's very fruitful for our student participants and uh, it's the beginners who who want to start the research in peroelectrics so i always impress by your work sushan i am continuous followers of your work <laughs> and uh, i always impress your work yeah so thank you thank you very much for everybody for joining this session and make this day very beautiful academically so uh so uh, can we uh, can we uh, end the event now today yeah yeah i think yeah. so okay dr dr shrinivas thank you for conducting nice session thank you very much i had yeah. two very good speakers today yeah 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 professor professor shrinivas yeah thank you again thank you from my side to joining yes. us and uh, and giving us time thank you professor i think this is the first time the national seminar we yeah organize on web uh, no, virtual yes. for the first time first time we have our nice like on the side thank you so much thank you very good speaker and yeah and we have successfully completed without much interruption sir no, <laughs> good. Good. very good yeah there is not much technical difficulty while conducting this session so first day we are successfully completed <laughs> yeah, we, we must congratulate you sami sita we must congratulate you for all the things you have done today and a real seminar will start from tomorrow seminar will start tomorrow so oh, yeah. it is a tutorial a lecture yeah, workshop but a real seminar will start tomorrow so all of us yeah. should be joining there yeah 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 Okay, sir. Okay, bye. I sir. think I think close it then now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Close now. Bye now. Yes. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining. Okay. 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 Okay.
uh, we plan to organize this conference, but due to the COVID pandemic, we can't organize it offline mode, but it's okay, it's going successful in online mode. And uh, this is really a pleasure for me also. We, uh, I got the opportunity to felicitate the ma'am on her Diamond Jubilee uh, birthday celebration. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> November. Yeah, 7th November. And uh, it's a, uh, what we say, the coincidence that on 7th November, there is a Madam Curie birthday is also there. And our ma'am is not there. <laughs> Really, uh, very exciting moment for all of us. So I take an opportunity uh, to welcome the ma'am for this uh, on on this golden jubilee celebration day. <laughs> okay.
तो अजीत कुलकर्णी हैज हेल्प मी लाइक एनी थिंग वो डायलेक्ट्रिक का पूरा सैंपल होल्डर वगैरह बना के लाया था मास्क सब अपन ने एक्सपेरिमेंट की जो जनरल ऑप्टिक स्लैब थी ना उधर उसमें सब डिमोन्स्ट्रेट किया तो आई एम टूडे वेरी हैप्पी दैट शी स्टार्टेड विथ थेरोलेक्ट्रिक कॉन्फ्रेंस नेक्स्ट विश इज दैट यू विल है सब लोग जैसे बाकी लोग एक ही फील्ड में कर रहे होंगे और इसलिए उनसे बहुत साल हो जाते हैं पर हम लोग को इसलिए करना पड़ता है क्योंकि एक फील्ड में हमारे पास उतना सब मिलता नहीं है है ना करेक्ट अभी आर रमेश सर का जो काम है इट्स वेरी एडवांस इन इंडिया इट इज उन्होंने बताया ना इन इंडिया इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल दैट इज व्हाट आई सेड इन द मॉर्निंग एंड इन माय लेक्चर बिकॉज़ लैब दे हैव जस्ट आइसोलेट वन मॉलिक्यूल एंड डिपॉजिट ऑन सब्सट्रैक्ट एंड एवरी थिंग इज इन टीवीटीएम कंट्रोल टीएम से देख के ट्रांसमिशन इलेक्ट्रॉन माइक्रोस्कोप और वो भी इतने उनके पावरफुल रहते उससे वो सेपरेट वन वन मॉलिक्यूल सेपरेट करके डैन डिपॉजिट एंड डैन दे गेट दिस प्रॉपर्टी वॉट एवर आर हमेशा प्रेजेंट इट इज नॉट पॉसिबल इन इंडिया वाइट आई सेट मॉलिकुलर सेरोलिक वन मॉलिक्यूल की केमिस्ट्री तो मुझे तो अभी समझ भी नहीं आ रही है थोड़ा डिफिकल्ट है इसलिए उनका रिसर्च अपने साथ कम कर नहीं कम रहा तो मैं जो बोल रही थी वो अपने स्टूडेंट वो भी स्टेट लेवल यूनिवर्सिटी क्योंकि आईआईटी में भी फैसिलिटी बहुत मिल जाती है सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी भी मिल पर अपने को नहीं मिलती तो अपने को जनरेट करना पड़ता है और ये स्टूडेंट अजीत वगैरह बहुत अच्छे स्टूडेंट है अच्छा काम सो आई एम वेरी थैंकफुल टू यू एंड यू रिमेम्बर मी आफ्टर दिस इतने साल के बाद बनाना अजीत फुल कर सर इज देर Okay. Nice, nice, nice seeing you, uh, Professor Chaudhary, Sridivas, and all. This. I was there in between. I didn't speak. And uh, <laughs> thank you. I mean, having remembered me for quite a few times. <laughs> actually, how can I forget you, beta? <laughs> Learning from you, actually. No, I cannot. I can't. So start your video, sir. <laughs> We want to see you. <laughs> See, I don't know whether otherwise we would have uh, gone into research at all. I mean, you, you. No, no, no. Being a spinster, you all are my children. <laughs> <laughs> I only lived for my. Sir, no, no, actually, we have kept the first session in the program, but it was a little bit delayed, right? Session two. उसके कारण वो सुपर मैडम ज्वाइन हो गई. So, so due to that, we skip, and now we are. <laughs> <laughs> अच्छा लगा जीत आई एम वेरी हैप्पी बेटा आई रिमेम्बर यू नाइन्टी फोर में हाउ मच यू हैव हेल्प मी असिस्टेड मी इट वॉज सक्सेस बिकॉजिंग एट सेवन अगेन ओके सो आई विल लीव नाउ एंड जॉइन यू टूमारो समाइम एंड डे आफ्टर ऑल्सो डे आफ्टर डे आफ्टर डे आफ्टर यूर लेक्चर इज डे आफ्टर Yeah, yeah, I will. There definitely I will be there. But yeah, uh, tomorrow yeah. uh, afternoon I will not be there. I have a lecture in the institute. Okay, so my course is running. Okay, yeah, and yeah. Uh, morning I will be there. I'll join somewhere. Ah, okay. Ajit, wow, yeah. my department ka student is Dr. Kamlesh Alti. अच्छा. उसने कनाडा से उद्योग किया था. He is actually on faculty of Amravati University. But he became associate professor in Institute of Science, and he works in photo uh, photo electronics, photo electronics, photo electronics, not photo electronics, photo electronics. So, his work is very good. Okay, very good. I will follow. For students, so he has written for children quantum mechanics. 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 He has written And his son got two national awards in astronomy. अभी वो आठ दस साल का ही है. अच्छा वाह very nice. हाँ तो जरा मिलना आप मैं बता मैं भी फोन करके बता दूँगी वो इसे क्या आया था सुबह बजे. Okay sure. So sure. thank you very much Ajit. No problem. Nice meeting you. Good guidance from you. And we're doing something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See you. Okay. I made very simple. I made very simple lecture Ajit. Because we are into 
लुकिंग एट अवर स्टूडेंट जो अपने स्टेट लेवल यूनिवर्सिटी के स्टूडेंट्स हैं जो क्रिस्टलोग्राफी करते नहीं तो उतना क्या ये पर मैंने इसलिए सिंपल सिंपल लिया थैंक यू बाय ओके ऑल राइट ओके सी यू ओके सर सी यू सर थैंक यू वेरी मच बेटा मैम आई आल्सो अबाउट मैम आई ऑलवेज एडमायर हर अलॉट बिकॉज नो मैम इट्स ओके आई थिंक इन टू थाउजेंड थ्री आई हैव पास आउट फ्रॉम हियर एंड एट दैट टाइम ऑल्सो मैम वॉज बियॉन्ड द टीचर एक्चुअली शी वॉज ऑलमोस्ट लाइक अ मदर फॉर अर्थ एंड शी यूज टू टेक केयर ऑफ ऑल ऑफ अर्थ ओके एंड there is always extra class at 9 am and uh, on sunday also she used to take class of 2 to 4 hours okay so continuously and the uh, means the most uh, important thing is for her daily class class 9 am she is ready with transparencies everything is already available and we used to come so मिस ऐसा कभी हुआ ही नहीं कि मैम लेट आए हैं या कभी कुछ मिस पंक्चुअलिटी में तो आई ऑल्सो मिस थिंग दैट की आई ऑल्सो लर्न मेनी थिंग्स फ्रॉम हर एंड एट दैट टाइम ऑल्सो इट इज माय लक नो मैम इट इज माय लक दैट आई हैव गॉट दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी आई मीट अगेन टू मैम आफ्टर सो मेनी इयर्स मिस आई यूज टू कॉन्टेक्ट हर ऑन टेलीफोनिकली but it is not possible for me to uh, contact her directly but uh, she is very nice person oh. she is very nice teacher also <laughs> and same thing I with the meeta ma'am also i am also in the same feeling <laughs> every miss batchmate called me same thing you are uh, favorite of uh, kamal singh ma'am <laughs> because my project report was also uh, very small it is of 25 pages and at that time i have worked in pentroni uh, deshpande sir from amravati university uh, uh, he was the co guide and uh, ma'am was the guide at the, at that time in the project so i love her very much <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much that's why i said just now meet her thank you ma'am yes i am so lucky that i still at this age my student takes care of me <laughs> and when i should narrate about her uma ek bhi pyare ho no so when i came back from amravati my uncle has asked who is really a creator of kamal singh then um, it was smita who remember that how madam must be managing with so much house dirty and everything she who does that 2010 I think it was. 30, I came on uh, 19 October, a uh, 20th of morning. Then I was some chief guest for the day. She came. She cooked, and she took me and my sister to her place. We both will never forget that. Ma'am, that was a very short time. No, why I say you should not be saying personal things. <laughs> Even my sister was in the town. She could not think of this. So me and my sister Sumita often we discuss, <laughs> so, and she works like bull. As I I am a workaholic, just it. <laughs> As I told you, no. Today I go eat something and then go to bed because I didn't sleep. So I want you to follow her because to get a good guide is fortune. and uh, my guide was more busy with the politics because he was professor kg deshmukh he was mpsc chairman nine year vc for amravati so he and my uncle were the persons to force me to um, apply for amravati nagpur i was the lone person who was shortlisted second time nobody was shortlisted uh, from that and i was almost through and moril sir and everybody was waiting ki abhi telegram aa jayega madam ka ji because i was busy with the director of that was led me to become the head or wo dono kaam karte so but politics was not with me so sn pathan was there but i look forward 
my disciple will acquire that chair someday. That is a desire in me. Before no, I die. No, ma'am, I don't want to become a Central University 2008 to join. I refused that for research. But what that left with me? Could I do anything? When Smita called me, my whole of research yesterday was light up. I made cab and now it's not simple. There'll be bit about politics till the hour in SFD. But people do with women. If women is with integrity and hard working, People try to show their structure. So I'm not saying, but we need good leaders. And please, those three men should not mind. Why? Because women do not corruption. As they manage home very seriously, and uh, even though I'm not married, but that is the way I looked at Amrauti University. Uma will tell you how uh, the semester, everything was bought by me first in Maharashtra. So I want that good person should be leader. And uh, my aim was to uh, not to become weak. My aim was to become UGT chair, lady, because that uh, Gujarati lady had come here. I'm forgetting her name. So when I saw that, my God, she has so many universities, entire Indian university college. I can't manage this tension. And she's managing that. So that was my a desire. And uh, had S.D. Deshmukh made me Pro Vice Chancellor in 96. 95 to uh, 2000, I was university. I'm proud. Invited professor. Because yes. you have to be You can take home. Beta, I'm going to professor. So I was invited. So I took the strategy. Lecturer, direct professor. Professor, so you have professor. So three go journey, come home in one. So Madam, I want to say that there is no such position where she is. No, she is not. I am always. I am always. If you say a little bit, then you say a little bit. No, no, no. No, no. Who is the leader of the field? I am always. 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 वो सब कुछ सबसे मिलजुल के कर सकते हैं और मैं बिल्कुल वैसी थी मैं नहीं पढ़ा एकदम स्टेप डाउन बिल्कुल बंदी क्यों नहीं लाया यू आर नॉट फिट फॉर इट तो वहाँ खाली हम थोड़े मैं थोड़े स्ट्रेच फॉरवर्ड हूँ पर बट शी विल बिकम दिस आई कॉन्फिडेंस आई हैव तो आई विश जब ए गुड लीडर इन फ्यूचर ह� तब मैं जिंदा नहीं रही तो मेरे फोटो के साथ आप जरूर कुछ बता दें। ठीक है राम हम हैं ना। आज हम जरूर कुछ बता दें। सेवेंटी एक फोटो इनका। आज सवेरे एक्चुअली हम लोग विश्व के साथ करते थे लेकिन वो क्या हुआ तो सभी ऐसा विश्व के साथ। हेलो विमान। अच्छा यार विमान।